Chapter One, Part One of The Stones of Venice, Volume Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Wayman. The Stones of Venice, Volume Three, by John Ruskin. Chapter One, Early Renaissance, Part One. I trust that the reader has been enabled by the preceding chapters to form some conception of the magnificence of the streets of Venice during the course of the thirteenth and fourteenth centuries. Yet by all this magnificence she was not supremely distinguished above the other cities of the Middle Ages. Her early edifices have been preserved to our times by the circuit of her waves, while continual recurrences of ruin have defaced the glory of her sister cities but such fragments as are still left in their lonely squares and in the corners of their streets so far from being inferior to the buildings of venice are even more rich more finished more admirable in invention more exuberant in beauty and although in the north of europe civilization was less advanced and the knowledge of the arts was more confined to the ecclesiastical orders so that for domestic architecture the period of perfection must be there placed much later than in italy and considered as extending to the middle of the fifteenth century yet as each city reached a certain point in civilization its streets became decorated with the same magnificence varied only in style according to the materials at hand and temper of the people and i am not aware of any town of wealth and importance in the middle ages in which some proof does not exist that at its period of greatest energy and prosperity its streets were inwrought with rich sculpture and even though in this as before noticed venice always stood supreme glowing with colour and with gold now therefore let the reader forming for himself as vivid and real a conception as he is able either of a group of venetian palaces in the fourteenth century or if he likes better of one of the more fantastic but even richer street scenes of rouen antwerp cologne or nuremberg and keeping this gorgeous image before him go out into any thoroughfare representative in a general and characteristic way of the feeling for domestic architecture in modern times let him for instance if in london walk once up and down harley street or baker street or gower street and then looking upon this picture and on this set himself to consider for this is to be the subject of our following and final inquiry what have been the causes which have induced so vast a change in the european mind renaissance architecture is the school which has conducted men's inventive and constructive faculties from the grand canal to gower street from the marble shaft and the lancet arch and the wreathed leafage and the glowing and melting harmony of gold and azure to the square cavity in the brick wall we have now to consider the causes and the steps of this change and as we endeavoured above to investigate the nature of gothic here to investigate also the nature of renaissance although renaissance architecture assumes very different forms among different nations it may be conveniently referred to three heads early renaissance consisting of the first corruptions introduced into the gothic schools central or roman renaissance which is the perfectly formed style and grotesque renaissance which is the corruption of the renaissance itself now in order to do full justice to the adverse cause we will consider the abstract nature of the school with reference only to its best or central examples the forms of building which must be classed generally under the term early renaissance are in many cases only the extravagances and corruptions of the languid gothic for whose errors the classical principle is in no wise answerable it was stated in the second chapter of the seven lamps that unless luxury had enervated and subtlety falsified the gothic forms roman traditions could not have prevailed against them and although these enervated and false conditions are almost instantly coloured by the classical influence it would be utterly unfair to lay to the charge of that influence the first debasement of the earlier schools which had lost the strength of their system before they could be struck by the plague the manner however of the debasement of all schools of art so far as it is natural is in all ages the same 
luxuriance of ornament refinement of execution and idle subtleties of fancy taking the place of true thought and firm handling and i do not intend to delay the reader long by the gothic sick-bed for our task is not so much to watch the wasting of fever in the features of the expiring king as to trace the character of that hazael who dipped the cloth in water and laid it upon his face nevertheless it is necessary to the completeness of our view of the architecture of venice as well as to our understanding of the manner in which the central renaissance obtained its universal dominion that we glance briefly at the principal forms into which venetian gothic first declined they are two in number one the corruption of the gothic itself the other a partial return to byzantine forms for the venetian mind having carried the gothic to a point at which it was dissatisfied tried to retrace its steps fell back first upon byzantine types and through them passed to the first roman but in thus retracing its steps it does not recover its own lost energy it revisits the places through which it had passed in the morning light but it is now with wearied limbs and under the gloomy shadows of evening it has just been said that the two principal causes of natural decline in any school are over luxuriance and over refinement the corrupt gothic of venice furnishes us with a curious instance of the one and the corrupt byzantine of the other we shall examine them in succession now observe first i do not mean by luxuriance of ornament quantity of ornament in the best gothic in the world there is hardly an inch of stone left unsculptured but i mean that character of extravagance in the ornament itself which shows that it was addressed to jaded faculties a violence and coarseness in curvature a depth of shadow a lusciousness in arrangement of line evidently arising out of an incapability of feeling the true beauty of chaste form and restrained power i do not know any character of design which may be more easily recognized at a glance than this over lusciousness and yet it seems to me that at the present day there is nothing so little understood as the essential difference between chasteness and extravagance whether in colour shade or lines we speak loosely and inaccurately of overcharged ornament with an obscure feeling that there is indeed something in visible form which is correspondent to intemperance in moral habits but without any distinct detection of the character which offends us far less with any understanding of the most important lesson which there can be no doubt was intended to be conveyed by the universality of this ornamental law in a word then the safeguard of highest beauty in all visible work is exactly that which is also the safeguard of conduct in the soul temperance in the broadest sense the temperance which we have seen sitting on an equal throne with justice amidst the four cardinal virtues and wanting which there is not any other virtue which may not lead us into desperate error now observe temperance in the nobler sense does not mean a subdued and imperfect energy it does not mean a stopping short in any good thing as in love or in faith but it means the power which governs the most intense energy and prevents its acting in any way but as it ought and with respect to things in which there may be excess it does not mean imperfect enjoyment of them but the regulation of their quantity so that the enjoyment of them shall be greatest for instance in the matter we have at present in hand temperance in colour does not mean imperfect or dull enjoyment of colour but it means that government of colour which shall bring the utmost possible enjoyment out of all hues a bad colourist does not love beautiful colour better than the best colourist does nor half so much but he indulges in it to excess he uses it in large masses and unsubdued and then it is a law of nature a law as universal as that of gravitation that he shall not be able to enjoy it so much as if he had used it in less quantity his eye is jaded and satiated and the blue and red have life in them no more he tries to paint them bluer and redder in vain all the blue has become grey and gets greyer the more he adds to it all his crimson has become brown and gets more sear and autumnal the more he deepens it but the great painter is sternly temperate in his work he loves the vivid colour with all his heart, 
but for a long time he does not allow himself anything like it nothing but sober browns and dull greys and colours that have no conceivable beauty in them but these by his government become lovely and after bringing out of them all the life and power they possess and enjoying them to the uttermost cautiously and as the crown of the work and the consummation of its music he permits the momentary crimson and azure and the whole canvas is in a flame again in curvature which is the cause of loveliness in all form the bad designer does not enjoy it more than the great designer but he indulges in it till his eye is satiated and he cannot obtain enough of it to touch his jaded feeling for grace but the great and temperate designer does not allow himself any violent curves he works much with lines in which the curvature though always existing is long before it is perceived he dwells on all these subdued curvatures to the uttermost and opposes them with still severer lines to bring them out in fuller sweetness and at last he allows himself a momentary curve of energy and all the work is in an instant full of life and grace the curves drawn in plate seven of the first volume were chosen entirely to show this character of dignity and restraint as it appears in the lines of nature together with the perpetual changefulness of the degrees of curvature in one and the same line but although the purpose of that plate was carefully explained in the chapter which it illustrates as well as in the passages of modern painters therein referred to so little are we now in the habit of considering the character of abstract lines that it was thought by many persons that this plate only illustrated hogarth's reverse line of beauty even although the curve of the salvia leaf which was the one taken from that plate for future use in architecture was not a reversed or serpentine curve at all i shall now however i hope be able to show my meaning better figure one in plate one opposite is a piece of ornamentation from a norman french manuscript of the thirteenth century and figure two from an italian one of the fifteenth observe in the first its stern moderation in curvature the gradually united lines nearly straight though none quite straight used for its main limb and contrasted with the bold but simple offshoots of its leaves and the noble spiral from which it shoots these in their turn opposed by the sharp trefoils and thorny cusps and see what a reserve of resource there is in the whole how easy it would have been to make the curves more palpable and the foliage more rich and how the noble hand has stayed itself and refused to grant one wave of motion more then observe the other example in which while the same idea is continually repeated excitement and interest are sought for by means of violent and continual curvatures wholly unrestrained and rolling hither and thither in confused wantonness compare the character of the separate lines in these two examples carefully and be assured that wherever this redundant and luxurious curvature shows itself in ornamentation it is a sign of jaded energy and failing invention do not confuse it with fullness or richness wealth is not necessarily wantonness a gothic moulding may be buried half a foot deep in thorns and leaves and yet will be chaste in every line and a late renaissance moulding may be utterly barren and poverty-stricken and yet will show the disposition to luxury in every line plate twenty in the second volume though prepared for the special illustration of the notices of capitals becomes peculiarly interesting when considered in relation to the points at present under consideration the four leaves in the upper row are byzantine the two middle rows are transitional all but figure eleven which is of the formed gothic figure twelve is perfect gothic of the finest time ducal palace oldest part figure thirteen is gothic beginning to decline figure fourteen is renaissance gothic in complete corruption now observe first the gothic naturalism advancing gradually from the byzantine severity how from the sharp hard formalized conventionality of the upper series the leaves gradually expand into more free and flexible animation until in figure twelve we have the perfect living leaf as if fresh gathered out of the dew and then in the last two examples and partly in figure eleven observe how the forms which can advance no longer in animation 
advance or rather decline into luxury and effeminacy as the strength of the school expires in the second place note that the byzantine and gothic schools however differing in degree of life are both alike in temperance though the temperance of the gothic is the nobler because it consists with entire animation observe how severe and subtle the curvatures are in all the leaves from figure one to figure twelve except only in figure eleven and observe especially the firmness and strength obtained by the close approximation to the straight line in the lateral ribs of the leaf figure twelve the longer the eye rests on these temperate curvatures the more it will enjoy them but it will assuredly in the end be wearied by the morbid exaggeration of the last example finally observe and this is very important how one and the same character in the work may be a sign of totally different states of mind and therefore in one case bad and in the other good the examples figure three and figure twelve are both equally pure in line but one is subdivided in the extreme the other broad in the extreme and both are beautiful the byzantine mind delighted in the delicacy of subdivision which nature shows in the fern leaf or parsley leaf and so also often the gothic mind much enjoying the oak thorn and thistle but the builder of the ducal palace used great breadth in his foliage in order to harmonize with the broad surface of his mighty wall and delighted in this breadth as nature delights in the sweeping freshness of the dock leaf or water lily both breadth and subdivision are thus noble when they are contemplated or conceived by a mind in health and both become ignoble when conceived by a mind jaded and satiated the subdivision in figure thirteen as compared with the type figure twelve which it was intended to improve is the sign not of a mind which loved intricacy but of one which could not relish simplicity which had not strength enough to enjoy the broad masses of the earlier leaves and cut them to pieces idly like a child tearing the book which in its weariness it cannot read and on the other hand we shall continually find in other examples of work of the same period an unwholesome breadth or heaviness which results from the mind having no longer any care for refinement or precision nor taking any delight in delicate forms but making all things blunted cumbrous and dead losing at the same time the sense of the elasticity and spring of natural curves it is as if the soul of man itself severed from the root of its health and about to fall into corruption lost the perception of life in all things around it and could no more distinguish the wave of the strong branches full of muscular strength and sanguine circulation from the lax bending of a broken cord nor the sinuousness of the edge of the leaf crushed into deep folds by the expansion of its living growth from the wrinkled contraction of its decay thus in morals there is a care for trifles which proceeds from love and conscience and is most holy and a care for trifles which comes of idleness and frivolity and is most base and so also there is a gravity proceeding from thought which is most noble and a gravity proceeding from dullness and mere incapability of enjoyment which is most base now in the various forms assumed by the later gothic of venice there are one or two features which under other circumstances would not have been signs of decline but in the particular manner of their occurrence here indicate the fatal weariness of decay of all these features the most distinctive are its crockets and finials there is not to be found a single crocket or finial upon any part of the ducal palace built during the fourteenth century and although they occur on contemporary and on some much earlier buildings they either indicate detached examples of schools not properly venetian or are signs of incipient decline the reason of this is that the finial is properly the ornament of gabled architecture it is the compliance in the minor features of the building with the spirit of its towers ridged roof and spires venetian building is not gabled but horizontal in its roots and general masses therefore the finial is a feature contradictory to its spirit and adopted only in that search for morbid excitement which is the infallible indication of decline when it occurs earlier it is on fragments of true gabled architecture as for instance on the porch of the carmini in proportion to the unjustifiableness of its introduction was the extravagance of the form it assumed 
becoming sometimes a tuft at the top of the ogee windows half as high as the arch itself and consisting in the richest examples of a human figure half emergent out of a cup of leafage as for instance in the small archway of the campo san zaccaria while the crockets as being at the side of the arch and not so strictly connected with its balance and symmetry appear to consider themselves at greater liberty even than the finials and fling themselves hither and thither in the wildest contortions figure four in plate one is the outline of one carved in stone from the later gothic of st mark's figure three a crocket from the fine veronese gothic in order to enable the reader to discern the renaissance character better by comparison with the examples of curvature above them taken from the manuscripts and not content with this exuberance in the external ornaments of the arch the finial interferes with its traceries the increased intricacy of these as such being a natural process in the development of gothic would have been no evil but they are corrupted by the enrichment of the finial at the point of the cusp corrupted that is to say in venice for at verona the finial in the form of a fleur-de-lis appears long previously at the cusp point with exquisite effect and in our own best northern gothic it is often used beautifully in this place as in the window from salisbury plate twelve volume two figure two but in venice such a treatment of it was utterly contrary to the severe spirit of the ancient traceries and the adoption of a leafy finial at the extremity of the cusps in the door of san stefano as opposed to the simple ball which terminates those of the ducal palace is an unmistakable indication of a tendency to decline in like manner the enrichment and complication of the jamb mouldings which in other schools might and did take place in the healthiest periods are at venice signs of decline owing to the entire inconsistency of such mouldings with the ancient love of the square jam and archivolt the process of enrichment in them is shown by the successive examples given in plate seven below they are numbered and explained in the appendix End of chapter 1, part 1chapter 1 part 2 of the stones of venice volume 3 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by alan wayman the stones of venice volume 3 by john ruskin chapter 1 early renaissance part 2 the date at which this corrupt form of gothic first prevailed over the early simplicity of the venetian types can be determined in an instant on the steps of the choir of the church of st john and paul on our left hand as we enter is the tomb of the doge marco cornaro who died in thirteen sixty seven it is rich and fully developed gothic with crockets and finials but not yet attaining any extravagant development opposite to it is that of the doge andrea morosini who died in thirteen eighty two its gothic is voluptuous and overwrought the crockets are bold and florid and the enormous finial represents a statue of st michael there is no excuse for the antiquaries who having this tomb before them could have attributed the severe architecture of the ducal palace to a later date for every one of the renaissance errors is here in complete development though not so grossly as entirely to destroy the loveliness of the gothic forms in the porta della carta fourteen twenty three the vice reaches its climax against this degraded gothic then came up the renaissance armies and their first assault was in the requirement of universal perfection for the first time since the destruction of rome the world had seen in the work of the greatest artists of the fifteenth century in the painting of Ghirlandaio, Masaccio, Francia, Perugino, Pinturicchio, and Bellini, in the sculpture of Mino da Fiesole, of Ghiberti, and Verrocchio, a perfection of execution and fullness of knowledge, which cast all previous art into the shade, and which, being in the work of those men united with all that was great in that of former days, did indeed justify the utmost enthusiasm with which their efforts were or could be regarded but when this perfection had once been exhibited in anything it was required in everything 
the world could no longer be satisfied with less exquisite execution or less disciplined knowledge the first thing that it demanded in all work was that it should be done in a consummate and learned way and men altogether forgot that it was possible to consummate what was contemptible and to know what was useless imperatively requiring dexterity of touch they gradually forgot to look for tenderness of feeling imperatively requiring accuracy of knowledge they gradually forgot to ask for originality of thought the thought and the feeling which they despised departed from them and they were left to felicitate themselves on their small science and their neat fingering this is the history of the first attack of the renaissance upon the gothic schools and of its rapid results more fatal and immediate in architecture than in any other art because there the demand for perfection was less reasonable and less consistent with the capabilities of the workman being utterly opposed to that rudeness or savageness on which as we saw above the nobility of the elder schools in great part depends but inasmuch as the innovations were founded on some of the most beautiful examples of art and headed by some of the greatest men that the world ever saw and as the gothic with which they interfered was corrupt and valueless the first appearance of the renaissance feeling had the appearance of a healthy movement a new energy replaced whatever weariness or dullness had affected the gothic mind an exquisite taste and refinement aided by extended knowledge furnished the first models of the new school and over the whole of italy a style arose generally now known as cinquecento which in sculpture and painting as i just stated produced the noblest masters which the world ever saw headed by michelangelo raphael and leonardo but which failed of doing the same in architecture because as we have seen above perfection is therein not possible and failed more totally than it would otherwise have done because the classical enthusiasm had destroyed the best types of architectural form for observe here very carefully the renaissance principle as it consisted in a demand for universal perfection is quite distinct from the renaissance principle as it consists in a demand for classical and roman forms of perfection and if i had space to follow out the subject as i should desire i would first endeavour to ascertain what might have been the course of the art of europe if no manuscripts of classical authors had been recovered and no remains of classical architecture left in the fifteenth century so that the executive perfection to which the efforts of all great men had tended for five hundred years and which now at last was reached might have been allowed to develop itself in its own natural and proper form in connection with the architectural structure of earlier schools this refinement and perfection had indeed its own perils and the history of later italy as she sank into pleasure and thence into corruption would probably have been the same whether she had ever learned again to write pure latin or not still the inquiry into the probable cause of the innovation which might naturally have followed the highest exertion of her energies is a totally distinct one from that into the particular form given to this innovation by her classical learning and it is matter of considerable regret to me that i cannot treat these two subjects separately i must be content with marking them for separation in the mind of the reader the effect then of the sudden enthusiasm for classical literature which gained strength during every hour of the fifteenth century was as far as respected architecture to do away with the entire system of gothic science the pointed arch the shadowy vault the clustered shaft the heaven-pointing spire were all swept away and no structure was any longer permitted but that of the plain cross-beam from pillar to pillar over the round arch with square or circular shafts and a low gabled roof and pediment two elements of noble form which had fortunately existed in rome were however for that reason still permitted the cupola and internally the wagon vault these changes in form were all of them unfortunate and it is almost impossible to do justice to the occasionally exquisite ornamentation of the fifteenth century on account of its being placed upon edifices of the cold and meagre roman outline there is as far as i know only one gothic building in europe 
the Duomo of Florence, in which, though the ornament be of a much earlier school, it is yet so exquisitely finished as to enable us to imagine what might have been the effect of the perfect workmanship of the Renaissance, coming out of the hands of men like Verrocchio and Ghiberti, had it been employed on the magnificent framework of Gothic structure. This is the question which, as I shall note in the concluding chapter, we ought to set ourselves practically to solve in modern times. The changes effected in form, however, were the least part of the evil principles of the Renaissance. As I have just said, its main mistake in its early stages was the unwholesome demand for perfection at any cost. I hope enough has been advanced in the chapter on the nature of Gothic to show the reader that perfection is not to be had from the general workman, but at the cost of everything, of his whole life, thought, and energy. And Renaissance Europe thought this a small price to pay for manipulative perfection. Men like Verrocchio and Ghiberti were not to be had every day, nor in every place, and to require from the common workman execution or knowledge like theirs, was to require him to become their copyist. Their strength was great enough to enable them to join science with invention, method with emotion, finish with fire. But in them the invention and the fire were first, while Europe saw in them only the method and the finish. This was new to the minds of men, and they pursued it to the neglect of everything else. This, they cried, we must have in all our work henceforward. And they were obeyed. The lower workman secured method and finish, and lost, in exchange for them, his soul. Now, therefore, do not let me be misunderstood when I speak generally of the evil spirit of the Renaissance. The reader may look through all I have written from first to last, and he will not find one word but of the most profound reverence for those mighty men who could wear the Renaissance armour of proof, and yet not feel it encumber their living limbs. Leonardo and Michelangelo, Ghirlandaio and Masaccio, Titian and Tintoret. But I speak of the Renaissance as an evil time, because, when it saw those men go burning forth into the battle, it mistook their armour for their strength, and forthwith encumbered with the painful panoply every stripling who ought to have gone forth only with his own choice of three smooth stones out of the brook. This, then, the reader must always keep in mind when he is examining for himself any examples of Cinquecento work. When it has been done by a truly great man whose life and strength could not be oppressed, and who turned to good account the whole science of his day, nothing is more exquisite. I do not believe, for instance, that there is a more glorious work of sculpture existing in the world than that equestrian statue of Bartolomeo Colleone by Ferrocchio, of which, I hope, before these pages are printed, there will be a cast in England. But when the Cinquecento work has been done by those meaner men, who in the Gothic times, though in a rough way, would yet have found some means of speaking out what was in their hearts, it is utterly inanimate, a base and helpless copy of more accomplished models, or, if not this, a mere accumulation of technical skill, in gaining which the workman had surrendered all other powers that were in him. There is, therefore, of course, an infinite gradation in the art of the period, from the Sistine Chapel down to modern upholstery. But, for the most part, since in architecture the workman must be of an inferior order, it will be found that this Cinquecento painting and higher religious sculpture is noble, while the Cinquecento architecture, with its subordinate sculpture, is universally bad, sometimes, however, assuming forms in which the consummate refinement almost atones for the loss of force. This is especially the case with that second branch of the Renaissance, which, as above noticed, was engrafted at Venice on the Byzantine types. So soon as classical enthusiasm required the banishment of Gothic forms, it was natural that the Venetian mind should turn back with affection to the Byzantine models in which the round arches and simple shafts, necessitated by recent law, were presented under a form consecrated by the usage of their ancestors. And, accordingly, the first distinct school of architecture which arose under the new dynasty 
was one in which the method of inlaying marble and the general forms of shaft and arch were adopted from the buildings of the twelfth century and applied with the utmost possible refinements of modern skill both at verona and venice the resulting architecture is exceedingly beautiful at verona it is indeed less byzantine but possesses a character of richness and tenderness almost peculiar to that city at venice it is more severe but yet adorned with sculpture which for sharpness of touch and delicacy of minute form cannot be rivalled and rendered especially brilliant and beautiful by the introduction of those inlaid circles of coloured marble serpentine and porphyry by which philippe de comines was so much struck on his first entrance into the city the two most refined buildings in this style in venice are the small church of the miracoli and the scuola di san marco beside the church of st john and st paul the noblest is the rio facade of the ducal palace the casa dario and casa manzoni on the grand canal are exquisite examples of the school as applied to domestic architecture and in the reach of the canal between the casa foscari and the rialto there are several palaces of which the casa contarini called delle figure is the principal belonging to the same group though somewhat later and remarkable for the association of the byzantine principles of colour with the severest lines of the roman pediment gradually superseding the round arch the precision of chiselling and delicacy of proportion in the ornament and general lines of these palaces cannot be too highly praised and i believe that the traveller in venice in general gives them rather too little attention than too much but while i would ask him to stay his gondola beside each of them long enough to examine their every line i must also warn him to observe most carefully the peculiar feebleness and want of soul in the conception of their ornament which mark them as belonging to a period of decline as well as the absurd mode of introduction of their pieces of coloured marble these instead of being simply and naturally inserted in the masonry are placed in small circular or oblong frames of sculpture like mirrors or pictures and are represented as suspended by ribbons against the wall a pair of wings being generally fastened on to the circular tablets as if to relieve the ribbons and knots from their weight and the whole series tied under the chin of a little cherub at the top who is nailed against the facade like a hawk on a barn door but chiefly let him notice in the casa contarini delle figure one most strange incident seeming to have been permitted like the choice of the subjects at the three angles of the ducal palace in order to teach us by a single lesson the true nature of the style in which it occurs in the intervals of the windows of the first story certain shields and torches are attached in the form of trophies to the stems of two trees whose boughs have been cut off and only one or two of their faded leaves left scarcely observable but delicately sculptured here and there beneath the insertions of the severed boughs it is as if the workman had intended to leave us an image of the expiring naturalism of the gothic school i had not seen this sculpture when i wrote the passage referring to its period in the first volume of this work chapter twenty section thirty one autumn came the leaves were shed and the eye was directed to the extremities of the delicate branches the renaissance frosts came and all perished and the hues of this autumn of the early renaissance are the last which appear in architecture the winter which succeeded was colourless as it was cold and although the venetian painters struggled long against its influence the numbness of the architecture prevailed over them at last and the exteriors of all the latter palaces were built only in barren stone as at this point of our inquiry therefore we must bid farewell to colour i have reserved for this place the continuation of the history of chromatic decoration from the byzantine period when we left it in the fifth chapter of the second volume down to its final close it was above stated that the principal difference in general form and treatment between the byzantine and gothic palaces was the contraction of the marble facing into the narrow spaces between the windows leaving large fields of brick wall perfectly bare the reason for this appears to have been that the gothic builders were no longer satisfied with the faint and delicate hues of the veined marble they wished for some more forcible and piquant mode of decoration 
corresponding more completely with the gradually advancing splendour of chivalric costume and heraldic device what i have said above of the simple habits of life of the thirteenth century in no wise refers either to costumes of state or of military service and any illumination of the thirteenth and fourteenth centuries the great period being it seems to me from twelve fifty to thirteen fifty while it shows a peculiar majesty and simplicity in the fall of the robes often worn over the chain armour indicates at the same time an exquisite brilliancy of colour and power of design in the hems and borders as well as in the armorial bearings with which they are charged and while as we have seen a peculiar simplicity is found also in the forms of the architecture corresponding to that of the folds of the robes its colours were constantly increasing in brilliancy and decision corresponding to those of the quartering of the shield and of the embroidery of the mantle whether indeed derived from the quarterings of the knight's shields or from what other source i know not but there is one magnificent attribute of the colouring of the late twelfth the whole thirteenth and the early fourteenth century which i do not find definitely in any previous work nor afterwards in general art though constantly and necessarily in that of great colourists namely the union of one colour with another by reciprocal interference that is to say if a mass of red is to be set beside a mass of blue a piece of the red will be carried into the blue and a piece of the blue carried into the red sometimes in nearly equal proportions as in a shield divided into four quarters of which the uppermost on one side will be of the same colour as the lowermost on the other sometimes in smaller fragments but in the periods above named always definitely and grandly though in a thousand various ways and i call it a magnificent principle for it is an eternal and universal one not in art only but in human life it is the great principle of brotherhood not by equality nor by likeness but by giving and receiving the souls that are unlike and the nations that are unlike and the natures that are unlike being bound into one noble whole by each receiving something from and of the other's gifts and the other's glory i have not space to follow out this thought it is of infinite extent and application but i note it for the reader's pursuit because i have long believed and the whole second volume of modern painters was written to prove that in whatever has been made by the deity externally delightful to the human sense of beauty there is some type of god's nature or of god's laws nor are any of his laws in one sense greater than the appointment that the most lovely and perfect unity shall be obtained by the taking of one nature into another i trespass upon too high ground and yet i cannot fully show the reader the extent of this law but by leading him thus far and it is just because it is so vast and so awful a law that it has rule over the smallest things and there is not a vein of colour on the lightest leaf which the spring winds are at this moment unfolding in the fields around us but it is an illustration of an ordainment to which the earth and its creatures owe their continuance and their redemption it is perfectly inconceivable until it has been made a subject of special inquiry how perpetually nature employs this principle in the distribution of her light and shade how by the most extraordinary adaptations apparently accidental but always in exactly the right place she contrives to bring darkness into light and light into darkness and that so sharply and decisively that at the very instant when one object changes from light to dark the thing relieved upon it will change from dark to light and yet so subtly that the eye will not detect the transition till it looks for it the secret of a great part of the grandeur in all the noblest compositions is the doing of this delicately in degree and broadly in mass in colour it may be done much more decisively than in light and shade and according to the simplicity of the work with greater frankness of confession until in purely decorative art as in the illumination glass painting and heraldry of the great periods we find it reduced to segmental accuracy its greatest masters in high art are Tintoret, Veronese, and Turner. Together with this great principle of quartering is introduced another, 
also of very high value as far as regards the delight of the eye though not of so profound meaning as soon as colour began to be used in broad and opposed fields it was perceived that the mass of it destroyed its brilliancy and it was tempered by checkering it with some other colour or colours in smaller quantities mingled with minute portions of pure white the two moral principles of which this is the type are those of temperance and purity the one requiring the fullness of the colour to be subdued and the other that it shall be subdued without losing either its own purity or that of the colours with which it is associated end of chapter one part two chapter one part three of the stones of venice volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by alan wayman the stones of venice volume three by john ruskin chapter one early renaissance part three hence arose the universal and admirable system of the diapered or chequered background of early ornamental art they are completely developed in the thirteenth century and extend through the whole of the fourteenth gradually yielding to landscape and other pictorial backgrounds as the designers lost perception of the purpose of their art and of the value of colour the chromatic decoration of the gothic palaces of venice was of course founded on these two great principles which prevailed constantly wherever the true chivalric and gothic spirit possessed any influence the windows with their intermediate spaces of marble were considered as the objects to be relieved and variously quartered with vigorous colour the whole space of the brick wall was considered as a background it was covered with stucco and painted in fresco with diaper patterns what the reader asks in some surprise stucco and in the great gothic period even so but not stucco to imitate stone herein lies all the difference it is stucco confessed and understood and laid on the bricks precisely as gesso is laid on canvas in order to form them into a ground for receiving colour from the human hand colour which if well laid on might render the brick wall more precious than if it had been built of emeralds whenever we wish to paint we may prepare our paper as we choose the value of the ground in no wise adds to the value of the picture a tintoret on beaten gold would be of no more value than a tintoret on coarse canvas the gold would merely be wasted all that we have to do is to make the ground as good and fit for the colour as possible by whatever means i am not sure if i am right in applying the term stucco to the ground of fresco but this is of no consequence the reader will understand that it was white and that the whole wall of the palace was considered as the page of a book to be illuminated but he will understand also that the sea winds are bad librarians that when once the painted stucco began to fade or to fall the unsightliness of the defaced colour would necessitate its immediate restoration and that therefore of all the chromatic decoration of the gothic palaces there is hardly a fragment left happily in the pictures of gentile bellini the fresco colouring of the gothic palaces is recorded as it still remained in his time not with rigid accuracy but quite distinctly enough to enable us by comparing it with the existing coloured designs in the manuscripts and glass of the period to ascertain precisely what it must have been the walls were generally covered with chequers of very warm colour a russet inclining to scarlet more or less relieved with white black and grey as still seen in the only example which having been executed in marble has been perfectly preserved the front of the ducal palace this however owing to the nature of its materials was a peculiarly simple example the ground is white crossed with double bars of pale red and in the centre of each chequer there is a cross alternately black with a red centre and red with a black centre where the arms cross in painted work the grounds would be of course as varied and complicated as those of manuscripts but i only know of one example left on the casa sagredo 
where on some fragments of stucco a very early checker background is traceable composed of crimson quatrefoils interlaced with cherubim stretching their wings filling the intervals a small portion of this ground is seen beside the window taken from the palace volume two plate thirteen figure one it ought to be especially noticed that in all chequered patterns employed in the coloured designs of these noble periods the greatest care is taken to mark that they are grounds of design rather than designs themselves modern architects in such minor imitations as they are beginning to attempt endeavour to dispose the parts in the patterns so as to occupy certain symmetrical positions with respect to the parts of the architecture a gothic builder never does this he cuts his ground into pieces of the shape he requires with utter remorselessness and places his windows or doors upon it with no regard whatever to the lines in which they cut the pattern and in illuminations of manuscripts the chequer itself is constantly changed in the most subtle and arbitrary way wherever there is the least chance of its regularity attracting the eye and making it of importance so intentional is this that a diaper pattern is often set obliquely to the vertical lines of the designs for fear it should appear in any way connected with them on these russet or crimson backgrounds the entire space of the series of windows was relieved for the most part as a subdued white field of alabaster and on this delicate and veined white were set the circular discs of purple and green the arms of the family were of course blazoned in their own proper colours but i think generally on a pure azure ground the blue colour is still left behind the shields in the casa priuli and one or two more of the palaces which are unrestored and the blue ground was used also to relieve the sculptures of religious subject finally all the mouldings capitals cornices cusps and traceries were either entirely gilded or profusely touched with gold the whole front of a gothic palace in venice may therefore be simply described as a field of subdued russet quartered with broad sculptured masses of white and gold these latter being relieved by smaller inlaid fragments of blue purple and deep green now from the beginning of the fourteenth century when painting and architecture were thus united two processes of change went on simultaneously to the beginning of the seventeenth the merely decorative checkerings on the walls yielded gradually to more elaborate paintings of figure subject first small and quaint and then enlarging into enormous pictures filled by figures generally colossal as these paintings became of greater merit and importance the architecture with which they were associated was less studied and at last a style was introduced in which the framework of the building was little more interesting than that of a manchester factory but the whole space of its walls was covered with the most precious fresco paintings such edifices are of course no longer to be considered as forming an architectural school they were merely large preparations of artists panels and titian giorgione and veronese no more conferred merit on the later architecture of venice as such by painting on its facades than landseer or watts could confer merit on that of london by first whitewashing and then painting its brick streets from one end to the other contemporarily with this change in the relative values of the colour decoration and the stonework one equally important was taking place in the opposite direction but of course in another group of buildings for in proportion as the architect felt himself thrust aside or forgotten in one edifice he endeavoured to make himself principal in another and in retaliation for the painter's entire usurpation of certain fields of design succeeded in excluding him totally from those in which his own influence was predominant or more accurately speaking the architects began to be too proud to receive assistance from the colourists and these latter sought for ground which the architect had abandoned for the unrestrained display of their own skill and thus while one series of edifices is continually becoming feebler in design and richer in superimposed paintings another that of which we have so often spoken as the earliest or byzantine renaissance fragment by fragment rejects the pictorial decoration supplies its place first with marbles and then as the latter are felt by the architect daily increasing in arrogance and deepening in coldness to be too bright for his dignity he casts even these aside one by one and when the last porphyry circle has vanished from the facade 
we find two palaces standing side by side one built so far as mere masonry goes with consummate care and skill but without the slightest vestige of colour in any part of it the other utterly without any claim to interest in its architectural form but covered from top to bottom with paintings by veronese at this period then we bid farewell to colour leaving the painters to their own peculiar field and only regretting that they waste their noblest work on walls from which in a couple of centuries if not before the greater part of their labour must be effaced on the other hand the architecture whose decline we are tracing has now assumed an entirely new condition that of the central or true renaissance whose nature we are to examine in the next chapter but before leaving these last palaces over which the byzantine influence extended itself there is one more lesson to be learned from them of much importance to us though in many respects debased in style they are consummate in workmanship and unstained in honour there is no imperfection in them and no dishonesty that there is absolutely no imperfection is indeed as we have seen above a proof of their being wanting in the highest qualities of architecture but as lessons in masonry they have their value and may well be studied for the excellence they display in methods of levelling stones for the precision of their inlaying and other such qualities which in them are indeed too principal yet very instructive in their particular way for instance in the inlaid design of the dove with the olive branch from the casa trevisan volume one plate twenty it is impossible for anything to go beyond the precision with which the olive leaves are cut out of the white marble and in some wreaths of laurel below the rippled edge of each leaf is as finely and easily drawn as if by a delicate pencil no florentine table is more exquisitely finished than the facade of this entire palace and as ideals of an executive perfection which though we must not turn aside from our main path to reach it may yet with much advantage be kept in our sight and memory these palaces are most notable amidst the architecture of europe the rio facade of the ducal palace though very sparing in colour is yet as an example of finished masonry in a vast building one of the finest things not only in venice but in the world it differs from other work of the byzantine renaissance in being on a very large scale and it still retains one pure gothic character which adds not a little to its nobleness that of perpetual variety there is hardly one window of it or one panel that is like another and this continual change so increases its apparent size by confusing the eye that though presenting no bold features or striking masses of any kind there are few things in italy more impressive than the vision of it overhead as the gondola glides from beneath the bridge of sighs and lastly unless we are to blame these buildings for some pieces of very childish perspective they are magnificently honest as well as perfect i do not remember even any gilding upon them all is pure marble and of the finest kind and therefore in finally leaving the ducal palace let us take with us one more lesson the last which we shall receive from the stones of venice except in the form of a warning the school of architecture which we have just been examining is as we have seen above redeemed from severe condemnation by its careful and noble use of inlaid marbles as a means of colour from that time forward this art has been unknown or despised the frescoes of the swift and daring venetian painters long contended with the inlaid marbles outvying them with colour indeed more glorious than theirs but fugitive as the hues of woods in autumn and at last as the art itself of painting in this mighty manner failed from among men the modern decorative system established itself which united the meaninglessness of the veined marble with the evanescence of the fresco and completed the harmony by falsehood since first in the second chapter of the seven lamps i endeavoured to show the culpableness as well as the baseness of our common modes of decoration by painted imitation of various woods or marbles the subject has been discussed in various architectural works and is evidently becoming one of daily increasing interest 
when it is considered how many persons there are whose means of livelihood consist altogether in these spurious arts and how difficult it is even for the most candid to admit a conviction contrary both to their interests and to their inveterate habits of practice and thought it is rather a matter of wonder that the cause of truth should have found even a few maintainers than that it should have encountered a host of adversaries it has however been defended repeatedly by architects themselves and so successfully that i believe so far as the desirableness of this or that method of ornamentation is to be measured by the fact of its simple honesty or dishonesty there is little need to add anything to what has been already urged upon the subject but there are some points connected with the practice of imitating marble which i have been unable to touch upon until now and by the consideration of which we may be enabled to see something of the policy of honesty in this matter without in the least abandoning the higher ground of principle consider then first what marble seems to have been made for over the greater part of the surface of the world we find that a rock has been providentially distributed in a manner particularly pointing it out as intended for the service of man not altogether a common rock it is yet rare enough to command a certain degree of interest and attention wherever it is found but not so rare as to preclude its use for any purpose to which it is fitted it is exactly of the consistence which is best adapted for sculpture that is to say neither hard nor brittle nor flaky nor splintery but uniform and delicately yet not ignobly soft exactly soft enough to allow the sculptor to work it without force and trace on it the finest lines of finished form and yet so hard as never to betray the touch or moulder away beneath the steel and so admirably crystallized and of such permanent elements that no rains dissolve it no time changes it no atmosphere decomposes it once shaped it is shaped for ever unless subjected to actual violence or attrition this rock then is prepared by nature for the sculptor and architect just as paper is prepared by the manufacturer for the artist with as great nay with greater care and more perfect adaptation of the material to the requirements and of this marble paper some is white and some coloured but more is coloured than white because the white is evidently meant for sculpture and the coloured for the covering of large surfaces now if we would take nature at her word and use this precious paper which she has taken so much care to provide for us it is a long process the making of that paper the pulp of it needing the subtlest possible solution and the pressing of it for it is all hot pressed having to be done under the saw or under something at least as heavy if i say we use it as nature would have us consider what advantages would follow the colours of marble are mingled for us just as if on a prepared palette they are of all shades and hues except bad ones some being united and even some broken mixed and interrupted in order to supply as far as possible the want of the painter's power of breaking and mingling the colour with the brush but there is more in the colours than this delicacy of adaptation there is history in them by the manner in which they are arranged in every piece of marble they record the means by which that marble has been produced and the successive changes through which it has passed and in all their veins and zones and flame-like stainings or broken and disconnected lines they write various legends never untrue of the former political state of the mountain kingdom to which they belonged of its infirmities and fortitudes convulsions and consolidations from the beginning of time now if we were never in the habit of seeing anything but real marbles this language of theirs would soon begin to be understood that is to say even the least observant of us would recognize such and such stones as forming a peculiar class and would begin to inquire where they came from and at last take some feeble interest in the main question why they were only to be found in that or the other place and how they came to make a part of this mountain and not of that and in a little while it would not be possible to stand for a moment at a shop door leaning against the pillars of it without remembering or questioning of something well worth the memory or the inquiry touching the hills of italy or greece or africa or spain 
and we should be led on from knowledge to knowledge until even the unsculptured walls of our streets became to us volumes as precious as those of our libraries but the moment we admit imitation of marvel this source of knowledge is destroyed none of us can be at the pains to go through the work of verification if we knew that every coloured stone we saw was natural certain questions conclusions interests would force themselves upon us without any effort of our own but we have none of us time to stop in the midst of our daily business to touch and pore over and decide with painful minuteness of investigation whether such and such a pillar be stucco or stone and the whole field of this knowledge which nature intended us to possess when we were children is hopelessly shut out from us worse than shut out for the mass of coarse imitations confuses our knowledge acquired from other sources and our memory of the marbles we have perhaps once or twice carefully examined is disturbed and distorted by the inaccuracy of the imitations which are brought before us continually but it will be said that it is too expensive to employ real marbles in ordinary cases it may be so yet not always more expensive than the fitting windows with enormous plate glass and decorating them with elaborate stucco mouldings and other useless sources of expenditure in modern building nay not always in the end more expensive than the frequent repainting of the dingy pillars which a little water dashed against them would refresh from day to day if they were of true stone but granting that it be so in that very costliness checking their common use in certain localities is part of the interest of marbles considered as history where they are not found nature has supplied other materials clay for brick or forest for timber in the working of which she intends other characters of the human mind to be developed and by the proper use of which certain local advantages will assuredly be attained while the delightfulness and meaning of the precious marbles will be felt more forcibly in the districts where they occur or on the occasions when they may be procured it can hardly be necessary to add that as the imitation of marbles interferes with and checks the knowledge of geography and geology so the imitation of wood interferes with that of botany and that our acquaintance with the nature uses and manner of growth of the timber trees of our own and of foreign countries would probably in the majority of cases become accurate and extensive without any labour or sacrifice of time were not all inquiry checked and all observation betrayed by the wretched labours of the grainer but this is not all as the practice of imitation retards knowledge so also it retards art there is not a meaner occupation for the human mind than the imitation of the stains and striae of marble and wood when engaged in any easy and simple mechanical occupation there is still some liberty for the mind to leave the literal work and the clash of the loom or the activity of the fingers will not always prevent the thoughts from some happy expatiation in their own domains but the grainer must think of what he is doing and veritable attention and care and occasionally considerable skill are consumed in the doing of a more absolute nothing than i can name in any other department of painful idleness i know not anything so humiliating as to see a human being with arms and limbs complete and apparently a head and assuredly a soul yet into the hands of which when you have put a brush and palette it cannot do anything with them but imitate a piece of wood it cannot colour it has no ideas of colour it cannot draw it has no ideas of form it cannot caricature it has no ideas of humour it is incapable of anything beyond knots all its achievements the entire result of the daily application of its imagination and immortality is to be such a piece of texture as the sun and dew are sucking up out of the muddy ground and weaving together far more finely in millions of millions of growing branches over every rood of waste woodland and shady hill but what is to be done the reader asks with men who are capable of nothing else than this 
nay they may be capable of everything else for all we know and what we are to do with them i will try to say in the next chapter but meanwhile one word more touching the higher principles of action in this matter from which we have descended to those of expediency i trust that some day the language of types will be more read and understood by us than it has been for centuries and when this language a better one than either greek or latin is again recognized amongst us we shall find or remember that as the other visible elements of the universe its air its water and its flame set forth in their pure energies the life-giving purifying and sanctifying influences of the deity upon his creatures so the earth in its purity sets forth his eternity and his truth i have dwelt above on the historical language of stones let us not forget this which is their theological language and as we would not wantonly pollute the fresh waters when they issue forth in their clear glory from the rock nor stay the mountain winds into pestilential stagnancy nor mock the sunbeams with artificial and ineffective light so let us not by our own base and barren falsehoods replace the crystalline strength and burning colour of the earth from which we were born and to which we must return the earth which like our own bodies though dust in its degradation is full of splendour when god's hand gathers its atoms and which was for ever sanctified by him as the symbol no less of his love than of his truth when he bade the high priest bear the names of the children of israel on the clear stones of the breastplate of judgment end of chapter one part three chapter two part one of the stones of venice volume three this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Malone. The Stones of Venice, Volume 3 by John Ruskin. The Roman Renaissance, Part 1. Of all the buildings in Venice, later in date than the final additions to the Ducal Palace, the noblest is, beyond all question, that which, having been condemned by its proprietor not many years ago, to be pulled down and sold for the value of its materials, was rescued by the Austrian government and appropriated, the government officers having no other use for it, to the business of the post office. Though still known to the gondolier by its ancient name, the Casa Grimani. It is composed of three stories of the Corinthian order, at once simple, delicate, and sublime, but on so colossal a scale that the three-storied palaces on its right and left only reach to the cornice, which marks the level of its first floor. Yet it is not at first perceived to be so vast, and it is only when some expedient is employed to hide it from the eye that by the sudden dwarfing of the whole reach of the grand canal which it commands we become aware that it is to the majesty of the casa grimani that the rialto itself and the whole group of neighboring buildings owe the greater part of their impressiveness nor is the finish of its details less notable than the grandeur of their scale. There is not an erring line nor a mistaken proportion throughout its noble front, and the exceeding fineness of the chiseling gives an appearance of lightness to the vast blocks of stone out of whose perfect union that front is composed. The decoration is sparing, but delicate, the first story only simpler than the rest, in that it has pilasters instead of shafts, but all with Corinthian capitals, rich in leafage and fruited delicately. The rest of the walls, flat and smooth, 
and the moldings sharp and shallow, so that the bold shafts look like crystals of beryl running through a rock of quartz. This palace is the principal type at Venice, and one of the best in Europe of the central architecture of the Renaissance schools. That carefully studied and perfectly executed architecture to which those schools owe their principal claims to our respect, and which became the model of most of the important works subsequently produced by civilized nations. I have called it the Roman Renaissance because it is founded both in its principles of superimposition and in the style of its ornament upon the architecture of classic Rome at its best period. The revival of Latin literature both led to its adoption and directed its form, and the most important example of it which exists is the modern Roman Basilica of St. Peter's. It had, at its renaissance or new birth, no resemblance either to Greek, Gothic, or Byzantine forms, except in retaining the use of the round arch, vault, and dome in the treatment of all details. It was exclusively Latin, the last links of connection with medieval tradition having been broken by its builders in their enthusiasm for classical art, and the forms of true Greek or Athenian architecture being still unknown to them. The study of these noble Greek forms has induced various modifications of the Renaissance in our own times. But the conditions which are found most applicable to the uses of modern life are still Roman, and the entire style may most fitly be expressed by the term Roman Renaissance. It is this style, in its purity and fullest form, represented by such buildings as the Casa Grimani at Venice, built by San Michele, the town hall at Vicenza by Palladio, St. Peter's at Rome by Michelangelo, St. Paul's and Whithall in London by Wren and Inigo Jones, which is the true antagonist of the Gothic school. The intermediate or corrupt conditions of it, though multiplied over Europe, are no longer admired by architects or made the subjects of their study. But the finished work of this central school is still, in most cases, the model set before the student of the 19th century, as opposed to those Gothic, Romanesque, or Byzantine forms, which have long been considered barbarous, and are so still by most of the leading men of the day. That they are, on the contrary, most noble and beautiful, and that the antagonistic Renaissance is, in the main, unworthy and unadmirable, whatever perfection of a certain kind it may possess, it was my principal purpose to show, when I first undertook the labor of this work, it has been attempted already to put before the reader the various elements which unite in the nature of Gothic, and to enable him thus to judge not merely of the beauty of the forms which that system has produced already, but of its future applicability to the wants of mankind, an endless power over their hearts. I would now endeavor in like manner to set before the reader the nature of Renaissance, and thus to enable him to compare the two styles under the same light and with the same enlarged view of their relations to the intellect and the capacities for the service of man. It will not be necessary for me to enter at length into any examination of its external form. It uses, whether for its roofs of aperture or roofs proper, the low gable or circular arch, but it differs from Romanesque work in attaching great importance to the horizontal lintel or architrave above the arch. 
transferring the energy of the principal shafts to the supporting of this horizontal beam, and thus rendering the arch a subordinate, if not altogether a superfluous feature. The type of this arrangement has been given already at C, figure 36, page 145, volume 1, and I might insist at length upon the absurdity of a construction in which the shorter shaft, which has the real weight of wall to carry, is split into two by the taller one, which has nothing to carry at all that taller one being strengthened nevertheless as if the whole weight of the building bore upon it and on the ungracefulness never conquered in any palladian work of the two half capitals glued as it were against the slippery round sides of the central shaft but it is not the form of this architecture against which i would plead its defects are shared by many of the noblest forms of earlier building, and might have been entirely atoned for by excellent spirit. But it is the moral nature of it which is corrupt, and which it must, therefore, be our principal business to examine and expose. The moral or immoral elements which unite to form the spirit of central Renaissance architecture are, I believe, in the main, two, pride and infidelity. But the pride resolves itself into three main branches, pride of science, pride of state, and pride of system and thus we have four separate mental conditions which must be examined successively. 1. Pride of science. It would have been more charitable, but more confusing, to have added another element to our list, namely the love of science. But the love is included in the pride, and is usually so very subordinate an element, that it does not deserve equality of nomenclature. But, whether pursued in pride or in affection, how far by either we shall see presently, the first notable characteristic of the Renaissance Central School is its introduction of accurate knowledge into all its work, so far as it possesses such knowledge, and its evident conviction that such science is necessary to the excellence of the work, and is the first thing to be expressed therein, so that all the forms introduced, even in its minor ornament, are studied with the utmost care. The anatomy of all animal structure is thoroughly understood and elaborately expressed, and the whole of the execution skillful and practiced in the highest degree. Perspective, linear and aerial, perfect drawing and accurate light and shade in printing, and true anatomy in all representations of the human form, drawn or sculptured, are the first requirements in all the work of this school. Now, first considering all this in the most charitable light, as pursued from a real love of truth and not from vanity, it would, of course, have been all excellent and admirable, had it been regarded as the aid of art and not as its essence. But the grand mistake of the Renaissance schools lay in supposing that science and art are the same things, and that to advance in the one was necessarily to perfect the other whereas they are in reality things not only different, but so opposed that to advance in the one is, in ninety-nine cases out of the hundred, to retrograde in the other. This is the point to which I would at present especially bespeak the reader's attention. Science and art are commonly distinguished by the nature of their actions the one as knowing, the other as changing, producing, or creating. 
but there is a still more important distinction in the nature of the things they deal with. Science deals exclusively with things as they are in themselves, and art exclusively with things as they affect the human senses and human soul. Her work is to portray the appearance of things, and to deepen the natural impressions which they produce upon living creatures. The work of science is to substitute facts for appearances, and demonstrations for impressions. Both, observe, are equally concerned with truth, the one with truth of aspect, the other with truth of essence. Art does not represent things falsely, but truly as they appear to mankind. Science studies the relations of things to each other, but art studies only their relations to man and it requires of everything which is submitted to it imperatively this and only this, what that thing is to the human eyes and human heart, what it has to say to men, and what it can become to them, a field of question just much vaster than that of science, as the soul is larger than the material creation. Take a single instance. Science informs us that the sun is 95 millions of miles distant and 111 times broader than the earth, that we and all the planets revolve around it, and that it revolves on its own axis in 25 days, 14 hours, and 4 minutes. With all this, art has nothing whatsoever to do. It has no care to know anything of this kind. But the things which it does care to know are these, that in the heavens God hath set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit under the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. This, then, being the kind of truth with which art is exclusively concerned, how is such truths as this to be ascertained and accumulated? Evidently, and only, by perception and feeling, never either by reasoning or report. Nothing must come between nature and the artist's sight, nothing between God and the artist's soul neither calculation nor hearsay, be it the most subtle of calculations or the wisest of sayings, may be allowed to come between the universe and the witness which art bears to its visible nature. The whole value of that witness depends on its being eyewitness, the whole genuineness, acceptableness, and domination of it depend on the personal assurance of the man who utters it. All its victory depends on the veracity of the one preceding word, weedy. The whole function of the artist in the world is to be a seeing and feeling creature, to be an instrument of such tenderness and sensitiveness that no shadow, no hue, no line, no instantaneous and evanescent expression of the visible things around him, nor any of the emotions which they are capable of conveying to the spirit which has been given him, shall either be left unrecorded or fade from the book of record. It is not his business either to think, to judge, to argue, or to know. His place is neither in the closet, nor on the bench, nor at the bar, nor in the library. They are for other men and other work. He may think in a byway, reason now and then, when he has nothing better to do. No, such fragments of knowledge as he can gather without stooping or reach without pains. But none of these things are to be his care. The work of his life is to be twofold only, to see, to feel. Nay, 
But the reader perhaps pleads with me, one of the great uses of knowledge is to open the eyes, to make things perceivable which never would have been seen unless first they had been known. Not so. This could only be said or believed by those who do not know what the perceptive faculty of a great artist is in comparison with that of other men. There is no great painter, no great workman in any art, but he sees more with the glance of a moment than he could learn by the labor of a thousand hours. God has made every man fit for his work. He has given to the man whom he means for a student the reflective, logical, sequential faculties, and to the man whom he means for an artist the perceptive, sensitive, retentive faculties. And neither of these men, so far from being able to do the other's work, can even comprehend the way in which it is done. The student has no understanding of the vision, nor the painter of the process. But chiefly the student has no idea of the colossal grasp of the true painter's vision and sensibility. The labor of the whole geological society for the last fifty years has but now arrived at the ascertainment of those truths respecting mountain from which Turner saw and expressed with a few strokes of a camel's hair pencil fifty years ago when he was a boy. The knowledge of all the laws of the planetary system and of all the curves of the motion of projectiles would never enable the man of science to draw a waterfall or a wave, and all the members of Surgeon's Hall helping each other could not at this moment see or represent the natural movement of a human body in vigorous action, as a poor dire son did two hundred years ago. But surely it is still insisted, granting this peculiar faculty to the painter, he will still see more as he knows more, and the more knowledge he obtains, therefore, the better. No, not even so. It is indeed true that here and there a piece of knowledge will enable the eye to detect a truth which might otherwise have escaped it, as, for instance, in watching a sunrise, the knowledge of the true nature of the orb may lead the painter to feel more profoundly, and express more fully, the distance between the bars of cloud that cross it, and the sphere of flame that lifts itself slowly beyond them into the infinite heaven. But, for one visible truth to which knowledge thus opens the eyes, it seals them to a thousand. That is to say, if the knowledge occur to the mind so as to occupy its powers of contemplation at the moment when the sight work is to be done, the mind retires inward, fixes itself upon the known fact, and forgets the passing visible ones, and a moment of such forgetfulness loses more to the painter than a day's thought can gain. This is no new or strange assertion. Every person accustomed to careful reflection of any kind knows that its natural operation is to close his eyes to the external world. While he is thinking deeply, he neither sees nor feels, even though naturally he may possess strong powers of sight and emotion. He who, having journeyed all day beside the Layman Lake, asked of his companions at evening where it was, probably was not wanting in sensibility, but he was generally a thinker, not a perceiver. And this instance is only an extreme one of the effect which, in all cases, knowledge, becoming a subject of reflection, produces upon the sensitive faculties. It must be but poor and lifeless knowledge if it has no tendency to force itself forward and become ground for reflection, in despite of the succession of external objects. It will not obey their succession. 
The first fact that comes gives it food enough for its day's work. It is its habit, its duty, to cast the rest aside and fasten upon that. The first thing that a thinking and knowing man sees in the course of the day, he will not easily quit. It is not his way to quit anything without getting to the bottom of it, if possible. But the artist is bound to receive all things on the broad, white, lucid field of his soul, not to grasp at one. For instance, as the knowing and thinking man watches the sunrise, he sees something in the color of a ray or the change of a cloud that is new to him, and this he follows out forthwith into a labyrinth of optical and pneumatical laws, perceiving no more clouds nor rays all the morning. But the painter must catch all the rays, all the colors that come, and see them all truly, all in their real relations and successions. Therefore, everything that occupies room in his mind he must cast aside for the time, as completely as may be. The thoughtful man has gone far away to seek, but the perceiving man sits still and open his heart to receive. The thoughtful man is knitting and sharpening himself into a two-edged sword wherewith to pierce. The perceiving man is stretching himself into a four-cornered sheet wherewith to catch. In all the breath to which he can expand himself and all the white emptiness into which he can blanch himself will not be enough to receive what God has to give him. What then will be indignantly asked is an utterly ignorant and unthinking man likely to make of the best artist? No, not so, neither. Knowledge is good for him so long as he could keep it utterly, servilely subordinate to his own divine work, and trample it under his feet and out of his way the moment it is likely to entangle him. And in this respect, observe there is an enormous difference between knowledge and education. An artist need not be a learned man. In all probability, it will be a disadvantage to him to become so. But he ought, if possible, always to be an educated man, that is, one who has understanding of his own uses and duties in the world, and therefore of the general nature of the things done and existing in the world and who has so trained himself, or been trained, as to turn to the best and most courteous account, whatever faculties or knowledge he has. The mind of an educated man is greater than the knowledge it possesses. It is like the vault of heaven, encompassing the earth which lives and flourishes beneath it. But the mind of an educated and learned man is like a caoutchouc band with an everlasting spirit of contraction in it, fastening together papers which it cannot open and keeps others from opening. Half our artists are ruined for want of education and by the possession of knowledge. The best that I have known have been educated and illiterate. The ideal of an artist, however, is not that he should be illiterate, but well-read in the best books, and thoroughly high-bred, both in heart and in bearing. In a word, he should be fit for the best society, and should keep out of it. There are indeed some kinds of knowledge with which an artist ought to be thoroughly furnished those, for instance, which enable him to express himself. For this knowledge relieves instead of encumbering his mind, and permits it to attend to its purposes instead of wearying itself about means. The whole mystery of manipulation and manufacture should be familiar to the painter from a child. He should know the chemistry of all colors and materials whatsoever, and should prepare all his colors himself in a little laboratory of his own, limiting his chemistry to this one object, 
the amount of practical science necessary for it, and such accidental discoveries as might fall in his way in the course of his work, of better colors or better methods of preparing them would be an infinite refreshment to his mind. A minor subject of interest to which it might turn when jaded with comfortless labor or exhausted with feverish invention, and yet which would never interfere with its higher functions when it chose to address itself to them. Even a considerable amount of manual labor, sturdy color grinding and canvas stretching, would be advantageous, though this kind of work ought to be, in great part, done by pupils, for it is one of the conditions of perfect knowledge in these matters that every great master should have a certain number of pupils, to whom he is to impart all the knowledge of materials and means which he himself possesses, as soon as possible, so that at any rate by the time they are fifteen years old they may know all that he knows himself in this kind that is to say, all that the world of artists know, and his own discoveries besides, and so never be troubled about methods any more. Not that their knowledge even of his own particular methods is to be of purpose confined to himself and his pupils, but that necessarily it must be so in some degree, for only those who see him at work daily can understand his small and multitudinous ways of practice. These cannot verbally be explained to everybody, nor is it needful that they should. Only let them be concealed from nobody who cares to see them, in which case, of course, his attendant scholars will know them best. But all that can be made public in matters of this kind should be so with all speed, every artist throwing his discovery into the common stock, and the whole body of artists taking such pains in this department of science as that there shall be no unsettled questions about any known material or method, that it shall be an entirely ascertained and indisputable matter which is the best white and which the best brown which the strongest canvas and safest varnish, and which the shortest and most perfect way of doing everything known up to that time. And if any one discovers a better, he is to make it public forthwith. All of them taking care to embarrass themselves with no theories or reasons for anything, but to work empirically only, it not being in any wise their business to know whether light moves in rays or in waves, or whether the blue rays of the spectrum move slower or faster than the rest, but simply to know how many minutes and seconds such and such a powder must be calcined to give the brightest blue. Now, it is perhaps the most exquisite absurdity of the whole Renaissance system that while it has encumbered the artist with every species of knowledge that is of no use to him, this one precious and necessary knowledge it has utterly lost. There is not, I believe, at this moment, a single question which could be put respecting pigments and methods on which the body of living artists would agree in their answers. The lives of artists are passed in fruitless experiments, fruitless because undirected by experience and uncommunicated in their results. Every man has methods of his own which he knows to be insufficient, and yet jealously conceals them from his fellow workmen. Every color man has materials of his own, to which it is rare that the artist can trust. And in the very front of the majestic advance of chemical science, the empirical science of the artist has been annihilated, and the days which should have led us to higher perfection are passed in guessing at, or in mourning over, lost processes. 
while the so-called Dark Ages, possessing no more knowledge of chemistry than a village of herbalists does now, discovered, established, and put into daily practice such methods of operation as have made their work at this day the despair of all who look upon it. And yet even this, to the painter, the safest of sciences, and in some degree necessary, has its temptations and capabilities of abuse. For the simplest means are always enough for a great man, and when once he has obtained a few ordinary colors, which he is sure will stand, and a white surface that will not darken, nor molder, nor rend, he is master of the world, and of his fellow men. And indeed, as if in these times we were bent on furnishing examples of every species of opposite error, while we have suffered the traditions to escape us of the simple methods of doing simple things, which are enough for all the arts and to all the ages, we have set ourselves to discover fantastic modes of doing fantastic things, new mixtures and manipulations of metal and porcelain and leather and paper and every conceivable condition of false substance and cheap work to our own infinitely multiplied confusion, blinding ourselves daily more and more to the great changeless and inevitable truth that there is but one goodness in art and that is one which the chemist cannot prepare nor the merchant cheapen, for it comes only of a rare human hand and rare human soul. End of chapter 2, part 1 Reading by Malone Chapter 2, part 2 of the Stones of Venice, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Malone. The Stones of Venice, Volume 3, by John Ruskin. The Roman Renaissance, Part 2. Within its due limits, however, here is one branch of science which the artist may pursue, and within limits still more strict, another also, namely, the science of the appearances of things as they have been ascertained and registered by his fellow men. For no day passes but some visible fact is pointed out to us by others, which, without their help, we should not have noticed and the accumulation and generalization of visible facts have formed, in the succession of ages, the sciences of light and shade, and perspective, linear and aerial, so that the artist is now at once put in possession of certain truths respecting the appearances of things, which, so pointed out to him, any man may in a few days understand and acknowledge, but which, without aid, he could not probably discover in his lifetime. I say probably could not, because the time which the history of art shows us to have been actually occupied in the discovery and systematization of such truth is no measure of the time necessary for such discovery. The lengthened period which elapsed between the earliest and the perfect development of the sciences of light, if I may so call it, was not occupied in the actual effort to ascertain its laws, but in acquiring the disposition to make that effort. It did not take five centuries to find out the appearance of natural objects, but it took five centuries to make people care about representing them. An artist of the twelfth century did not desire to represent nature. His work was symbolical and ornamental. 
So long as it was intelligible and lovely, he had no care to make it like nature. As, for instance, when an old painter represented the glory round a saint's head by a burnished plate of pure gold, he had no intention of imitating an effect of light. He meant to tell the spectator that the figure so decorated was a saint, and to produce splendor of effect by the golden circle. It was no matter to him what light was like. So soon as it entered into his intention to represent the appearance of light, he was not long in discovering the natural facts necessary for his purpose. But, this being finally allowed, it is still true that the accumulation of facts now known respecting visible phenomena is greater than any man can hope to gather for himself, and that it is well for him to be made acquainted with them, provided always that he receive them only at their true value, and do not suffer himself to be misled by them. I say at their true value, that is, an exceedingly small one. All the information which men can receive from the accumulated experience of others is of no use but to enable them more quickly and accurately to see for themselves. It will in no wise take the place of this personal sight. Nothing can be done well in art except by vision. Scientific principles and experiences are helps to the eye, as a microscope is, and they are of exactly as much use without the eye. No science of perspective, or of anything else, will enable us to draw the simplest natural line accurately, unless we see it and feel it. Science is soon at her wit's end. All the professors of perspective in Europe could not, by perspective, draw the line of curve of a sea beach, nay, could not outline one pool of the quiet water left among the sand. The eye and hand can do it, nothing else. All the rules of aerial perspective that ever were written will not tell me how sharply the pines in the hilltop are drawn at this moment on the sky. I shall know if I see them and love them, not till then. I may study the laws of atmospheric gradation for fourscore years and ten, and I shall not be able to draw so much as a brick kiln through its own smoke, unless I look at it, and that in an entirely humble and unscientific manner, ready to see all that the smoke, my master, is ready to show me and expecting to see nothing more. So that all the knowledge a man has must be held cheap, and neither trusted nor respected, the moment he comes face to face with nature. If it help him well, if not, but on the contrary, thrust itself upon him in an impertinent and contradictory temper, and venture to set itself in the slightest degree in opposition to, or comparison with his sight, let it be disgraced forthwith, and the slave is less likely to take too much upon herself if she has not been bought for a high price. All the knowledge that an artist needs will, in these days, come to him almost without his seeking. If he has far to look for it, he may be sure he does not want it. Prout became Prout without knowing a single rule of perspective to the end of his days, and all the perspective in the encyclopedia will never produce us another Prout. And observe also, knowledge is not only very often unnecessary, but it is often untrustworthy. It is inaccurate, and betrays us where the eye would have been true to us. Let us take the simple instance of the knowledge of aerial perspective, of which the moderns are so proud, and see how it betrays us in various ways. First, by the conceit of it, which either presents our enjoying work in which higher and better things were thought of than effects of mist, 
The other day, I showed a line impression of Albert Durer's St. Hubert to a modern engraver who had never seen it nor any other of Durer's works. He looked at it for a minute, contemptuously, then turned away. Ah, I see that man did not know much about aerial perspective. All the glorious work and thought of the mighty master, all the redundant landscape, the living vegetation, the magnificent truth of line, were dead letters to him because he happened to have been taught one particular piece of knowledge which Durer despised. But not only in the conceit of it, but in the inaccuracy of it, this science betrays us. Aerial perspective, as given by the modern artist, is, in nine cases out of ten, a gross and ridiculous exaggeration, as is demonstrable in a moment. The effect of air in altering the hue and depth of color is, of course, great in the exact proportion of the volume of air between the observer and the object. It is not violent within the first few yards, and then diminished gradually, but it is equal for each foot of interposing air. Now, in a clear day and clear climate, such as that generally presupposed in a work of fine color, Objects are completely visible at a distance of ten miles, visible in light and shade, with gradations between the two. Take then the faintest possible hue of shadow, or of any color, and the most violent and positive possible, and set them side by side. The interval between them is greater than the real difference, for objects may often be seen clearly much further than ten miles. I have seen Mont Blanc at 120, caused by the 10 miles of intervening air between any given hue of the nearest and most distant objects. But let us assume it, in courtesy to the masters of aerial perspective, to be the real difference. Then, roughly estimating a mile at less than it really is, also in courtesy to them, or at 5,000 feet, we have this difference between tints produced by 50,000 feet of air. Then, 10 feet of air will produce 5,000th part of this difference. Let the reader take the two extreme tints and carefully gradate the one into the other. Let him divide this gradated shadow or color into 5,000 successive parts, and the difference in depth between one of these parts and the next is the exact amount of aerial perspective between one object and another, ten feet behind it on a clear day. Now, in Millet's Huguenot, the figures were standing about three feet from the wall behind them, and the wise world of critics, which could find no other fault with the picture, professed to have its eyes hurt by the want of an aerial perspective which, had it been accurately given, as indeed I believe it was, would have amounted to the ten over three five thousandth, or less than the fifteen thousandth part of the depth of any given color. It would be interesting to see a picture painted by the critics upon this scientific principle. The aerial perspective usually represented is entirely conventional and ridiculous. A mere struggle on the part of the pretendedly well-informed but really ignorant artist to express distances by mist which he cannot by drawing. It is curious that the critical world is just as much offended by the true presence of aerial perspective over distances of fifty miles and with definite purpose of representing mist in the works of Turner as by the true absence of aerial perspective over distances of three feet and in clear weather in those of Millet. Well, but, still answers the reader, this kind of error may here and there be occasioned by too much respect for undigested knowledge, but, on the whole, the gain is greater than the loss, and the fact is, that a picture of the Renaissance period, or by a modern master, 
does indeed represent nature more faithfully than one wrought in the ignorance of old times. No, not one whit, for the most part less faithfully. Indeed, the outside of nature is more truly drawn, the material commonplace, which can be systematized, catalogued, and taught to all painstaking mankind, forms of ribs and scapulae, of eyebrows and lips and curls of hair. Whatever can be measured and handled, dissected and demonstrated, in a word, whatever is of the body only, that the schools of knowledge do resolutely and courageously possess themselves of, and portray. But whatever is immeasurable, intangible, indivisible, and of the spirit, that the schools of knowledge do as certainly lose and blot out of their sight, that is to say, all that is worthy arts possessing or recording at all. For whatever can be arrested, measured, and systematized, we can contemplate as much as we will in nature herself. But what we want art to do for us is to stay what is fleeting, and to enlighten what is incomprehensible, to incorporate the things that have no measure, and immortalize the things that have no duration. The dimly seen, momentary glance, the flitting shadow of faint emotion, the imperfect lines of fading thought, and all that by one and through such things as these is recorded on the features of man, and all that in man's person and the actions, and in the great natural world, is infinite and wonderful having in it that spirit and power which man may witness but not weigh, conceive but not comprehend, love but not limit, and imagine but not define. This, the beginning and the end of the aim of all noble art, we have in the ancient art by perception, and we have not in the newer art by knowledge. Giotto gives it us, Orcagna gives it us, Angelico, Memi, Pisano, it matters not who, all simple and unlearned men, in their measure and manner, give it us, and the learned men that followed them give it us not, and we, in our supreme learning, own ourselves at this day farther from it than ever. Nay, but it is still answered, this is because we have not yet brought our knowledge into right use, but have been seeking to accumulate it rather than to apply it wisely to the ends of art. Let us now do this, and we may achieve all that was done by that elder ignorant art, and infinitely more. No, not so. For as soon as we try to put our knowledge to good use, we shall find that we have much more than we can use, and that what more we have is an encumbrance. All our errors in this respect arise from a gross misconception as to the true nature of knowledge itself. We talk of learned and ignorant men, as if there were a certain quantity of knowledge which to possess was to be learned and which not to possess was to be ignorant, instead of considering that knowledge is infinite, and that the man most learned in human estimation is just as far from knowing anything as he ought to know it, as the unlettered peasant. Men are merely on a lower or higher stage of an eminence, whose summit is God's throne, infinitely above all and there is just as much reason for the wisest as for the simplest man being discontented with his position as respects the real quantity of knowledge he possesses. And, for both of them, the only true reasons for contentment with the sum of knowledge they possess are these, that it is the kind of knowledge they need for their duty and happiness in life, that all they have is tested and certain, so far as it is in their power, that all they have is well in order and within reach when they need it, 
that it has not cost too much time in getting, that none of it, once got, has been lost, and that there is not too much to be easily taken care of. Consider these requirements a little, and the evils that result in our education and polity from neglecting them. Knowledge is mental food, and is exactly to the spirit what food is to the body, except that the spirit needs several sorts of food, of which knowledge is only one. And it is liable to the same kind of misuses. It may be mixed and disguised by art till it becomes unwholesome. It may be refined, sweetened, and made palatable until it has lost all its power of nourishment, and even of its best kind it may be eaten to surfeiting and minister to disease and death. Therefore, with respect to knowledge, we are to reason and exact exactly as with respect to food. We no more live to know than we live to eat, we live to contemplate, enjoy, act, adore, and we may know all that is to be known in this world and what Satan knows in the other without being able to do any of these. We are to ask, therefore, first, is the knowledge we would have fit food for us, good and simple, not artificial and decorated? And secondly, how much of it will enable us best for our work, and will leave our hearts light and our eyes clear, for no more than that is to be eaten without the old eve of sin. Observe also the difference between tasting knowledge and hoarding it. In this respect it is also like food, since, in some measure, the knowledge of all men is laid up in granaries for future use. Much of it is at any given moment dormant, not fed upon or enjoyed, but in store. And by all it is to be remembered that knowledge in this form may be kept without air till it rots, or in such unthreshed disorder that it is of no use, and that, however good or orderly, it is still only in being tasted that it becomes of use and that men may easily starve in their own granaries, men of science perhaps most of all, for they are likely to seek accumulation of their store rather than nourishment from it. Yet let it not be thought that I would undervalue them. The good and great among them are like Joseph, to whom all nations sought to buy corn, or like the sower going forth to sow beside all waters, sending forth thither the feet of the ox and the ass. Only let us remember that this is not all men's work. We are not intended to be all keepers of granaries, nor all to be measured by the filling of a storehouse. But many, nay, most of us, are to receive day by day our daily bread, and shall be as well nourished and as fit for our labor, and often also fit for nobler and more divine labor, in feeding from the barrel of meat that does not waste, and from the cruise of oil that does not fail, than if our barns were filled with plenty, and our presses bursting out with new wine. It is for each man to find his own measure in this matter, in great part also, for others to find it for him, while he is yet a youth. And the desperate evil of the whole Renaissance system is, that all idea of measure is therein forgotten, that knowledge is thought the one and the only good, and it is never inquired whether men are vivified by it or paralyzed. Let us leave figures. The reader may not believe the analogy I have been pressing so far, but let him consider the subject in itself, let him examine the effect of knowledge in his own heart, and see whether the trees of knowledge and of life are one now any more than in paradise. 
he must feel that the real animating power of knowledge is only in the moment of its being first received, when it fills us with wonder and joy, a joy for which, observe, the previous ignorance is just as necessary as the present knowledge. That man is always happy who is in the presence of something which he cannot know to the full, which he is always going on to know. This is the necessary condition of a finite creature with divinely rooted and divinely directed intelligence. This, therefore, its happy state. But observe, a state not of triumph or joy in what it knows, but of joy rather in the continual discovery of new ignorance, continual self-abasement, continual astonishment. Once thoroughly our own, the knowledge ceases to give us pleasure. It may be practically useful to us. It may be good for others or good for usury to obtain more. But in itself, once let it be thoroughly familiar, and it is dead. The wonder is gone from it, and all the fine color which it had when first we drew it up out of the infinite sea. And what does it matter how much or how little of it we have laid aside, when our only enjoyment is still in the casting of that deep sea line? What does it matter? Nay, in one respect it matters much, and not to our advantage. For one effect of knowledge is to deaden the force of the imagination and the original energy of the whole man. Under the weight of his knowledge, he cannot move so lightly as in the days of his simplicity. The pack horse is furnished for the journey, the war horse is armed for war, but the freedom of the field and the lightness of the limb are lost for both. Knowledge is, at best, the pilgrim's burden or the soldier's panoply, often a weariness to them both and the Renaissance knowledge is like the Renaissance armor of plate, binding and cramping the human form, while all good knowledge is like the crusader's chain mail, which throws itself into the folds with the body, yet it is rarely so forged as that the clasps and rivets do not gall us. All men feel this, though they do not think of it nor reason out its consequences. They look back to the days of childhood as of greatest happiness, because those were the days of greatest wonder, greatest simplicity, and most vigorous imagination. And the whole difference between a man of genius and other men, it has n been said a thousand times, and most truly, is that the first remains in great part a child, seeing with the large eyes of children in perpetual wonder, not conscious of much knowledge, conscious rather of infinite ignorance, and yet infinite power, a fountain of eternal admiration, delight, and creative force within him meeting the ocean of visible and governable things around him. That is what we have to make men, so far as we may. All are to be men of genius in their degree, rivulets or rivers, it does not matter, so that the souls be clear and pure, not dead walls encompassing dead heaps of things, known and numbered, but running waters in the sweet wilderness of things unnumbered and unknown, conscious only of the living banks on which they partly refresh and partly reflect the flowers, and so pass on. Let each man answer for himself how far his knowledge has made him this, or how far it is loaded upon him as the pyramid is upon the tomb. Let him consider also how much of it has cost him labor and time that might have been spent in healthy, happy action, beneficial to all mankind. How many living souls may have been left uncomforted and unhelped by him, while his own eyes were failing by the midnight lamp? 
how many warm sympathies have died within him as he measured lines or counted letters, how many draughts of ocean air and steps on mountain turf and openings of the highest heaven he has lost for his knowledge. How much of that knowledge, so dearly bought, is now forgotten or despised, leaving only the capacity of wonder less within him, and, as it happens in a thousand instances, perhaps even also the capacity of devotion. And let him, if, after thus dealing with his own heart, he can say that his knowledge has indeed been fruitful to him, yet consider how many there are who have been forced by the inevitable laws of modern education into the toil utterly repugnant to their natures, and that, in the extreme, until the whole strength of the young soul was sapped away, and then pronounce with fearfulness how far and in how many senses it may indeed be true that the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Now all this possibility of evil, observe, attaches to knowledge pursued for the noblest ends, if it be pursued imprudently. I have assumed, in speaking of its effects both on men generally, and on the artist especially, that it was sought in the true love of it, and with all honesty and directness of purpose. But this is granting far too much in its favor. Of knowledge in general, and without qualification, it is said by the apostle that it puffeth up, and the father of all modern science, writing directly in its praise, yet asserts this danger even in more absolute terms, calling it a venomousness in the very nature of knowledge itself. There is indeed much difference in this respect between the tendencies of different branches of knowledge, it being a sure rule that exactly in proportion as they are inferior, nugatory, or limited in scope, their power of feeding pride is greater. Thus philology, logic, rhetoric, and the other sciences of the schools, being for the most part ridiculous and trifling, have so pestilent an effect upon those who are devoted to them, that their students cannot conceive of any higher sciences than these, but fancy that all education ends in the knowledge of words. But the true and great sciences, more especially natural history, make men gentle and modest in proportion to the largeness of their apprehension and just perception of the infiniteness of the things they can never know. And this, it seems to me, is the principal lesson we are intended to be taught by the book of Job. For there God has thrown open to us the heart of a man most just and holy, and apparently perfect in all things possible to human nature, except humility. For this he is tried, and we are shown that no suffering, no self-examination, however honest, however stern, no searching out of the heart by its own bitterness, is enough to convince man of his nothingness before God but that the sight of God's creation will do it. For when the deity himself has willed to end the temptation and to accomplish in Job that for which it was sent, he does not vouchsafe to reason with him, still less does he overwhelm him with terror or confound him by laying open before his eyes the book of his iniquities. He opens before him only the arch of the day-spring and the fountains of the deep, and amidst the covert of the reeds, and on the heaving waves. He bids him watch the kings of the children of pride. Behold now, Behemoth, which I made with thee, 
and the work is done. Thus, if, I repeat, there is any one lesson in the whole book which stands forth more definitely than another, it is this of the holy and humbling influence of natural science on the human heart. And yet, even here, it is not the science, but the perception to which the good is owing. And the natural sciences may become as harmful as any others when they lose themselves in classification and catalogue-making. Still, the principal danger is with the sciences of words and methods, and it was exactly in those sciences that the whole energy of men during the Renaissance period was thrown. They discovered suddenly that the world for ten centuries had been living in an ungrammatical manner, and they made it forthwith the end of human existence to be grammatical. And it mattered thenceforth nothing what was said or what was done, so only that it was said with scholarship and done with system. Falsehood in a Ciceronian dialect had no opposers, truth in patois no listeners. A Roman phrase was thought worth any number of Gothic facts. The sciences ceased at once to be anything more than different kinds of grammars, grammar of language, grammar of logic, grammar of ethics, grammar of art, and the tongue, wit, and invention of the human race were supposed to have found their utmost and most divine mission in syntax and syllogism, perspective and five orders. Of such knowledge as this, nothing but pride could come, and therefore I have called the first mental characteristic of the Renaissance schools the pride of science. If they had reached any science worth the name, they might have loved it, but of the paltry knowledge they possessed, they could only be proud. There was not anything in it capable of being loved. Anatomy, indeed, then first made a subject of accurate study, is a true science, but not so attractive as to enlist the affections strongly on its side, and therefore, like its meaner sisters, it became merely a ground for pride. And the one main purpose of the Renaissance artists in all their work was to show how much they knew. End of chapter two, part two. Reading by Malone. Chapter two, part three of the Stones of Venice. Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Malone. The Stones of Venice, Volume 3, by John Ruskin. The Roman Renaissance, Part 3. There were, of course, noble exceptions, but chiefly belonging to the earliest periods of the Renaissance, when its teaching had not yet produced its full effect. Raphael, Leonardo, and Michelangelo were all trained in the old school. They all had masters who knew the true ends of art, and had reached them, masters nearly as great as they were themselves but imbued with the old religious and earnest spirit which their disciples receiving from them and drinking at the same time deeply from all the fountains of knowledge opened in their day, became the world's wonders. Then the dull wandering world believed that their greatness rose out of their new knowledge instead of out of that ancient religious root in which to abide was life, from which to be severed was annihilation. And from that day to this they have tried to produce Michelangelo's and Leonardo's 
by teaching the barren sciences, and still have mourned and marveled that no more Michelangelo's came, not perceiving that those great fathers were only able to receive such nourishment because they were rooted on the rock of all ages, and that our scientific teaching nowadays is nothing more nor less than the assiduous watering of trees whose stems are cut through. Nay, I have even granted too much in saying that those great men were able to receive pure nourishment from the sciences. For my own conviction is, and I know it to be shared by most of those who love Raphael truly, that he painted best when he knew the least. Michelangelo was betrayed again and again into such vain and offensive exhibition of his anatomical knowledge as to this day renders his higher powers indiscernible by the greater part of men, and Leonardo fretted his life away in engineering so that there is hardly a picture left to bear his name. But, with respect to all who followed, there can be no question that the science they possessed was utterly harmful, serving merely to draw away their hearts at once from the purpose of art and the power of nature, and to make out of the canvas and marble nothing more than materials for the exhibition of petty dexterity and useless knowledge. It is sometimes amusing to watch the naive and childish way in which this vanity is shown. For instance, when perspective was first invented, the world thought it a mighty discovery, and the greatest men it had in it were as proud of knowing that retiring lines converge as if all the wisdom of Solomon had been compressed into a vanishing point and, accordingly, it became nearly impossible for anyone to paint a nativity, but he must turn the stable and manger into a Corinthian arcade in order to show his knowledge of perspective, and half the best architecture of the time, instead of being adorned with historical sculpture, as of old, was set forth with bas-relief of minor corridors and galleries, thrown into perspective. Now that perspective can be taught to any schoolboy in a week, we can smile at this vanity. But the fact is that all pride in knowledge is precisely as ridiculous, whatever its kind or whatever its degree. There is indeed nothing of which a man has any right to be proud, but the very last thing of which with any show of reason he can make his boast is his knowledge, except only that infinitely small portion of it which he has discovered for himself. For what is there to be more proud of in receiving a piece of knowledge from another person than in receiving a piece of money? Beggars should not be proud, whatever kind of alms they receive. Knowledge is like current coin, a man may have some right to be proud of possessing it if he has worked for the gold of it and assayed it and stamped it so that it may be received of all men as true or earned it fairly, being already assayed. But if he has done none of these things but only had it thrown in his face by a passer-by, what cause has he to be proud and though in this mendicant fashion he had heaped together the wealth of Croesus, would pride any more for this become him, as in some sort it becomes the man who has labored for his fortune, however small? So, if a man tells me the sum is larger than the earth, have I any cause for pride in knowing it? Or if any multitude of men tell me any number of things, heaping all their wealth of knowledge upon me, have I any reason to be proud under the heap? And is not nearly all the knowledge of which we boast in these days cast upon us in this dishonorable way, worked for by other men, proved by them, 
and then forced upon us, even against our wills, and beaten into us in our youth, before we have the wit even to know if it be good or not. Mark the distinction between knowledge and thought. Truly, a noble possession to be proud of. Be assured, there is no part of the furniture of a man's mind which he has a right to exult in, but that which he has hewn and fashioned for himself. He who has built himself a hut on a desert heath and carved his bed and table and chair out of the nearest forest may have some right to take pride in the appliances of his narrow chamber, as assuredly he will have joy in them. But the man who has had a palace built and adorned and furnished for him may indeed have many advantages above the other, but he has no reason to be proud of his upholsterer's skill, and it is ten to one if he has half the joy in his couches of ivory that the other will have in his pallet of pine. And observe how we feel this in the kind of respect we pay to such knowledge as we are indeed capable of estimating the value of. When it is our own and new to us, we cannot judge of it. But let it be another's also, and long familiar to us, and see what value we set on it. Consider how we regard a schoolboy fresh from his term's labor. If he begin to display his newly acquired small knowledge to us, and plume himself thereupon, how soon do we silence him with contempt? But it is not so if the schoolboy begins to feel or see anything. In the stirrings of his soul within him he is our equal. In his power of sight and thought he stands separate from us, and may be a greater than we. We are ready to fear him forthwith. You saw that, you felt that. No matter for your being a child, let us hear. Consider that every generation of men stands in this relation to its successors. It is as a schoolboy. The knowledge of which it is proudest will be as the alphabet to those who follow. It had better make no noise about its knowledge. A time will come when its utmost in that kind will be food for scorn. Poor fools, was that all they knew? And behold how proud they were. But what we see and feel will never be mocked at. All men will be thankful to us for telling them that. Indeed, they will say, they felt that in their own day, saw that. Would God we may be like them before we go to the home where sight and thought are not. This unhappy and childish pride in knowledge, then, was the first constituent element of the Renaissance mind, and it was enough of itself to have cast it into swift decline but it was aided by another form of pride, which was above called the pride of state, and which we have next to examine. 2. Pride of State It was noted in the second volume of Modern Painters, page 122, that the principle which had most power in retarding the modern school of portraiture was its constant expression of individual vanity and pride. And the reader cannot fail to have observed that one of the readiest and commonest ways in which the painter ministers to this vanity is by introducing the pedestal or shaft of a column or some fragment, however simple, of Renaissance architecture in the background of the portrait. And this is not merely because such architecture is bolder or grander than, in general, that of the apartments of a private house. No other architecture would produce the same effect in the same degree. The richest Gothic, the most massive Norman, would not produce the same sense of exaltation as the simple and meager lines of the Renaissance. 
and if we think over this matter a little, we shall soon feel that in those meager lines there is indeed an expression of aristocracy in its worst characters, coldness, perfectness of training, incapability of emotion, want of sympathy with the weakness of lower men, blank, hopeless, haughty self-sufficiency. All these characters are written in the Renaissance architecture as plainly as if they were graven on it in words. For observe, all other architectures have something in them that common men can enjoy, some concession to the simplicities of humanity, some daily bread for the hunger of the multitude, quaint fancy, rich ornament, bright color, something that shows a sympathy with men of ordinary minds and hearts, and this wrought out, at least in the Gothic, with a rudeness showing that the workman did not mind exposing his own ignorance if he could please others. But the Renaissance is exactly the contrary of all this. It is rigid, cold, inhuman, incapable of glowing, of stooping, of conceding for an instant. Whatever excellence it has is refined, high-trained, indubitably erudite, a kind which the architect well knows no common mind can taste. He proclaims it to us aloud. You cannot feel my work unless you study Vitruvius. I will give you no gay color, no pleasant sculpture, nothing to make you happy, for I am a learned man. All the pleasure you can have in anything I do is in its proud breeding, its rigid formalism, its perfect finish, its cold tranquility. I do not work for the vulgar, only for the men of the academy and the court. And the instinct of the world felt this in a moment. In the new precision and accurate law of the classical forms, they perceived something peculiarly adapted to the setting forth of state in an appalling manner. Princes delighted in it and courtiers. The Gothic was good for God's worship, but this was good for man's worship. The Gothic had fellowship with all hearts and was universal like nature. It could frame a temple for the prayer of nations, or shrink into the poor man's winding stair. But here was an architecture that would not shrink, that had in it no submission, no mercy. The proud princes and lords rejoiced in it. It would not be built to the materials at the poor man's hand. It would not root itself with thatch or shingle and black oak beams. It would not wall itself with rough stone or brick. It would not pierce itself with small windows where they were needed. It would not niche itself wherever there was room for it in the street corners. It would be of hewn stone. It would have its windows and its doors and its stairs and its pillars in lordly order and of stately saws. It would have its wings and its corridors and its halls and its gardens, as if all the earth were its own. And the rugged cottages of the mountaineers and the fantastic streets of the laboring burgher were to be thrust out of its way, as of a lower species. It is to be noted also that it ministered as much to luxury as to pride, not to luxury of the eye, that is a holy luxury. Nature ministers to that in her painted meadows and sculptured forests and gilded heavens. The Gothic builder ministered to that in his twisted traceries and deep-wrought foliage and burning casements. The dead Renaissance drew back into its earthliness, out of all that was warm and heavenly, back into its pride, out of all that was simple and kind, back into its stateliness, out of all that was impulsive, reverent, and gay. But it understood the luxury of the body 
the terraced and scented and grottoed garden with its trickling fountains and slumberous shades, the spacious hall and lengthened corridor for the summer heat, the well-closed windows and perfect fittings of furniture for defense against the cold, and the soft picture and frescoed wall and roof covered with the last lasciviousness of paganism. This is understood and possessed to the full, and still possesses. This is the kind of domestic architecture on which we pride ourselves even to this day, as an infinite and honorable advance from the rough habits of our ancestors, from the time when the king's floor was strewn with rushes and the tapestry swayed before the searching wind in the baron's hall. Let us hear two stories of those rougher times. At the debate of King Edwin and his courtiers and priests, whether he ought to receive the gospel preached to him by Paulinus, one of his nobles spoke as follows. The present life, O king, weighed with the time that is unknown, seems to me like this. When you are sitting at a feast with your earls and thanes in winter time, and the fire is lighted, and the hall is warmed, and it rains and snows, and the storm is loud without, there comes a sparrow, and flies through the house. It comes in at one door, and goes out at the other. While it is within, it is not touched by the winter storm, but it is but for the twinkling of an eye, for from winter it comes, and to winter it returns. So also this life of man endureth for a little space. What goes before or what follows after, we know not. Wherefore, if this new lore bring anything more certain, it is fit that we should follow it. That could not have happened in a Renaissance building. The bird could not have dashed in from the cold into the heat and from the heat back again into the storm. It would have had to come up a flight of marble stairs and through seven or eight antechambers, and so, if it had ever made its way into the presence chamber, out again through lodges and corridors innumerable. And the truth which the bird brought with it, fresh from heaven, has, in like manner, to make its way to the Renaissance mind through many antechambers, hardly and as a despised thing, if at all. Hear another story of those early times. The king of Jerusalem, Godfrey of Bouillon, at the siege of Ashur, or Arsur, gave audience to some emirs from Samaria and Naplus. They found him seated on the ground on a sack of straw, they expressing surprise, Godfrey answered them, May not the earth out of which we came, and which is to be our dwelling after death, serve us for a seat during life? It is long since such a throne has been set in the reception chambers of Christendom, or such an answer heard from the lips of a king. Thus the Renaissance spirit became base both in its abstinence and its indulgence, base in its abstinence, curtailing the bright and playful wealth of form and thought which filled the architecture of the earlier ages with sources of delight for their hardy spirit, pure, simple, yet rich as the fretwork of flowers and moss, watered by some strong and stainless mountain stream and base in its indulgence, as it granted to the body what it withdrew from the heart, and exhausted in smoothing the pavement for the painless feet, and softening the pillow for the sluggish brain, the powers of art which once had hewn rough ladders into the clouds of heaven, and set up stones by which they rested for houses of God. And just in proportion, as this courtly sensuality lowered the real nobleness of the men whom birth or fortune raised above their fellows, rose their estimate of their own dignity, together with the insolence and unkindness of its expression, and the grossness of the flattery 
with which it was fed. Pride is indeed the first and the last among the sins of men, and there is no age of the world in which it has not been unveiled in the power and prosperity of the wicked. But there was never in any form of slavery or of feudal supremacy a forgetfulness so total of the common majesty of the human soul and of the brotherly kindness due from man to man as in the aristocratic follies in the Renaissance. I have not space to follow out this most interesting and extensive subject, but here is a single and very curious example of the kind of flattery with which architectural teaching was mingled when addressed to the men of rank of the day. In St. Mark's Library there is a very curious Latin manuscript of the twenty-five books of Averhulinus, a Florentine architect, upon the principles of his art. The book was written in or about 1460 and translated into Latin and richly illuminated for Corvinus, king of Hungary, about 1483. I extract from the third book the following passage on the nature of stones. As there are three genera of men, that is to say nobles, men of the middle classes and rustics, so it appears that there are of stones. For the marbles and common stones of which we have spoken above set forth the rustics, the porphyries and alabasters and the other harder stones of mingled quality represent the middle classes, if we are to deal in comparisons, and by means of these the ancients adorned their temples with incrustations and ornaments in a magnificent manner. And after these come the Chalcedonies and Sardonyxes, and so on, which are so transparent that there can be seen no spot in them. Thus men endowed with nobility lead a life in which no spot can be found. Canute, or Coeur de Lyon, I name not Godfrey or Saint Louis, would have dashed their scepters against the lips of a man who should have dared to utter to them flattery such as this. But in the fifteenth century it was rendered and accepted as a matter of course, and the tempers which delighted in it necessarily took pleasure also in every vulgar or false means of taking worldly superiority. And among such false means, largeness of scale in the dwelling house was, of course, one of the easiest and most direct. All persons, however senseless or dull, could appreciate size. It required some exertion of intelligence to enter into the spirit of the quaint carving of the Gothic times, but none to perceive that one heap of stones was higher than another, and therefore, while in the execution and manner of work the Renaissance builders zealously vindicated for themselves the attribute of cold and superior learning, they appealed for such approbation as they needed from the multitude to the lowest possible standard of taste. And while the older workman lavished his labor on the minute niche and narrow casement, on the doorways no higher than the head, and the contracted angles of the turreted chamber, the Renaissance builder spared such cost and toil in his detail that he might spend it in bringing larger stones from a distance and restricted himself to rustication and five orders that he might load the ground with colossal piers and raise an ambitious barrenness of architecture as inanimate as it was gigantic above the feasts and follies of the powerful or the rich. The titanic insanity extended itself also into ecclesiastical design. The principal church in Italy was built with little idea of any other admirableness than that which was to result from its being huge, and the religious impressions of those who enter it are to this day supposed to be dependent 
in a great degree, on their discovering that they cannot span the thumbs of the statues which sustain the vessels for holy water. It is easy to understand how an architecture which thus appealed not less to the lowest instincts of dullness than to the subtlest pride of learning, rapidly found acceptance with a large body of mankind, and how the spacious pomp of the new manner of design came to be eagerly adopted by the luxurious aristocracies, not only of Venice, but of the other countries of Christendom, now gradually gathering themselves into that insolent and festering isolation against which the cry of the poor sounded hourly in more ominous unison, bursting at last into thunder, mark where, first among the planted walks and plashing fountains of the palace, wherein the Renaissance luxury attained its utmost height in Europe, Versailles. That cry, mingling so much piteousness with its wrath and indignation, our soul is filled with the scornful reproof of the wealthy and with the despitefulness of the proud. But of all the evidence bearing upon this subject presented by the various arts of the 15th century, none is so interesting or so conclusive as that deduced from its tombs. For exactly in proportion as the pride of life became more insolent, the fear of death became more servile and the difference in the manner in which the men of early and later days adorned the sepulchre confesses a still greater difference in their manner of regarding death. To those he came as the comforter and the friend, rest in his right hand, hope in his left. To these as the humiliator, the spoiler, and the avenger, and therefore we find the early tombs at once simple and lovely in adornment, severe and solemn in their expression, confessing the power and accepting the peace of death, openly and joyfully, and in all their symbols marking that the hope of resurrection lay only in Christ's righteousness, signed always with this simple utterance of the dead, I will lay me down in peace and take my rest, for it is thou, Lord, only that makest me dwell in safety." but the tombs of the later ages are a ghastly struggle of mean pride and miserable terror, the one mustering the statues of the virtues about the tomb, disguising the sarcophagus with delicate sculpture, polishing the false periods of the elaborate epitaph, and filling with strained animation the features of the portrait statue and the other summoning underneath, out of the niche or from behind the curtain, the frowning skull or the scythe skeleton or some other more terrible image of the enemy in whose defiance the whiteness of the sepulchre had been set to shine above the whiteness of the ashes. This change in the feeling with which sepulchral monuments were designed from the 11th to the 18th centuries has been common to the whole of Europe. But as Venice is in other respects the center of the Renaissance system, so also she exhibits this change in the manner of the sepulchral monument under circumstances peculiarly calculated to teach us its true character. For the severe guard which in earlier times she put upon every tendency to personal pomp and ambition renders the tombs of her ancient monarchs as remarkable for modesty and simplicity as for their religious feeling, so that in this respect they are separated by a considerable interval from the more costly monuments erected at the same periods to the kings or nobles of other European states. In later times, on the other hand, as the piety of the Venetians diminished, their pride overleaped all limits, and the tombs which in recent epochs were erected for men who had lived only to impoverish or disgrace the state were as much more magnificent than those contemporaneously erected for the nobles of Europe 
as the monuments for the great Doge had been humbler. When, in addition to this, we reflect that the art of sculpture, considered as expressive of emotion, was at a low ebb in Venice in the 12th century, and that in the 17th she took the lead in Italy in luxurious work, we shall at once see the chain of examples through which the change of feeling is expressed must present more remarkable extremes here than it can in any other city. Extremes so startling that their impressiveness cannot be diminished, while their intelligibility is generally increased by the large number of intermediate types which have fortunately been preserved. It would, however, too much weary the general reader if, without illustrations, I were to endeavor to lead him step by step through the aisles of St. John and St. Paul, and I shall therefore confine myself to a slight notice of those features in sepulchral architecture generally which are especially illustrative of the matter at present in hand, and point out the order in which, if possible, the traveler should visit the tombs in Venice, so as to be most deeply impressed with the true character of the lessons they convey. End of chapter 2, part 3. Reading by Malone. Chapter 2, Part 4 of The Stones of Venice, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Malone. The Stones of Venice, Volume 3 by John Ruskin. The Roman Renaissance, Part 4. I have not such an acquaintance with the modes of entombment or memorial in the earliest ages of Christianity as would justify me in making any general statement respecting them. But it seems to me that the perfect type of a Christian tomb was not developed until toward the thirteenth century, sooner or later, according to the civilization of each country that perfect type consisting in the raised and perfectly visible sarcophagus of stone, bearing upon it a recumbent figure, and the whole covered by a canopy. Before that type was entirely developed, and in the more ordinary tombs contemporary with it, we find the simple sarcophagus, often with only a rough block of stone for its lid, sometimes with a low gabled lid like a cottage roof, derived from Egyptian forms, and bearing, either on the sides or the lid, at least a sculpture of the cross, and sometimes the name of the deceased and date of erection of the tomb. In more elaborate examples, rich figure sculpture is gradually introduced, and in the perfect period the sarcophagus even when it does not bear any recumbent figure, has generally a rich sculpture on its sides, representing an angel presenting the dead in person and dressed as he lived to Christ or to the Madonna, with lateral figures, sometimes of saints, sometimes, as in the tombs of the Dukes of Burgundy at Dijon, of mourners, but in Venice almost always representing the Annunciation, the angel being placed at one angle of the sarcophagus and the Madonna at the other. The canopy, in a very simple four-square form, or as an arch over a recess, is added above the sarcophagus, long before the life-size recumbent figure appears resting upon it. By the time that the sculptors had acquired skill enough to give much expression to this figure, the canopy attains an exquisite symmetry and richness, and, in the most elaborate examples, 
is surmounted by a statue, generally small, representing the dead person in the full strength and pride of life, while the recumbent figure shows him as he lay in death. And at this point, the perfect type of the Gothic tomb is reached. Of the simple sarcophagus tomb, there are many exquisite examples, both at Venice and Verona. The most interesting in Venice are those which are set in the recesses of the rude brick front of the Church of St. John and Paul, ornamented only, for the most part, with two crosses set in circles, and the legend with the name of the dead and an orate pro anima in another circle in the center. And in this we may note one great proof of superiority in Italian over English tombs, the latter being often enriched with quatrefoils, small shafts and arches, and other ordinary architectural decorations, which destroy their seriousness and solemnity, render them little more than ornamental, and have no religious meaning whatever, while the Italian sarcophagus are kept massive, smooth, and gloomy, heavy-lidded dungeons of stone like rock tombs, but bearing on their surface, sculptured with tender and narrow lines, the emblem of the cross, not presumptuously nor proudly, but dimly graven upon their granite, like the hope which the human heart holds, but hardly perceives in its heaviness. Among the tombs in front of the church of St. John and Paul, there is one which is peculiarly illustrative of the simplicity of these earlier ages. It is on the left of the entrance a massy sarcophagus with low horns as of an altar placed in a rude recess of the outside wall, shattered and worn, and here and there entangled among wild grass and weeds. Yet it is the tomb of two doge, Jacopo and Lorenzo Tiepolo, by one of whom nearly the whole ground was given for the erection of the noble church in front of which his unprotected tomb is wasting away. The sarcophagus bears an inscription in the center, describing the acts of the doge, of which the letters show that it was added a considerable period after the erection of the tomb. The original legend is still left in other letters on its base to this effect. Lord James died 1251. Lord Lawrence died 1288. At the two corners of the sarcophagus are two angels bearing censers, and on its lid two birds with crosses like crests upon their heads. For the sake of the traveller in Venice, the reader will, I think, pardon me, the momentary irrelevancy of telling the meaning of these symbols. The foundation of the church of St. John and Paul was laid by the Dominicans about 1234, under the immediate protection of the Senate and the Doge Giacomo Tiepolo accorded to them in consequence of a miraculous vision appearing to the Doge, of which the following account is given in popular tradition. In the year 1226, the Doge Giacomo Tiepolo dreamed a dream, and in his dream he saw the little oratory of the Dominicans, and behold, the ground all around it, now occupied by the church, was covered with roses of the color of vermilion, and the air was filled with their fragrance. And in the midst of the roses there were seen flying to and fro a crowd of white doves with golden crosses upon their heads. And while the doors looked and wondered, behold, two angels descended from heaven with golden censers, and passing through the oratory, and forth among the flowers, they filled the place with the smoke of their incense. Then the doge heard suddenly a clear and loud voice which proclaimed, This is the place that I have chosen for my preachers. 
and having heard it, straightway he awoke, and went to the senate, and declared to them the vision. Then the senate decreed that forty paces of ground should be given to enlarge the monastery, and the doge Tiepolo himself made a still larger grant afterwards. There is nothing miraculous in the occurrence of such a dream as this to the devout doge, and the fact of which there is no doubt that the greater part of the land on which the church stands was given by him is partly a confirmation of the story. But whether the sculptures on the tomb were records of the vision, or the vision a monkish invention from the sculptures on the tomb, the reader will not, I believe, look upon its doves and crosses, or rudely carved angels, any more with disdain, knowing how, in one way or another, they were connected with a point of deep religious belief. Towards the beginning of the fourteenth century in Venice, the recumbent figure begins to appear on the sarcophagus, the first dated example being also one of the most beautiful. The statue of the prophet Simeon, sculptured upon the tomb which was to receive his relics, in the church dedicated to him under the name of San Simeone Grande. So soon as the figure appears, the sarcophagus becomes much more richly sculptured, but always with definite religious purpose. It is usually divided into two panels, which are filled with small bas-reliefs of the axe or martyrdom of the patron saints of the deceased. Between them, in the center, Christ or the Virgin and Child are richly enthroned under a curtained canopy, and the two figures representing the Annunciation are almost always at the angles, the promise of the birth of Christ being taken as at once the ground and the type of a promise of eternal life to all men. These figures are always in Venice most rudely chiseled, the progress of figure sculpture being there comparatively tardy. At Verona, where the great Pisan school had strong influence, the monumental sculpture is immeasurably finer, and so early as about the year 1335, the consummate form of the Gothic tomb occurs in the monument of Can Grande de la Scala at Verona. It is set over the portal of the chapel, anciently belonging to the family. The sarcophagus is sculptured with shallow bas-reliefs, representing, which is rare in the tombs with which I am acquainted in Italy, unless they are those of saints, the principal achievements of the warrior's life, especially the siege of Vicenza and battle of Placenza. These sculptures, however, form little more than a chaste and roughened groundwork for the fully relieved statues representing the Annunciation, projecting boldly from the front of the sarcophagus. Above, the Lord of Verona is laid in his long robe of civil dignity, wearing the simple bonnet, consisting merely of a fillet bound round the brow, knotted and falling on the shoulder. He is laid as asleep, his arms crossed upon his body, and his sword by his side. Above him a bold arched canopy is sustained by two projecting shafts, and on the pinnacle of its roof is the statue of the knight on his war-horse, his helmet dragon-winged and crested with the dog's head, tossed back behind his shoulders, and the broad and blazoned drapery floating back from his horse's breast, so truly drawn by the old workman from the life that it seems to wave in the wind, and the knight's spear to shake, and his marble horse to be evermore quickening its pace and starting into heavier and hastier charge as the silver clouds float past behind it in the sky. Now observe, in this tomb, as much concession is made to the pride of man as may ever consist with honor, discretion, or dignity. 
I do not enter into any question respecting the character of Con Grande, though there can be little doubt that he was one of the best among the nobles of his time. But that is not to our purpose. It is not the question whether his wars were just or his greatness honorably achieved, but whether, supposing them to have been so, these facts are well and gracefully told upon his tomb and I believe there can be no hesitation in the admission of its perfect feeling and truth. Though beautiful, the tomb is so little conspicuous or intrusive that it serves only to decorate the portal of the little chapel, and is hardly regarded by the traveler as he enters. When it is examined, the history of the acts of the dead is found subdued into dim and minute ornament upon his coffin, and the principal aim of the monument is to direct the thoughts to his image as he lies in death, and to the expression of his hope of resurrection, while seen as by the memory far away, diminished in the brightness of the sky, there is set the likeness of his armed youth, stately, as it stood of old, in the front of battle, and meet to be thus recorded for us, that we may now be able to remember the dignity of the frame of which those who once looked upon it hardly remembered that it was dust. This, I repeat, is as much as may ever be granted, but this ought always to be granted to the honor and the affection of men. The tomb which stands beside that of Can Grande, nearest it in the little field of sleep, already shows the traces of erring ambition. It is the tomb of Mastino II, in whose reign began the decline of his family. It is altogether exquisite as a work of art, and the evidence of a less wise or noble feeling in its design is found only in this that the image of a virtue, fortitude, as belonging to the dead, is placed on the extremity of the sarcophagus opposite to the crucifixion. But for this slight circumstance, of which the significance will only be appreciated as we examine the series of later monuments, the composition of this monument of Can Mastino would have been as perfect as its decoration is refined. It consists, like that of Can Grande, of the raised sarcophagus, bearing the recumbent statue, protected by a noble four-square canopy, sculptured with ancient scripture history. On one side of the sarcophagus is Christ enthroned, with Can Mastino kneeling before him. On the other, Christ is represented in the mystical form, half rising from the tomb, meant, I believe, to be at once typical of his passion and resurrection. The lateral panels are occupied by statues of saints. At one extremity of the sarcophagus is the crucifixion. At the other, a noble statue of fortitude, with a lion's skin thrown over her shoulders its head forming a shield upon her breast, her flowing hair bound with a narrow fillet and a three-edged sword in her gauntleted right hand, drawn back sternly behind her thigh, while in her left she bears high the shield of the scholars. Close to this monument is another, the stateliest and most sumptuous of the three, it first arrests the eye of the stranger and long detains it, a many-pinnacled pile surrounded by niches with statues of the warrior saints. It is beautiful, for it still belongs to the noble time, the latter part of the fourteenth century. But its work is coarser than that of the other, and its pride may well prepare us to learn that it was built for himself in his own lifetime by the man whose statue crowns it, Can Signorio de la Scala, 
Now observe, for this is infinitely significant, Ken Mastino II was feeble and wicked and began the ruin of his house. His sarcophagus is the first which bears upon it the image of a virtue, but he lays claim only to fortitude. Ken Sinorio was twice a fratricide, the last time when he lay upon his deathbed. His tomb bears upon its gables the image of six virtues, faith, hope, charity, prudence, and, I believe, justice and fortitude. Let us now return to Venice, where in the second chapel, counting from right to left, at the west end of the church of the Frari, there is a very early 14th or perhaps late 13th century tomb another exquisite example of the perfect Gothic form. It is a knight's, but there is no inscription upon it, and his name is unknown. It consists of a sarcophagus, supported on bold brackets against the chapel wall, bearing the recumbent figure, protected by a simple canopy in the form of a pointed arch, pinnacled by the knight's crest beneath which the shadowy space is painted dark blue and strewn with stars. The statue itself is rudely carved, but its lines, as seen from the intended distance, are both tender and masterly. The knight is laid in his mail, only the hands and face being bare. The halberd and the helmet are of chain mail. The armor for the limbs of jointed steel a tunic fitting close to the breast and marking the noble swell of it by two narrow embroidered lines, is worn over the mail. His dagger is at his side. His long cross-belted sword, not seen by the spectator from below, at his left. His feet rest on a hound, the hound being his crest, which looks up towards its master. In general, in tombs of this kind, the face of the statue is slightly turned towards the spectator. In this monument, on the contrary, it is turned away from him, towards the depth of the arch, for there, just above the warrior's breast, is carved a small image of St. Joseph, bearing the instrument Christ, who looks down upon the resting figure, and to this image its countenance is turned. The appearance of the entire tomb is as if the warrior had seen the vision of Christ in his dying moments and had fallen back peacefully upon his pillow, with his eyes still turned to it and his hands clasped in prayer. On the opposite side of this chapel is another very lovely tomb to Duccio de Alberti, a Florentine ambassador at Venice noticeable chiefly as being the first in Venice on which any images of the virtues appear. We shall return to it presently, but some account must first be given of the more important among the other tombs in Venice belonging to the perfect period. Of these, by far the most interesting, though not the most elaborate, is that of the great doge Francesco Dandolo, whose ashes, it might have been thought, were honorable enough to have been permitted to rest undisturbed in the chapter house of the Frari, where they were first laid. But, as if there were not room enough, nor waste houses enough in the desolate city to receive a few convent papers, the monks, wanting an archivio, have separated the tomb into three pieces. The canopy, a simple arch sustained on brackets, still remains on the blank walls of the desecrated chamber. The sarcophagus has been transported to a kind of museum of antiquities, established in what was once the cloister of Santa Maria della Salute, and the painting which filled the lunette behind it is hung far out of sight at one end of the sacristy of the same church. 
The sarcophagus is completely charged with bas-reliefs at its two extremities are the types of St. Mark and St. John, in front a noble sculpture of the death of a virgin, at the angles, angels holding vases. The whole space is occupied by the sculpture. There are no spiral shafts or panel divisions, only a basic plinth below and crowning plinth above, the sculpture being raised from a deep concave field between the two. But in order to give piquancy and picturesqueness to the mass of figures, two small trees are introduced at the head and foot of the Madonna's couch, an oak and a stone pine. It was said above, in speaking of the frequent disputes of the Venetians with the pontifical power, which in their early days they had so strenuously supported, that the humiliation of Francesco Dandolo blotted out the shame of Barbarossa. It is indeed well that the two events should be remembered together. By the help of the Venetians, Alexander III was enabled in the twelfth century to put his foot upon the neck of the Emperor Barbarossa, quoting the words of the psalm, Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder. A hundred and fifty years later, the Venetian ambassador, Francesco Dandolo, unable to obtain even an audience from the Pope, Clement V, to whom he had been sent to pray for a removal of the sentence of excommunication pronounced against the Republic, concealed himself, according to the common tradition, beneath the pontiff's dining-table, and thence coming out as he sat down to meet, embraced his feet, and obtained, by tearful entreaties, the removal of the terrible sentence. I say, according to the common tradition, for there are some doubts cast upon the story by its supplement. Most of the Venetian historians assert that Francesco Dandolo's surname of Daub was given him first on this occasion in insult by the cardinals, and that the Venetians, in remembrance of the grace which his humiliation had won for them, made it a title of honor to him and to his race. It has, however, been proved that the surname was borne by the ancestors of Francesco Dandolo long before, and the falsity of this seal of the legend renders also its circumstances doubtful. But the main fact of grievous humiliation having been undergone admits of no dispute. The existence of such a tradition at all is in itself a proof of its truth. It was not one likely to be either invented or received without foundation, and it will be well, therefore, that the reader should remember in connection with the treatment of Barbarossa at the door of the Church of St. Mark's, that in the Vatican, one hundred and fifty years later, a Venetian noble, a future doge, submitted to a degradation of which the current report among his people was that he had crept on his hands and knees from beneath the pontiff's table to his feet and had been spurned as a dog by the cardinal's present. There are two principal conclusions to be drawn from this, the obvious one respecting the insolence of the papal dominion in the thirteenth century, the second that there were probably most deep piety and humility in the character of the man who could submit to this insolence for the sake of a benefit to his country. Probably no motive would have been strong enough to obtain such a sacrifice from most men, however unselfish. But it was, without doubt, made easier to Dandolo by his profound reverence for the pontifical office, a reverence which, however, we may now esteem those who claim it could not but have been felt by nearly all good and faithful men at the time of which we are speaking. This is the main point which I wish the reader to remember as we look at his tomb. 
this and the result of it, that some years afterwards, when he was seated on the throne which his piety had saved, there were sixty princes, ambassadors in Venice at the same time, requesting the judgment of the Senate on matters of various concernment. So great was the fame of the uncorrupted justice of the fathers. Observe, there are no virtues on this tomb, nothing but religious history or symbols. The death of the Virgin in front, and the types of St. Mark and St. John at the extremities. Of the tomb of the Doge Andrea Dandolo and St. Mark's I have spoken before. It is one of the first in Venice which presents in a canopy the peace and idea of angels withdrawing curtains as of a couch to look down upon the dead. The sarcophagus is richly decorated with flower work. The usual figures of the Annunciation are at the sides and enthroned Madonna in the center, and two bas-reliefs, one of the martyrdom of the Doge's patron saint, St. Andrew, occupy the intermediate spaces. All these tombs have been richly colored. The hair of the angels has here been gilded, their wings bedropped with silver, and their garments covered with the most exquisite arabesques. This tomb, and that of St. Isidore in another chapel of St. Mark's, which was begun by this very doge, Andrea Dandolo, and completed after his death in 1354, are both nearly alike in their treatment, and are, on the whole, the best existing examples of Venetian monumental sculpture. Of much ruder workmanship, though still most precious and singularly interesting from its quaintness, is a sarcophagus in the northernmost chapel, beside the choir of St. John and Paul, charged with two bas-reliefs and many figures, but which bears no inscription. It has, however, a shield with three dolphins on its brackets, and as at the feet of the Madonna in the center there is a small kneeling figure of a doge, we know it to be the tomb of the doge Giovanni Dolfino, who came to the throne in 1356. He was chosen doge while, as proveditore, he was in Treviso, defending the city against the king of Hungary. The Venetians is sent to the besiegers, praying that their newly elected doge might be permitted to pass the Hungarian lines. Their request was refused, the Hungarians exulting that they held the doge of Venice prisoner in Treviso. But Dolfino, with a body of two hundred horse, cut his way through their lines by night and reached Mestre, Marghera, in safety, where he was met by the Senate. His bravery could not avert the misfortunes which were accumulating on the Republic. The Hungarian war was ignominiously terminated by the surrender of Dalmatia. The Doge's heart was broken, his eyesight failed him, and he died of the plague four years after he had ascended the throne. It is perhaps on this account, perhaps in consequence of later injuries, that the tomb has neither effigy nor inscription. That it has been subjected to some violence is evident from the dental which once crowned its leaf cornice being now broken away, showing the whole front. But fortunately, the sculpture of the sarcophagus itself is little injured. There are two saints, male and female, at its angles, each in a little niche a Christ enthroned in the center, the Doge and Dojaresa kneeling at his feet in the two intermediate panels, on one side the Epiphany, on the other the death of the Virgin, the whole supported, as well as crowned, by an elaborate leaf plinth. The figures under the niches are rudely cut and of little interest, not so the central group. Instead of a niche, 
the Christ is seated under a square tent or tabernacle, formed by curtains running on rods. The idea, of course, as usual, borrowed from the Pisan one, but here ingeniously applied. The curtains are opened in front, showing those at the back of the tent, behind the seated figure, the perspective of the two retiring sides being very tolerably suggested. Two angels, of half the size of the seated figure, thrust back the near curtain and look up reverently to the Christ, while again at their feet, about one-third of their size, and half sheltered, as it seems, by their garments, are the two kneeling figures of the Doge and Dogeressa, though so small and carefully cut, full of life. The Christ, raising one hand as to bless, and holding a book upright and open on the knees, does not look either towards them or to the angels, but forward, and there is a very noticeable effort to represent divine abstraction in the countenance. The idea of the three magnitudes of spiritual being, the God, the angel, and the man, is also to be observed, aided as it is by the complete subjection of the angelic power to the divine. For the angels are in attitudes of the most lowly watchfulness of the face of Christ, and appear unconscious of the presence of the human beings who are nestled in the folds of their garments. With this interesting but modest tomb of one of the kings of Venice, it is desirable to compare that of one of her senators of exactly the same date, which is raised against the western wall of the Frari at the end of the north aisle. It bears the following remarkable inscription, Anno mille trecentum quinquaginta decem, Prima die julii sepultura, Domini Simoni e Dandolo, Amador de Justicia, e de Siroso de Arcese el ben comum. The Amador de Justicia has perhaps some reference to Simon Dandolo's having been one of the junta who condemned the Doge Faliero. The sarcophagus is decorated merely by the Annunciation group and an enthroned Madonna with a curtain behind her throne, sustained by four tiny angels, who look over it as they hold it up, but the workmanship of the figures is more than usually beautiful. Seven years later, a very noble monument was placed on the north side of the choir of St. John and Paul to the Doge Marco Cornardo, chiefly with respect to our present subject, noticeable for the absence of religious imagery from the sarcophagus, which is decorated with roses only. Three very beautiful statues of the Madonna and two saints are, however, set in the canopy above. Opposite this tomb, though about fifteen years later in date, is the richest monument of the Gothic period in Venice, that of the Doge Michele Morosini, who died in 1382. It consists of a highly floored canopy, an arch crowned by a gable with pinnacles at the flanks, boldly crocketed and with a huge finial at the top representing St. Michael, a medallion of Christ set in the gable, under the arch, a mosaic representing the Madonna presenting the doors to Christ upon the cross. Beneath, as usual, the sarcophagus, with the most noble recumbent figure of the doors, his face meager and severe and sharp in its lines, but exquisite in the form of its small and princely features. The sarcophagus is adorned with elaborate wrinkled leafage, projecting in front of it into seven brackets, from which the statues are broken away, but by which, for there can be no doubt that these last statues represented the theological and cardinal virtues, we must for a moment pause. 
it was noticed above that the tomb of the florentine ambassador duccio was the first in venice which presented images of the virtues its small lateral statues of justice and temperance are exquisitely beautiful and were i have no doubt executed by a florentine sculptor the whole range of artistical power and religious feeling being in florence full half a century in advance of that of venice but this is the first truly venetian tomb which has the virtues and it becomes of importance therefore to know what was the character of morosini the reader must recollect that i dated the commencement of the fall of venice from the death of carlo zeno considering that no state could be held as in decline which numbered such a man amongst its citizens carlo zeno was a candidate for the ducal bonnet together with michael morosini and morosini was chosen it might be anticipated therefore that there was something more than usually admirable or illustrious in his character yet it is difficult to arrive at a just estimate of it as the reader will at once understand by comparing the following statements one to him andrea contarini succeeded morosini at the age of seventy-four years a most learned and prudent man who also reformed several laws, San Sovino Vite de Principi. 2. It was generally believed that if his reign had been longer, he would have dignified the state by many noble laws and institutes. But by so much as his reign was full of hope, by as much was it short in duration for he died when he had been at the head of the republic but four months sabellico liber octo three he was allowed but a short time to enjoy his high dignity which he had so well deserved by his rare virtues for god called him to himself on the fifteenth of october muratori annali d'italia Four. Two candidates presented themselves. One was Zeno, the other that Michael Morosini, who, during the war, had tripled his fortune by his speculations. The suffrages of the electors fell upon him, and he was proclaimed Doge on the 10th of June. Daru, Histoire de Venise, Libre dix. Five. The choice of the electors was directed to Michele Morosini, a noble of illustrious birth, derived from a stock which, coeval with the Republic itself, had produced the conqueror of Tyre, given a queen to Hungary, and more than one doge to Venice. The brilliancy of this descent was tarnished in the present chief representative of the family by the most base and groveling avarice for at that moment, in the recent war, at which all other Venetians were devoting their whole fortunes to the service of the state, Morosini sought in the distresses of his country an opening for his own private enrichment, and employed his ducats not in the assistance of the national wants, but in speculating upon houses which were brought to market at a price far beneath the real value and which, upon the return of the peace, ensured the purchaser a fourfold profit. What matters the fall of Venice to me, so as I fall not together with her, was his selfish and sordid reply to some one who expressed surprise at the transaction. Sketches of Venetian History, Murray, 1831 The writer of the unpretending little history from which the last quotation is taken, has not given his authority for this statement, and I could not find it, but believed from the general accuracy of the book that some authority might exist better than Daru's. Under these circumstances, wishing if possible to ascertain the truth, 
and to clear the character of this great Doge from the accusation, if it proved groundless, I wrote to the Count Carlo Morosini, his descendant, and one of the few remaining representatives of the ancient noblesse of Venice, one also by whom his great ancestral name is revered, and in whom it is exalted. His answer appears to be altogether conclusive as to the utter fallacy of the reports of Daru and the English history. I have placed his letter in the close of this volume, Appendix 6, in order that the reader may himself be the judge upon this point, and I should not have alluded to Daru's report, except for the purpose of contradicting it, but that it still appears to me impossible that any modern historian should have gratuitously invented the whole story, and that, therefore, there must have been a trace in the documents which Daru himself possessed of some scandal of this kind raised by Morosini's enemies, perhaps at the very time of the disputed election with Carlo Zeno. The occurrence of the virtues upon his tomb, for the first time in Venetian monumental work, and so richly and conspicuously placed, may partly have been in public contradiction of such a floating rumor but the face of the statue is a more explicit contradiction still. It is resolute, thoughtful, serene, and full of beauty, and we must, therefore, for once, allow the somewhat boastful introduction of the virtues to have been perfectly just, though the whole tomb is most notable as furnishing not only the exact intermediate condition in style between the pure Gothic and its final Renaissance corruption, but at the same time the exactly intermediate condition of feeling between the pure calmness of early Christianity and the boastful pomp of the Renaissance faithlessness. For here we have still the religious humility remaining in the mosaic of the canopy, which shows the doors kneeling before the cross, while yet this tendency to self-trust is shown in the surrounding of the coffin by the virtues. End of chapter 2, part 4 Reading by Malone Chapter 2, part 5 of The Stones of Venice, volume 3 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Malone. The Stones of Venice, Volume 3, by John Ruskin. The Roman Renaissance, Part 5. The next tomb, by the side of which they appear, is that of Jacopo Cavalli in the same chapel of St. John and Paul, which contains the tomb of the Doge Delphine. It is peculiarly rich in religious imagery, adorned by boldly cut types of the four evangelists and of two saints, while on projecting brackets in front of it stood three statues of faith, hope, and charity, now lost, but drawn in Zanotto's work, it is all rich in detail, and its sculptor has been proud of it, thus recording his name below the epitaph. Quest opera d'intaglio e fatto in piera un venician lafe canome polo, nato di Giacomel chatai a piera. This work of sculpture is done in stone. A Venetian did it, named Paul son of Giacomo, the stonecutter. Jacopo Cavalli died in 1384. He was a bold and active Veronese soldier, did the state much service, was therefore ennobled by it, and became the founder of the house of the Cavalli. But I find no especial reason for the images of the virtues, especially that of charity, 
appearing at his tomb, unless it be this, that at the siege of Feltre in the war against Leopold of Austria, he refused to assault the city because the Senate would not grant his soldiers the pillage of the town. The feet of the recumbent figure, which is in full armor, rest on a dog, and its head on two lions, and these animals, neither of which form any part of the knight's bearings, are said by Zanotto to be intended to symbolize his bravery and fidelity. If, however, the lions are meant to set forth courage, it is a pity they should have been represented as howling. We must next pause for an instant beside the tomb of Michael Steno, now in the northern isle of St. John and Paul, having been removed there from the destroyed church of the Servi. First, to note its remarkable return to the early simplicity, the sarcophagus being decorated only with two crosses in quatrefoils, though it is of the 15th century, Steno dying in 1413. And, in the second place, to observe the peculiarity of the epitaph which eulogizes Steno as having been amator justitiae, pacis et ubertatis, a lover of justice, peace, and plenty. In the epitaphs of this period, the virtues which are made most account of in public men are those which were most useful to their country. We have already seen one example in the epitaph on Simon Dandolo, and similar expressions occur constantly in laudatory mentions of their later doges by the Venetian writers. Thus, San Sovino of Marco Cornaro era savio uomo, eloquente, e amava molto la pace e l'abbondanza della città and of Tommaso Morsenigo, uomo oltre modo desideroso della pace. Of the tomb of this last name, Doge, mention has before been made. Here, as in Morosini's, the images of the virtues have no ironical power, although their great conspicuousness marks the increase of the boastful feeling in the treatment of monuments. For the rest, this tomb is the last in Venice which can be considered as belonging to the Gothic period. Its moldings are already rudely classical, and it has meaningless figures in Roman armor at the angles. But its tabernacle above is still Gothic, and the recumbent figure is very beautiful. It was carved by two Florentine sculptors in 1423. Tommaso Morsenigo was succeeded by the renowned doge Francesco Foscari, under whom, it will be remembered, the last additions were made to the Gothic ducal palace, additions which in form only, not in spirit, corresponded to the older portions, since during his reign the transition took place which permits us no longer to consider the Venetian architecture as Gothic at all. He died in 1457, and his tomb is the first important example of Renaissance art. Not, however, a good characteristic example. It is remarkable chiefly as introducing all the faults of the Renaissance at an early period, when its merits, such as they are, were yet undeveloped. Its claim to be rated as a classical composition is altogether destroyed by the remnants of Gothic feeling which cling to it here and there in their last forms of degradation, and of which, now that we find them thus corrupted, the sooner we are rid, the better. Thus, the sarcophagus is supported by a species of trefoil arches, the bases of the shafts have still their spurs, and the whole tomb is covered by a pediment with crockets and a pinnacle. We shall find that the perfect Renaissance is at least pure in its insipidity and subtle in its vice, but this monument is remarkable as showing the refuse of one style encumbering the embryo of another, and all principles of life entangled 
either in the swaddling clothes or the shroud. With respect to our present purpose, however, it is a monument of enormous importance. We have to trace, be it remembered, the pride of state in its gradual intrusion upon the sepulchre, and the consequent and correlative vanishing of the expressions of religious feeling and heavenly hope, together with the more and more arrogant setting forth of the virtues of the dead. Now, this tomb is the largest and most costly we have yet seen, but its means of religious expression are limited to a single statue of Christ, small and used merely as a pinnacle at the top. The rest of the composition is as curious as it is vulgar. The conceit, so often noted as having been borrowed from the Pisan school, of angels withdrawing the curtains of the couch to look down upon the dead, was brought forward with increasing prominence by every succeeding sculptor. But, as we draw nearer to the Renaissance period, we find that the angels become of less importance and the curtains of more. With the Pisans, the curtains are introduced as a motive for the angels. With the Renaissance sculptors, the angels are introduced merely as a motive for the curtains, which become every day more huge and elaborate. In the monument of Mosenigo, they have already expanded into a tent with a pole in the center of it, and in that of Foscari, for the first time, the angels are absent altogether, while the curtains are arranged in the form of an enormous French tent bed and are sustained at the flanks by two diminutive figures in Roman armor, substituted for the angels, merely that the sculptor might show his knowledge of classical costume. And now observe how often a fault in feeling induces also a fault in style. In the old tombs, the angels used to stand on or by the side of the sarcophagus, but their places are here to be occupied by the virtues, and therefore to sustain the diminutive Roman figures at the necessary height, each has a whole Corinthian pillar to himself, a pillar whose shaft is eleven feet high and some three or four feet round, and because this was not high enough, it is put on a pedestal four feet and a half high, and has a spurred base besides of its own, a tall capital, and then a huge bracket above the capital, and then another pedestal above the bracket, and on top of all the diminutive figure who has charge of the curtains. Under the canopy, thus arranged, is placed the sarcophagus with its recumbent figure. The statues of the Virgin and the Saints have disappeared from it. In their stead, its panels are filled with half-length figures of faith, hope, and charity while temperance and fortitude are at the doge's feet, justice and prudence at his head, figures now the size of life, yet nevertheless recognizable only by their attributes. For, except that hope raises her eyes, there is no difference in the character or expression of any of their faces. They are nothing more than handsome Venetian women in rather full and courtly dresses and tolerably well thrown into postures for effect from below. Fortitude could not, of course, be placed in a graceful one without some sacrifice of her character, but that was of no consequence in the eyes of the sculptors of this period, so she leans back languidly and nearly overthrows her own column, while temperance and justice opposite to her as neither the left hand of the one nor the right of the other could be seen from below, have been left with one hand each. Still, these figures, coarse and feelingless as they are, have been worked with care, because the principal effect of the tomb depends on them. But the effigy of the doge, of which nothing but the side is visible, has been utterly neglected and the ingenuity of the sculptor is not so great, at the best, as that he can afford to be slovenly. There is indeed nothing in the history of Foscari 
which would lead us to expect anything particularly noble in his face. But I trust, nevertheless, it has been misrepresented by this despicable carver, for no words are strong enough to express the baseness of the portraiture. A huge, gross, bony clown's face, with the peculiar sodden and sensual cunning in it, which is seen so often in the countenances of the worst Romanist priest. A face part of iron and part of clay, with the immobility of the one and the foulness of the other, double-chinned, blunt-mouthed, bony-cheeked, with its brows drawn down into meager lines and wrinkles over the eyelids. The face of a man incapable either of joy or sorrow, unless such as may be caused by the indulgence of passion or the mortification of pride. Even had he been such a one, a noble workman would not have written it so legibly on his tomb, and I believe it to be the image of the carver's own mind that is there hewn in the marble, not that of the Doge Foscari. For the same mind is visible enough throughout, the traces of it mingled with those of the evil taste of the whole time and people. There is not anything so small, but it is shown in some portion of its treatment, for instance, in placing of the shields at the back of the great curtain. In earlier times, the shield, as we have seen, was represented as merely suspended against the tomb by a thong, or if sustained in any other manner, still its form was simple and undisguised. Men in those days used their shields in war, and therefore there was no need to add dignity to their form by external ornament. That which, through day after day of mortal danger, had borne back from them the waves of battle, could neither be degraded by simplicity, nor exalted by decoration. By its rude leathern thong it seemed to be fastened to their tombs, and the shield of the mighty was not cast away, though capable of defending its master no more. It was otherwise in the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries. The changed system of warfare was rapidly doing away with the practical service of the shield, and the chiefs who directed the battle from a distance, or who passed the greater part of their lives in the council chamber, soon came to regard the shield as nothing more than a field for their armorial bearings. It then became a principal object of their pride of state to increase the conspicuousness of these marks of family distinction by surrounding them with various and fantastic ornament generally scroll or flower work, which, of course, deprived the shield of all appearance of being intended for a soldier's use. Thus, the shield of the Foscari is introduced in two ways. On the sarcophagus, the bearings are three times repeated, enclosed in circular discs, which are sustained each by a couple of naked infants. Above the canopy, Two shields of the usual form are set in the center of circles filled by a radiating ornament of shell flutings, which give them the effect of ventilators, and their circumference is further adorned by gilt rays undulating to represent a glory. We now approach that period of the early Renaissance which was noticed in the preceding chapter, as being at first a very visible improvement on the corrupted Gothic. The tombs executed during the period of the Byzantine Renaissance exhibit, in the first place, a consummate skill in handling the chisel, perfect science of drawing and anatomy, high appreciation of good classical models, and a grace of composition and delicacy of ornament derived, I believe, principally from the great Florentine sculptors. But, together with this science, they exhibit also, for a short time, some return to the early religious feeling, forming a school of sculpture which corresponds to that of the school of the Bellini in painting, 
and the only wonder is that there should not have been more workmen in the 15th century doing in marble what Perugino, Francia, and Bellini did on canvas. There are indeed some few, as I have just said, in whom the good and pure temper shows itself, but the sculptor was necessarily led sooner than the painter to an exclusive study of classical models, utterly adverse to the Christian imagination. And he was also deprived of the great purifying and sacred element of color, besides having much more of merely mechanical and therefore degrading labor to go through in the realization of his thought. Hence, I do not know any example in sculpture at this period, at least in Venice, which has not conspicuous faults, not faults of imperfection as in early sculpture, but of purpose and sentiment, staining such beauties as it may possess and the whole school soon falls away and merges into vain pomp and meagre metaphor. The most celebrated monument of this period is that to the Doge Andrea Vendramin in the Church of St. John and Paul, sculptured about 1480, and before alluded to in the first chapter of the first volume. It has attracted public admiration, partly by its costliness partly by the delicacy and precision of its chiseling, being otherwise a very base and unworthy example of the school, and showing neither invention nor feeling. It has the virtues, as usual, dressed like heathen goddesses, and totally devoid of expression, though graceful and well studied merely as female figures. The rest of its sculpture is all of the same kind, perfect in workmanship and devoid of thought. Its dragons are covered with marvelous scales, but have no terror nor sting in them. Its birds are perfect in plumage, but have no song in them. Its children are lovely of limb, but have no childishness in them. Of far other workmanship are the tombs of Pietro and Giovanni Mosenigo, in St. John and St. Paul, and of Pietro Bernardo in the Frari, in all which the details are as full of exquisite fancy as they are perfect in execution, and in the two former, and several others of similar feeling, the old religious symbols return. The Madonna is again seen enthroned under the canopy, and the sarcophagus is decorated with legends of the saints. But the fatal errors of sentiment are, nevertheless, always traceable. In the first place, the sculptor is always seen to be intent upon the exhibition of his skill, more than on producing any effect on the spectator's mind. Elaborate backgrounds of landscape, with tricks of perspective, imitations of trees, clouds, and water, and various other unnecessary adjuncts, merely to show how marble could be subdued, together with useless undercutting and overfinish in subordinate parts, continually exhibiting the same cold vanity and unexcited precision of mechanism. In the second place, the figures have all the peculiar tendency to posture-making, which, exhibiting itself first painfully in Perugino, rapidly destroyed the veracity of composition in all art. By posture-making, I mean, in general, that action of figures which results from the painter's considering in the first place not how, under the circumstances, they would actually have walked or stood or looked, but how they may most gracefully and harmoniously walk or stand. In the hands of a great man, posture, like everything else, becomes noble, even when overstudied, as with Michelangelo, who was perhaps, more than any other, the cause of the mischief. But with inferior men, this habit of composing attitudes ends necessarily in utter lifelessness and abortion. Giotto was, perhaps of all painters, 
the most free from the infection of the poison, always conceiving an incident naturally, and drawing it unaffectedly, and the absence of posture-making in the works of the pre-Raphaelites, as opposed to the attitudinarianism of the modern school, has been both one of their principal virtues and of the principal causes of outcry against them. But the most significant change in the treatment of these tombs with respect to our immediate object is in the form of the sarcophagus. It was above noted that exactly in proportion to the degree of the pride of life expressed in any monument would be also the fear of death, and therefore, as these tombs increase in splendor, in size and beauty of workmanship, we perceive a gradual desire to take away from the definite character of the sarcophagus. In the earliest times, as we have seen, it was a gloomy mass of stone. Gradually it became charged with religious sculpture, but never with the slightest desire to disguise its form until towards the middle of the 15th century. It then becomes enriched with flower work and hidden by the virtues, and finally, losing its four-square form, it is modeled on graceful types of ancient vases, made as little like a coffin as possible, and refined away in various elegancies, till it becomes at last a mere pedestal or stage for the portrait statue. This statue, in the meantime, has been gradually coming back to life through a curious series of transitions. The Vendramin monument is one of the last which shows, or pretends to show, the recumbent figure laid in death. A few years later, this idea became disagreeable to polite minds, and lo, the figures which before had been laid at rest upon the tomb pillow raised themselves on their elbows and began to look round them. The soul of the 16th century dared not contemplate its body in death. The reader cannot but remember many instances of this form of monument, England being peculiarly rich in examples of them, although with her tomb sculpture after the 14th century is altogether imitative and in no degree indicative of the temper of the people. It was from Italy that the authority for change was derived, and in Italy only, therefore, that it is truly correspondent to the change in the national mind. There are many monuments in Venice of this semi-animate type, most of them carefully sculptured, and some very admirable as portraits, and for the casting of the drapery, especially those in the church of San Salvador, but I shall only direct the reader to one, that of Jacopo Pesaro, Bishop of Paphos, in the Church of the Frari, notable not only as a very skillful piece of sculpture, but for the epitaph, singularly characteristic of the period, and confirmatory of all that I have alleged against it. James Pesaro, Bishop of Paphos, who conquered the Turks in war, himself in peace, transported from a noble family among the Venetians to a nobler among the angels. Laid here, expects the noblest crown which the just judge shall give to him in that day. He lived the years of Plato. He died 24th March, 1547. The mingled classicism and carnal pride of this epitaph surely need no comment. The crown is expected as a right from the justice of the judge, and the nobility of the Venetian family is only a little lower than that of the angels. The quaint childishness of the weeks at Anos Platonicos is also very notable. The statue, however, did not remain in this partially recumbent attitude. Even the expression of peace 
became painful to the frivolous and thoughtless Italians, and they required the portraiture to be rendered in a manner that should induce no memory of death. The statue rose up and presented itself in front of the tomb, like an actor upon a stage, surrounded now not merely or not at all by the virtues, but by allegorical figures of fame and victory, by genii and muses, by personifications of humbled kingdoms and adoring nations, and by every circumstance of pomp and symbol of adulation that flattery could suggest or insolence could claim. As of the intermediate monumental type, so also of this, the last and most gross, there are, unfortunately, many examples in our own country, but the most wonderful by far are still at Venice. I shall, however, particularize only two. The first, that of the Doge John Pissarro in the Frari. It is to be observed that we have passed over a considerable interval of time. We are now in the latter half of the 17th century. The progress of the corruption has, in the meantime, been incessant, and sculpture has here lost its taste and learning as well as its feeling. The monument is a huge accumulation of theatrical scenery and marble. Four colossal negro cariatides, grinning and horrible, with faces of black marble and white eyes, sustain the first story of it. Above this, Two monsters, long-necked, half-dog and half-dragon, sustain an ornamental sarcophagus on the top of which the full-length statue of the Doge, in robes of state, stands forward with its arms expanded, like an actor courting applause, under a huge canopy of metal, like the roof of a bed, painted crimson and gold. On each side of him are sitting figures of genii, and unintelligible personifications gesticulating in Roman armor. Below, between the Negro Cariatides, are two ghastly figures in bronze, half corpse, half skeleton, carrying tablets on which is written the eulogium. But in large letters graven in gold, the following words are the first and last that strike the eye. The first two phrases, one on each side, on tablets in the lower part, the last under the portrait statue above. Vixit annos septiginta. De vixit anno mille sexcentum quinquagenta novum. Hic revixit anno mille sexcentum novum et decem. We have here, at last, the horrible images of death in violent contrast with the defiant monument, which pretends to bring the resurrection down to earth. Hic revixit. And it seems impossible for false taste and base feeling to sink lower. Yet even this monument is surpassed by one in St. John and Paul. But before we pass to this, the last which I shall burden the reader's attention, let us for a moment, and that we may feel the contrast more forcibly, return to a tomb of the earlier times. In a dark niche in the outer wall of the outer corridor of St. Mark's, not even in the church, observe, but in the atrium or porch of it, and on the north side of the church, is a solid sarcophagus of white marble, raised only about two feet from the ground on four stunted square pillars. Its lid is a mere slab of stone. On its extremities are sculptured two crosses. In front of it are two rows of rude figures, the uppermost representing Christ with the apostles. The lower row is of six figures only, alternately male and female, holding up their hands in the usual attitude of benediction. The sixth is smaller than the rest, and the midmost of the other five has a glory round its head. I cannot tell the meaning of these figures, but between them are suspended censers attached to crosses. 
a most beautiful symbolic re expression of Christ's mediatorial function. The whole is surrounded by a rude wreath of vine leaves proceeding out of the foot of a cross. On the bar of marble which separates the two rows of figures are inscribed these words. Here lies the Lord Marin Morosini, Duke. It is the tomb of the Doge Marino Morosini, who arraigned from 1249 to 1252. From before this rude and solemn sepulcher, let us pass to the southern aisle of the Church of St. John and Paul, and there, towering from the pavement to the vaulting of the church, behold a mass of marble, sixty or seventy feet in height, of mingled yellow and white, the yellow carved into the form of an enormous curtain, with ropes, fringes, and tassels, sustained by cherubs, in front of which, in the now usual stage attitudes, advance the statues of the Doge Bertuccio Valier, his son the Doge Sylvester Valier, and his son's wife Elizabeth. These statues of the Doges, though mean and Polonius-like, are partly redeemed by the ducal robes, but that of the Dojaressa is a consummation of grossness, vanity, and ugliness. The figure of a large and wrinkled woman with elaborate curls and stiff projection round her face, covered from her shoulders to her feet with ruffs, furs, lace, jewels, and embroidery. Beneath and around are scattered virtues, victories, fames, genii, the entire company of the monumental stage assembled as before a drop scene, executed by various sculptors and deserving attentive study as exhibiting every condition of false taste and feeble conception. The victory in the center is peculiarly interesting. The lion, by which she is accompanied, springing on a dragon, has been intended to look terrible, but the incapable sculptor could not conceive any form of dreadfulness, could not even make the lion look angry. It looks only lachrymose, and its lifted forepaws, there being no spring nor motion in its body, give it the appearance of a dog begging. The inscription under the two principal statues are as follows. Bertuccius Valier, Duke, great in wisdom and eloquence, greater in his Hellespontic victory, greatest in the prince his son, died in the year 1658. Elizabeth Quirina, the wife of Sylvester, distinguished by Roman virtue, by Venetian piety, and by the ducal crown died 1708. The writers of this age were generally anxious to make the world aware that they understood the degrees of comparison, and a large number of epitaphs are principally constructed with this object, compare in Latin that of the Bishop of Paphos given above. But the latter of these epitaphs is also interesting from its mention in an age now altogether given up to the pursuit of worldly honor of that Venetian piety which once truly distinguished the city from all others, and of which some form and shadow remaining cunningly and speciously the pride which could not be satiated with the sumptuousness of the sepulchre. End of chapter 2, part 5 Reading by Malone Chapter 2, part 6 of The Stones of Venice, volume 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Malone The Stones of Venice, Volume 3 by John Ruskin, The Roman Renaissance, Part 6 Thus far, then, of the second element of the Renaissance spirit, 
the pride of state. Nor need we go farther to learn the reason of the fall of Venice. She was already likened in her thoughts, and was therefore to be likened in her ruin, to the Virgin of Babylon. The pride of state and the pride of knowledge were no new passions. The sentence against them had gone forth from everlasting. Thou saidst, I shall be a lady forever, so that thou didst not lay these things to thine heart. Thy wisdom and thy knowledge, it hath perverted thee. And thou hast said in thine heart, I am, and none else beside me. Therefore shall evil come upon thee. Thy merchants from thy youth, they shall wander every one to his quarter. None shall save thee. 3. Pride of System I might have illustrated these evil principles from a thousand other sources, but I have not time to pursue the subject farther and must pass to the third element above named, the pride of system. It need not detain us so long as either of the others, for it is at once more palpable and less dangerous. The manner in which the pride of the 15th century corrupted the sources of knowledge and diminished the majesty, while it multiplied the trappings of state, is in general little observed but the reader is probably already well and sufficiently aware of the curious tendency to formulization and system which, under the name of philosophy, encumbered the minds of the Renaissance schoolmen. As it was above stated, grammar became the first of sciences, and whatever subject had to be treated the first aim of the philosopher was to subject its principles to a code of laws in the observation of which the merit of the speaker, thinker, or worker, in or on that subject, was thereafter to consist, so that the whole mind of the world was occupied by the exclusive study of restraints. The sound of the forging of fetters was heard from sea to sea. The doctors of all the arts and sciences set themselves daily to the invention of new varieties of cages and manacles. They themselves wore, instead of gowns, a chain-mail, whose purpose was not so much to avert the weapon of the adversary as to restrain the motions of the wearer. And all the acts, thoughts, and workings of mankind poetry, painting, architecture, and philosophy, were reduced by them merely to so many different forms of fetter dance. Now, I am very sure that no reader who has given any attention to the former portions of this work, or the tendency of what else I have written, more especially the last chapter of The Seven Lamps, will suppose me to underrate the importance or dispute the authority of law. It has been necessary for me to allege these again and again, nor can they ever be too often or too energetically alleged against the vast masses of men who now disturb or retard the advance of civilization. Heady and high-minded despisers of discipline and refusers of correction. But law, so far as it can be reduced to form and system, and is not written upon the heart, as it is in a divine loyalty, upon the hearts of the great hierarchies who serve and wait about the throne of the eternal lawgiver. This lower and formally expressible law has, I say, two objects. It is either for the definition and restraint of sin, or the guidance of simplicity. It either explains, forbids, and punishes wickedness, or it guides the movements and actions both of lifeless things and of the more simple and untaught among responsible agents. And so long, therefore, as sin and foolishness are in the world, so long it will be necessary for men to submit themselves painfully to this lower law, in proportion to their need of being corrected, 
and to the degree of childishness or simplicity by which they approach more nearly to the condition of the unthinking and inanimate things which are governed by law altogether. Yet yielding, in the manner of their submission to it, a singular lesson to the pride of man, being obedient more perfectly in proportion to their greatness. But, so far as men become good and wise, and rise above the state of children, so far they become emancipated from this written law, and invested with the perfect freedom, which consists in the fullness and joyfulness of compliance with a higher and unwritten law, a law so universal, so subtle, so glorious, that nothing but the heart can keep it. Now, pride opposes itself to the observance of this divine law in two opposite ways, either by brute resistance, which is the way of the rabble and its leaders, denying or defying law altogether, or by formal compliance, which is the way of the Pharisee, exalting himself while he pretends to obedience, and making void the infinite and spiritual commandment by the finite and lettered commandment. And it is easy to know which law we are obeying, for any law which we magnify and keep through pride is always the law of the letter. But that which we love and keep through humility is the law of the spirit. And the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. In the appliance of this universal principle to what we have at present in hand, it is to be noted that all written or writable law respecting the arts is for the childish and ignorant that in the beginning of teaching it is possible to say that this or that must or must not be done, and laws of color and shade may be taught, as laws of harmony are to the young scholar in music. But the moment a man begins to be anything deserving the name of an artist, all this teachable law has become a matter of course with him, and if thenceforth he boast himself any wise in the law, or pretend that he lives and works by it, it is a sure sign that he is merely tithing cumin, and that there is no true art nor religion in him. For the true artist has that inspiration in him which is above all law, or rather which is continually working out such magnificent and perfect obedience to supreme law, as can in no wise be rendered by line and rule. There are more laws perceived and fulfilled in the single stroke of a great workman than could be written in a volume. His science is inexpressibly subtle, directly taught him by his maker, not in any wise communicable or imitable. Neither can any written or definitely observable laws enable us to do any great thing. It is possible, by measuring and administering quantities of color, to paint a room wall so that it shall not hurt the eye. But there are no laws by observing which we can become Titians. It is possible so to measure and administer syllables as to construct harmonious verse but there are no laws by which we can write Iliads. Out of the poem or the picture once produced, men may elicit laws by the volume and study them with advantage to the better understanding of the existing poem or picture. But no more write or paint another than by discovering laws of vegetation they can make a tree to grow. And therefore, Whatsoever we find the system and formality of rules much dwelt upon, and spoken of as anything else than a help for children, there we may be sure that noble art is not even understood, far less reached. And thus it was with all the common and public mind in the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries. The greater men, indeed, 
broke through the thorn hedges, and, though much time was lost by the learned among them in writing Latin verses and anagrams, and arranging the framework of quaint sonnets and dexterous syllogisms, still they tore their way through the sapless thicket by force of intellect or of piety. For it was not possible that, either in literature or in painting, rules could be received by any strong mind, so as materially to interfere with its originality. And the crabbed discipline and exact scholarship became an advantage to the men who could pass through and despise them, so that in spite of the rules of the drama we had Shakespeare, and in spite of the rules of art we had Tintoret, both of them to this day doing perpetual violence to the vulgar scholarship and dim-eyed proprieties of the multitude. But in architecture it was not so, for that was the art of the multitude, and was affected by all their errors, and the great men who entered its field, like Michelangelo, found expression for all the best part of their minds in sculpture, and made the architecture merely its shell. So the simpletons and sophists had their way with it, and the reader can have no conception of the inanities and puerilities of the writers who, with the help of Vitruvius, re-established its five orders, determined the proportions of each, and gave the various recipes for sublimity and beauty, which have been thenceforward followed to this day, but which may, I believe, in this age of perfect machinery, be followed out still farther, if indeed there are only five perfect forms of columns and architraves, and there be a fixed proportion to each, it is certainly possible with a little ingenuity to regulate a stone-cutting machine, as that it shall furnish pillars and friezes to the size ordered of any of the five orders on the most perfect Greek models in any quantity. An epitome also of Vitruvius may be made so simple as to enable any bricklayer to set them up at their proper distances, and we may dispense with our architects altogether. But if this be not so, and there be any truth in the faint persuasion which still lurks in men's minds that architecture is an art, and that it requires some gleam of intellect to practice it, then let the whole system of the orders and their proportions be cast out and trampled down as the most vain, barbarous, and paltry deception that was ever stamped on human prejudice. And let us understand this plain truth, common to all work of man, that if it be good work, it is not a copy, nor anything done by rule, but a freshly and divinely imagined thing. Five orders there is not a side chapel in any Gothic cathedral, but it has fifty orders, the worst of them better than the best of the Greek ones, and all new, and a single inventive human soul could create a thousand orders in an hour. And this would have been discovered even in the worst times, but that, as I said, the greatness of men of the age found expression for their invention in the other arts and the best of those who devoted themselves to architecture were in great part occupied in adapting the construction of buildings to new necessities, such as those developed by the invention of gunpowder, introducing a totally new and most interesting science of fortification, which directed the ingenuity of San Michele and many others from its proper channel and found interest of a meaner kind in the difficulties of reconciling the obsolete architectural laws they had consented to revive, and the forms of Roman architecture which they agreed to copy, with the requirements of the daily life of the sixteenth century. These, then, were the three principal directions in which the Renaissance pride manifested itself and its impulses were rendered still more fatal by the entrance of another element 
inevitably associated with pride. For, as it is written, He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool, so also it is written, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. And the self-adulation, which influenced not less the learning of the age than its luxury, led gradually to the forgetfulness of all things but self, and to an infidelity only the more fatal because it still retained the form and language of faith. 4. Infidelity In noticing the more prominent forms in which this faithlessness manifested itself, it is necessary to distinguish justly between that which was the consequence of respect for paganism and that which followed from the corruption of Catholicism. For, as the Roman architecture is not to be made answerable for the primal corruption of the Gothic, so neither is the Roman philosophy to be made answerable for the primal corruption of Christianity. Year after year, as the history of the life of Christ sank back into the depths of time and became obscured by the misty atmosphere of the history of the world, as intermediate actions and incidents multiplied in number and countless changes in men's modes of life and tones of thought rendered it more difficult for them to imagine the facts of distant time, it became daily, almost hourly, a greater effort for the faithful heart to apprehend the entire veracity and vitality of the story of its Redeemer and more easy for the thoughtless and remiss to deceive themselves as to the true character of the belief they had been taught to profess. And this must have been the case had the pastors of the church never failed in their watchfulness, and the church itself never erred in its practice or doctrine. But when every year that removed the truths of the gospel into deeper distance added to them also some false or foolish tradition, when willful distortion was added to natural obscurity, and the dimness of memory was disguised by the fruitfulness of fiction, when, moreover, the enormous temporal power granted to the clergy attracted into their ranks multitudes of men who, but for such temptation, would not have pretended to the Christian name, so that grievous wolves entered in among them, not sparing the flock. And when, by the machinations of such men and the remissness of others, the form and administrations of church doctrine and discipline had become little more than a means of aggrandizing the power of the priesthood, it was impossible any longer for men of thoughtfulness or piety to remain in an unquestioning serenity of faith. The church had become so mingled with the world that its witness could no longer be received, and the professing members of it, who were placed in circumstances such as to enable them to become aware of its corruptions, and whom their interest or their simplicity did not bribe or beguile into silence, gradually separated themselves into two vast multitudes of adverse energy, one tending to reformation and the other to infidelity. Of these, the last stood, as it were, apart to watch the course of the struggle between Romanism and Protestantism, a struggle which, however necessary, was attended with infinite calamity to the Church. For, in the first place, the Protestant movement was, in reality, not reformation, but reanimation. It poured new life into the church, but it did not form or define her anew. In some sort it rather broke down her hedges, so that all they who passed by might pluck off her grapes. The reformers speedily found that the enemy was never far behind the sower of good seed. 
that an evil spirit might enter the ranks of reformation as well as those of resistance, and that though the deadly blight might be checked amidst the wheat, there was no hope of ever ridding the wheat itself from the tares. New temptations were invented by Satan wherewith to oppose the revived strength of Christianity. As the Romanist, confiding in his human teachers, had ceased to try whether they were teachers sent from God, so the Protestant, confiding in the teaching of the Spirit, believed every spirit and did not try the spirits whether they were of God. And a thousand enthusiasms and heresies speedily obscured the faith and divided the force of the Reformation. But the main evils rose out of the antagonism of the two great parties, primarily in the mere fact of the existence of an antagonism. To the eyes of the unbeliever, the Church of Christ, for the first time since its foundation, bore the aspect of a house divided against itself. Not that many forms of schism had not before arisen in it, but either they had been obscure and silent, hidden among the shadows of the Alps and the marshes of the Rhine, or they had been outbreaks of visible and unmistakable error, cast off by the Church, rootless and speedily withering away, while with much that was erring and criminal, she still retained within her the pillar and ground of the truth. But here was at last a schism in which truth and authority were at issue. The body that was cast off withered away no longer. It stretched out its boughs to the sea and its branches to the river, and it was the ancient trunk that gave signs of decrepitude. On one side stood the reanimated faith, in its right hand the book open, and its left hand lifted up to heaven, appealing for its proof to the word of the testimony and the power of the Holy Ghost. On the other stood, or seemed to stand, all believed custom and believed tradition, all that for fifteen hundred years had been closest to the hearts of men or most precious for their help. Long-trusted legend, long-reverenced power, long-practiced discipline, faiths that had ruled the destiny and sealed the departure of souls that could not be told or numbered for multitude, prayers that from the lips of the fathers to those of the children had distilled like sweet waterfalls sounding through the silence of ages, breaking themselves into heavenly dew to return upon the pastures of the wilderness, hopes that had set the face as a flint in the torture and the sword as a flame in the battle, that had pointed the purposes and ministered the strength of life, brightened the last glances and shaped the last syllables of death, charities that had bound together the brotherhoods of the mountain and the desert and had woven chains of pitying or aspiring communion between this world and the unfathomable beneath and above. And, more than these, the spirits of all the innumerable undoubting dead, beckoning to the one way by which they had been content to follow the things that belonged unto their peace. These all stood on the other side, and the choice must have been a bitter one, even at the best. But it was rendered tenfold more bitter by the natural but most sinful animosity of the two divisions of the church against each other. On one side, this animosity was, of course, inevitable. The Romanist party, though still including many Christian men, necessarily included also all the worst of those who called themselves Christians. In the fact of its refusing correction, it stood confessed as the church of the unholy. And while it still counted among its adherents many of the simple and believing, men unacquainted 
with the corruption of the body to which they belonged, or incapable of accepting any form of doctrine but that which they had been taught from their youth. It gathered together with them whatever was carnal and sensual in priesthood or in people, all the lovers of power in the one and of ease in the other. And the rage of these men was, of course, unlimited against those who either disputed their authority, reprehended their manner of life, or cast suspicion upon the popular methods of lulling the conscience in the lifetime, or purchasing salvation on the deathbed. Besides this, the reassertion and defense of various tenets which before had been little more than floating errors in the popular mind, but which definitely attacked by Protestantism, it became necessary to fasten down with a band of iron and brass, gave a form at once more rigid and less rational to the whole body of Romanist divinity. Multitudes of minds which in other ages might have brought honor and strength to the church, preaching the more vital truths which it still retained, were now occupied in pleading for arraigned falsehoods or magnifying disused frivolities, and it can hardly be doubted by any candid observer that the nascent or latent errors which God pardoned in times of ignorance became unpardonable when they were formally defined and defended, that fallacies which were forgiven to the enthusiasm of a multitude were avenged upon the stubbornness of a council, that, above all, the great invention of the age, which rendered God's word accessible to every man, left all sins against its light incapable of excuse or expiation, and that from the moment when Rome set herself in direct opposition to the Bible, the judgment was pronounced upon her which made her the scorn and prey of her own children, and cast her down from the throne where she had magnified herself against heaven, so low that at last the unimaginable scene of the Bethlehem humiliation was mocked in the temples of Christianity. Judea had seen her God laid in the manger of the beasts of burden, it was for Christendom to stable the beasts of burden by the altar of her God. Nor, on the other hand, was the opposition of Protestantism to the papacy less injurious to itself. That opposition was, for the most part, intemperate, undistinguishing, and incautious. It could indeed hardly be otherwise. Fresh bleeding from the sword of Rome and still trembling at her anathema, the Reformed churches were little likely to remember any of her benefits, or to regard any of her teaching. Forced by the Romanist contumely into habits of irreverence, by the Romanist fallacies into habits of disbelief, the self-trusting, rashly reasoning spirit gained ground among them daily. Sect branched out of sect, presumption rose over presumption. The miracles of the early church were denied and its martyrs forgotten, though their power and palm were claimed by the members of every persecuted sect. Pride, malice, wrath, love of change masked themselves under the thirst for truth and mingled with the just resentment of deception so that it became impossible even for the best and truest men to know the plague of their own hearts, while avarice and impiety openly transformed reformation into robbery and reproof into sacrilege. Ignorance could as easily lead the foes of the church as lull her slumber. Men who would once have been the unquestioning recipients were now the shameless inventors of absurd or perilous superstitions. They who were of the temper that walketh in darkness gained little by having discovered their guides to be blind, and the simplicity of the faith 
ill understood and contumaciously alleged, became an excuse for the rejection of the highest arts and most tried wisdom of mankind, while the learned infidel, standing aloof, drew his own conclusions, both from the rancor of the antagonists and from their errors believed each in all that he alleged against the other, and smiled with superior humanity as he watched the winds of the Alps drift the ashes of Jerome and the dust of England drink the blood of King Charles. Now all this evil was, of course, entirely independent of the renewal of the study of pagan writers. But that renewal found the faith of Christendom already weakened and divided, and therefore it was itself productive of an effect tenfold greater than could have been apprehended from it at another time. It acted first, as before noticed, in leading the attention of all men to words instead of things, for it was discovered that the language of the Middle Ages had been corrupt and the primal object of every scholar became now to purify his style. To this study of words, that of forms being added, both as of matters of the first importance, half the intellect of the age was at once absorbed in the base sciences of grammar, logic, and rhetoric, studies utterly unworthy of the serious labor of men, and necessarily rendering those employed upon them incapable of high thoughts or noble emotion. Of the debasing tendency of philology, no proof is needed beyond once reading a grammarian's notes on a great poet. Logic is unnecessary for men who can reason, and about as useful to those who cannot, as a machine for forging one foot in due succession before the other would be to a man who could not walk, while the study of rhetoric is exclusively one for men who desire to deceive or be deceived. He who has the truth at his heart need never fear the want of persuasion on his tongue, or, if he fear it, it is because the base rhetoric of dishonesty keeps the truth from being heard. The study of these sciences, therefore, naturally made men shallow and dishonest in general, but it had a peculiarly fatal effect with respect to religion, in the view which men took of the Bible. Christ's teaching was discovered not to be rhetorical, St. Paul's preaching not to be logical, and the Greek of the New Testament not to be grammatical. The stern truth, the profound pathos, the impatient period, leaping from point to point and leaving the intervals for the hearer to fill, the comparatively Hebraized and unelaborate idiom had little in them of attraction for the students of phrase and syllogism, and the chief knowledge of the age became one of the chief stumbling blocks to its religion. But it was not the grammarian and logician alone who was thus retarded or perverted. In them there had been small loss. The men who could truly appreciate the higher excellences of the classics were carried away by a current of enthusiasm which withdrew them from every other study. Christianity was still professed as a matter of form, but neither the Bible nor the writings of the fathers had time left for their perusal, still less heart left for their acceptance. The human mind is not capable of more than a certain amount of admiration or reverence, and that which was given to Horace was withdrawn from David. Religion is, of all subjects, that which will least endure a second place in the heart or thoughts and a languid and occasional study of it was sure to lead to error or infidelity. On the other hand, what was heartily admired and unceasingly contemplated was soon brought nigh to being believed, and the systems of pagan mythology 
began gradually to assume the places in the human mind from which the unwatched Christianity was wasting. Men did not indeed openly sacrifice to Jupiter or build silver shrines for Diana, but the ideas of paganism nevertheless became thoroughly vital and present with them at all times, and it did not matter in the least as far as respected the power of true religion, whether the pagan image was believed in or not, so long as it entirely occupied the thoughts. The scholar of the 16th century, if he saw the lightning shining from the east under the west, thought forthwith of Jupiter, not of the coming of the Son of Man. And if he saw the moon walking in brightness, he thought of Diana, not of the throne which was to be established forever as a faithful witness in heaven. And though his heart was but secretly enticed, yet thus he denied the God that is above. And indeed, this double creed of Christianity confessed and paganism beloved was worse than paganism itself, inasmuch as it refused effective and practical belief altogether. It would have been better to have worshipped Diana and Jupiter at once than to have gone on through the whole of life naming one god, imagining another, and dreading none. Better a thousandfold to have been a pagan suckled in some creed outworn than to have stood by the great sea of eternity and seed no god walking on its waves, no heavenly world on its horizon. This fatal result of an enthusiasm for classical literature was hastened and heightened by the misdirection of the powers of art. The imagination of the age was actively set to realize these objects of pagan belief, and all the most exalted faculties of man, which up to that period had been employed in the service of faith, were now transferred to the service of fiction. The invention, which had formerly been both sanctified and strengthened by laboring under the command of settled intention and on the ground of assured belief, had now the reins laid upon its neck by passion, and all ground of fact cut from beneath its feet, and the imagination which formerly had helped men to apprehend the truth now tempted them to believe a falsehood. The faculties themselves wasted away in their own treason. One by one they fell in the potter's field, and the Raphael, who seemed sent and inspired from heaven that he might paint apostles and prophets, sank at once into powerlessness at the feet of Apollo and the Muses. But this was not all. The habit of using the greatest gifts of imagination upon fictitious subjects, of course, destroyed the honor and value of the same imagination used in the cause of truth. Exactly in the proportion in which Jupiter's and Mercury's were embodied and believed, in that proportion virgins and angels were disembodied and disbelieved. The images summoned by art began gradually to assume one average value in the spectator's mind. The incidents from the Iliad and from the Exodus to come within the same degrees of credibility. And farther, while the powers of the imagination were becoming daily more and more languid, because unsupported by faith, the manual skill and science of the artist were continually on the increase. When these had reached a certain point, they began to be the principal things considered in the picture, and its story or scene to be thought of only as a theme for their manifestation. Observe the difference. In old times, men used their powers of painting to show the objects of faith. In later times, they used the objects of faith that they might show their powers of painting. The distinction is enormous, the difference incalculable as irreconcilable, and thus the more skillful the artist, the less his subject was regarded, 
and the hearts of men hardened as their handling softened, until they reached the point when sacred, profane, or sensual subjects were employed with absolute indifference for the display of color and execution, and gradually the mind of Europe congealed into that state of utter apathy, inconceivable unless it had been witnessed, and unpardonable unless by us who have been infected by it, which permits us to place the Madonna and the Aphrodite side by side in our galleries, and to pass with the same unmoved inquiry into the manner of their handling from a bacchanal to a nativity. Now all this evil, observe, would have been merely the necessary and natural operation of an enthusiasm for the classics, and of a delight in the mere science of the artist, on the most virtuous mind. But this operation took place upon minds enervated by luxury, and which were tempted, at the very same period, to forgetfulness or denial of all religious principle by their own basest instincts. The faith which had been undermined by the genius of pagans was overthrown by the crimes of Christians, and the ruin which was begun by scholarship was completed by sensuality. The characters of the heathen divinities were as suitable to the manners of the time as their forms were agreeable to its taste and paganism again became, in effect, the religion of Europe. That is to say, the civilized world is at this moment collectively just as pagan as it was in the second century, a small body of believers being now, as they were then, representative of the Church of Christ in the midst of the faithless. But there is just this difference, and this very fatal one, between the second and nineteenth centuries, that the pagans are nominally and fashionably Christians, and that there is every conceivable variety and shade of belief between the two, so that not only is it most difficult theoretically to mark the point where hesitating trust and failing practice change into definite infidelity, but it has become a point of politeness not to inquire too deeply into our neighbor's religious opinions, and, so that no one be offended by violent breach of external forms, to waive any close examination into the tenets of faith. The fact is, we distrust each other and ourselves so much that we dare not press this matter. We know that if, on any occasion of general intercourse, we turn to our next neighbor and put to him some searching or testing question, we shall in nine cases out of ten discover him to be only a Christian in his own way and as far as he thinks proper, and that he doubts of many things which we ourselves do not believe strongly enough to hear doubted without danger. What is in reality cowardice and faithfulness we call charity and consider it the part of benevolence sometimes to forgive men's evil practice for the sake of their accurate faith, and sometimes to forgive their confessed heresy for the sake of their admirable practice. And under this shelter of charity, humility, and faint-heartedness, the world, unquestioned by others or by itself, mingles with and overwhelms the small body of Christians, legislates for them, moralizes for them, reasons for them, and though itself, of course, greatly and beneficently influenced by the association and held much in check by its pretense to Christianity, yet undermines in nearly the same degree the sincerity and practical power of Christianity itself, until at last in the very institutions of which the administration may be considered as the principal test of the genuineness of national religion, those devoted to education, the pagan system is completely triumphant, and the entire body of the so-called Christian world has established a system of instruction for its youth, wherein neither the history of Christ's church nor the language of God's law 
is considered a study of the smallest importance, wherein of all subjects of human inquiry, his own religion is the one in which a use ignorance is most easily forgiven, and in which it is held a light matter that he should be daily guilty of lying or debauchery or of blasphemy, so only that he write Latin verses accurately and with speed. I believe that in a few years more we shall wake from all these errors in astonishment as from evil dreams, having been preserved in the midst of their madness by those hidden roots of active and earnest Christianity which God's grace has bound in the English nation with iron and brass. But in the Venetian, those roots themselves had withered, and from the palace of their ancient religion, their pride cast them forth hopelessly to the pasture of the brute. From pride to infidelity, from infidelity to the unscrupulous and insatiable pursuit of pleasure, and from this to irremediable degradation, the transitions were swift like the falling of a star. The great palaces of the haughtiest nobles of Venice were stayed before they had risen far above their foundations by the blast of a penal poverty, and the wild grass on the unfinished fragments of their mighty shafts waves at the tide mark where the power of the godless people first heard the hitherto shalt thou come and the regeneration in which they had so vainly trusted the new birth and clear dawning, as they thought it, of all art, all knowledge, and all hope, became to them as that dawn which Ezekiel saw on the hills of Israel. Behold the day, behold it is come, the rod hath blossomed, pride hath budded, violence is risen up into a rod of wickedness. None of them shall remain, nor of their multitude. Let not the buyer rejoice, nor the seller mourn, for wrath is upon all the multitude thereof. End of chapter 2, part 6, reading by Malone. Chapter 3, Part 1 of The Stones of Venice, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Stones of Venice, Volume 3 by John Ruskin. Chapter 3, Grotesque Renaissance, Part 1. In the close of the last chapter, it was noted that the phases of transition in the moral temper of the failing Venetians, during their fall, were from pride to infidelity, and from infidelity to the unscrupulous pursuit of pleasure. During the last years of the existence of the state, the minds both of the nobility and the people seemed to have been set simply upon the attainment of the means of self-indulgence. There was not strength enough in them to be proud, nor forethought enough to be ambitious. One by one the possessions of the state were abandoned to its enemies, one by one the channels of its trade were forsaken by its own languor, or occupied and closed against it by its more energetic rivals, and the time, the resources, and the thoughts of the nation were exclusively occupied in the invention of such fantastic and costly pleasures as might best amuse their apathy, lull their remorse, or disguise their ruin. The architecture raised at Venice during this period is amongst the worst and basest ever built by the hands of man, being especially distinguished by a spirit of brutal mockery and insolent jest, which exhausting itself in deformed and monstrous sculpture can sometimes be hardly otherwise defined than as a perpetuation in stone of the ribaldies of drunkenness. On such a period and on such work it is painful to dwell, and I had not originally intended to do so, but I found that the entire spirit of the Renaissance could not be comprehended unless it was followed to its consummation and that there were many most interesting questions arising out of the study of this particular spirit of jesting, with reference to which I have called it the grotesque renaissance. For it is not this period alone which is distinguished by such a spirit. There is jest, perpetual, careless, and not infrequently obscene, in the most noble work of the Gothic periods, and it becomes, therefore, of the greatest possible importance to examine into the nature and essence of the grotesque itself, 
and to ascertain in what respect it is that the jesting of art in its highest flight differs from its jesting in its most utmost degradation. The place where we may best commence our inquiry is one renowned in the history of Venice, the space of ground before the church of Santa Maria Formosa, a spot which, after the Rialto and St. Mark's Palace, ought to possess a particular interest in the mind of the traveller, in consequence of its connection with the most touching and true legend of the brides of Venice. That legend is related at length in every Venetian history, and finally has been told by the poet Rogers in a way that renders it impossible for anyone to tell it after him. I have only, therefore, to remind the reader that the capture of the brides took place in the cathedral church, San Pietro di Castello, and that this of Santa Maria Formosa is connected with the tale only because it was yearly visited with prayers by the Venetian maidens on the anniversary of their ancestors' deliverance. For that deliverance, their thanks were to be rendered to the Virgin, and there was no church then dedicated to the Virgin in Venice except this. Neither of the cathedral church nor of this dedicated to St. Mary the Beautiful is one stone left upon another. But from that which has been raised on the site of the latter, we may receive a most important lesson, introductory to our immediate subject, if first we glance back to the traditional history of the church which has been destroyed. No more honorable epithet than traditional can be attached to what is recorded concerning it, yet I should grieve to lose the legend of its first direction. The Bishop of Azero, driven by the Lombards from his bishopric, as he was praying, beheld in a vision the virgin mother, who ordered him to found a church in her honor in the place where he should see a white cloud rest. And when he went out, the white cloud went before him, and on the place where it rested he built a church, and it was called the Church of St. Mary the Beautiful, from the loveliness of the form in which she had appeared in the vision. The first church stood only for about two centuries. It was rebuilt in 864, and enriched with various relics some fifty years later, relics belonging principally to St. Nicodemus, and much lamented when they and the church were together destroyed by fire in 1105. It was then rebuilt in Magnifica Forma, much resembling, according to Corner, the architecture of the chancel of St. Mark. But the information which I find in various writers as to the period at which it was reduced to its present condition is both sparing and contradictory. Thus, by Connor, we are told that this church, resembling St. Mark's, remained untouched for more than four centuries, until, in 1689, it was thrown down by an earthquake, and restored by the piety of a rich merchant, Torun Torino, in Ortissima Forma, and that, for the greater beauty of the renewed church, it had added to it two facades of marble. With this information, that of the Padre del Orazio agrees, only he gives the date of the earlier rebuilding of the church in 1175, and ascribes it to an architect of the name Barbetta. But Quadri, in his usually accurate little guide, tells us that this Barbetta rebuilt the church in the 14th century, and that of the two facades, so much admired by Corner, one is of the 16th century, and its architect unknown, and the rest of the church is of the 17th, in the style of San Savino. There is no occasion to examine, or endeavor to reconcile, these conflicting accounts. All that is necessary for the reader to know is that every vestige of the church in which the ceremony took place was destroyed at least as early as 1689, and that the ceremony itself, having been abolished at the close of the 14th century, is only to be conceived as taking place in that more ancient church resembling St. Mark's, which, even according to Quadri, existed until that period. I would, therefore, endeavor to fix the reader's mind, for a moment, on the contrast between the former and latter aspect of this plot of ground. The former, when it had its Byzantine church, and its yearly possession of the doge and the brides, and the latter, when it had its Renaissance church in the style of San Savino, and its yearly honoring is done away. And first, let us consider for a little the significance and nobleness of that early custom of the Venetians which brought about the attack and the rescue of the year 943. That there should be but one marriage day for the nobles of the whole nation, so that all might rejoice together, and that the sympathy might be full, not only of the families who that year beheld the alliance of their children and prayed for them in one crowd, weeping before the altar, but of all the families of the state who saw, in the day which brought happiness to others, the anniversary of their own. Imagine the strong bond of brotherhood thus sanctified among them, and consider also the effect on the minds of the youth of the state, the greater deliberation and openness necessarily given to the contemplation of marriage, to which all the people were solemnly to bear testimony, the more lofty and unselfish tone which it would give to all their thoughts. It was the exact contrary of stolen marriage. It was the marriage to which God and man were taken for witnesses, and every eye was invoked for its glance, and every tongue for its prayers. Later historians have delighted themselves in dwelling on the pageantry of the marriage day itself. 
but I do not find that they have authority for the splendor of their descriptions. I cannot find a word in the older chronicles about the jewels or dress of the brides, and I believe the ceremony to have been more quiet and homely than is usually supposed. The only sentence which gives color to the usual accounts of it is one of Sansovino's, in which he says that the magnificent dress of the brides in his day was founded on ancient custom. However this may have been, the circumstances of the rite were otherwise very simple. Each maiden brought her dowry with her in a small cascata, or chest. They were first to the cathedral and waited for the youths, who having come, they heard mass together, and the bishop preached to them and blessed them, and so each bridegroom took his bride and her dowry and bore her home. It seems that the alarm given by the attack of the pirates put an end to the custom of fixing one day for all marriages, but the main objects of the institution were still attained by the perfect publicity given to the marriages of all the noble families, the bridegroom standing in the court of the ducal palace to receive congratulations on his betrothal, and the whole body of nobility attending the nuptials, and rejoicing, as at some personal good fortune, since, by the constitution of the state, they are forever incorporated together, as if of one and the same family. But the festival of the 2nd of February, after the year 943, seems to have been observed only in memory of the deliverance of the brides, and no longer set aside for public nuptials. There is much difficulty in reconciling the various accounts, or distinguishing the inaccurate ones, of the manner of keeping this memorable festival. I shall first give Sansovino's, which is the popular one, and then note the points of importance in the counterstatements. Sansovino says that the success of the pursuit of the pirates was owing to the ready help and hard fighting of the men of the district of Santa Maria Formosa, for the most part trunk makers, and that they, having been presented after the victory to the Doge and the Senate, were told to ask some favor for their reward. The good men then said that they desired the prince, with his wife and the signore, to visit every year the church of their district on the day of the feast. And the prince asking them, suppose it should rain, they answered, We will give you hats to cover you, and if you are thirsty, we will give you to drink. Whence it is that the vicar, in the name of the people, presents to the doge, on his visit, two flasks of mavosia and two oranges, and presents to him two gilded hats, bearing the arms of the pope, of the prince, and of the vicar. And thus was instituted the feast of the Marys, which was called noble and famous because the people from all round came together to behold it, and it was celebrated in this manner. Quote, the account which follows is somewhat prolix, but its substance is briefly that twelve maidens were elected, two for each division of the city, and that it was decided by lot which contrade or quarters of the town should provide them with dresses. This was done at enormous expense, one contrada contending with another, and even the jewels of the treasury of St. Mark being lent for the occasion to the Marys, as the twelve damsels were called. They, being thus dressed with gold and silver and jewels, went in their galley to St. Mark's for the Doge, who joined them with the Signore, and went first to San Pietro da Castello to hear Mass on St. Mark's Day, the 31st of January, and to Santa Maria Formosa on the 2nd of February, the intermediate day being spent in passing in procession through the streets of the city, and sometimes there arose quarrels about the places they should pass through, for everyone wanted them to pass by his house. End quote. Nearly the same account is given by Corner who, however, does not say anything about the hats or the malvoyes. These, however, we find again in the Mertricola de Casoleri, which, of course, sets the services of the trunk-makers and the privileges obtained by them in the most brilliant light. The quaintness of the old Venetian is hardly to be rendered into English. Quote, and you must know that said trunk-makers were the men who were the cause of such victory, and of taking the galley, and of cutting all the tristines to pieces, because, at that time, they were valiant men and well in order, the which victory was on the 2nd February, on the day of the Madonna of Candles, and, at the request and entreaties of the said trunk-makers, it was decreed that the doge, every year, as long as Venice shall endure, shall go on the eve of said feast and vespers in the said church, with the signore, and be it noted that the vicar is obliged to give to the doge two flasks of bavez, with two oranges besides. And so it is observed, and will be observed always. End quote. The reader must observe the continual confusion between St. Mark's Day, the 31st of January, and Candlemas, the 2nd of February. The fact appears to be that the marriage day in the Old Republic was St. Mark's Day, and the recovery of the brides was the same day that evening, so that, as we are told by San Savino, the commemorative festival begins on that day, but it was continued to the day of the purification, that a special thanks might be rendered to the Virgin, and the visit to St. Maria Formosa being the most important ceremony of the whole festival. The old chroniclers, and even Sansovino, got confused, and asserted the victory itself to have taken place on the day appointed for that pilgrimage. 
I doubt not that the reader who is acquainted with the beautiful lines of Rogers is as much grieved as I am at the interference of the casket makers in the achievement which the poet ascribes to the bridegrooms alone, an interference quite as inopportune as that of old La Balafre with the victory of his nephew in the unsatisfactory conclusion of Quentin Doward. I am afraid that I cannot get the casket makers quite out of the way, but it may gratify some of my readers to know that a chronicle of the year 1378, quoted by Galicioli, denies the agency of the people of Santa Maria Formosa altogether, in these terms, quote, Some say that the people of Santa Maria Formosa were those who recovered the spoil. Preda, I may notice in passing, that most of the old chroniclers appear to consider the recovery of the caskets rather more a subject of congratulation than that of the brides, and that, for their reward, they asked the doge and signori to visit Santa Maria Formosa. But this is false. The going to Santa Maria Formosa was because the thing had succeeded on that day, and because this was then the only church in Venice in honor of the Virgin. End quote. But here is again the mistake about the day itself. And besides, if we get rid altogether of the trunk makers, how are we to account for the ceremony of the oranges and hats, of which the accounts seem authentic? If, however, the reader likes to substitute carpenters or house builders for casket makers, he may do so with great reason. Vide Galicioli, Lib. 2, 1758 but I fear that one or the other body of tradesmen must be allowed to have had no small share in the honor of the victory. But whatever doubt attaches to the particular circumstances of its origin, there is none respecting the splendor of the festival itself, as it was celebrated for four centuries afterwards. We find that each contrada spent from eight hundred to a thousand zecchines in the dress of the Marys and dressed to it. But I cannot find among how many contrada the twelve Marys were divided. It is also to be supposed that most of the accounts given refer to the latter periods of the celebration of the festival. In the beginnings of the 11th century, the good doge Pietro Osciolo II left in his will the third of his entire fortune for la festa della Marie, and in the 14th century, so many people came from the rest of Italy to see it, that special police regulations were made for it, and the Council of Ten were twice summoned before it took place. The expense lavished upon it seems to have increased till the year 1379, when all the resources of the Republic were required for the terrible war of Chiosa, and all festivity was, for that time, put an end to. The issue of the war left the Venetians with neither the power nor the disposition to restore the festival on its ancient scale, and they seem to have been ashamed to exhibit it in reduced splendor. It was entirely abolished. As if to do away, even with its memory, every feature of the surrounding scene which was associated with that festival has been in succeeding ages destroyed. With one solitary exception, there is not a house left in the whole Piazza de Santa Maria Formosa from whose windows the Fest of the Marys has ever been seen. Of the church in which they worshipped, not a stone is left. Even the form of the ground and direction of the neighboring canals are changed, and there is now but one landmark to guide the steps of the traveler to the place where the white cloud rested and the shrine was built to St. Mary the Beautiful. Yet the spot is still worth his pilgrimage, for he may receive a lesson upon it, though a painful one. Let him first fill his mind with the fair images of the ancient festival, and then seek that landmark, the tower of the modern church, built upon the place where the daughters of Venice knelt dearly with their noble lords. And let him look at the head which is carved on the base of the tower, still dedicated to St. Mary the Beautiful. A head, huge, inhuman, and monstrous, leering in bestial degradation, too foul to be either pictured or described, or to be beheld for more than an instant, yet let it be endured for that instant, for in that head is embodied the type of the evil spirits to which Venice was abandoned in the fourth period of her decline, and it is well that we should see and feel the full horror of it upon this spot, and know what pestilence it was that came and breathed upon her beauty until it melted away like the white cloud from the ancient fields of Santa Maria Formosa. This head is one of many hundreds which disgrace the latest buildings of the city, all more or less agreeing in their expressions of sneering mockery, in most cases enhanced by thrusting out the tongue. Most of them occur upon the bridges, which were among the very last works undertaken by the Republic, several, for example, upon the Bridge of Sighs, and they are evidences of a delight in the contemplation of bestial vice and the expression of low sarcasm, which is, I believe, the most hopeless state into which the human mind can fall. This spirit of idiotic mockery is, as I have said, the most striking characteristic of the last period of the Renaissance, which, in consequence of the character thus imparted to its sculpture, I have called grotesque. And it must be our immediate task, and it will be a most interesting one, to distinguish between this base grotesqueness and that magnificent condition of fantastic imagination which was above noticed as one of the chief elements of the northern Gothic mind. Nor is this a question of interesting speculation merely, 
for the distinction between the true and false grotesque is one which the present tendencies of the English mind have rendered it practically important to ascertain, and that in a degree which, until he has made some progress in the consideration of the subject, the reader will hardly anticipate. But, first, I have to note one peculiarity in the late architecture of Venice which will materially assist us in understanding the true nature of the spirit which is to be the subject of our inquiry. And this peculiarity, singularly enough, is first exemplified in the very façade of Santa Maria Famosa which is flanked by the grotesque head to which our attention has just been directed. This façade, whose architect is unknown, consists of a pediment, sustained on four Corinthian pilasters, and is, I believe, the earliest in Venice which appears entirely destitute of every religious symbol, sculpture, or inscription, unless the cardinal's hat upon the shield in the centre of the impediment be considered a religious symbol. The entire façade is nothing else than a monument to the Admiral Vincenzo Capello, Two tablets, one between each pair of viking pillars, records his acts and honors, and on the corresponding spaces upon the base of the church are two circular trophies, composed of halberds, arrows, flags, tridents, helmets, and lances, sculptures which are just as valueless in a military as in an ecclesiastical point of view, for, being all copied from the forms of Roman arms and armor, they cannot even be referred to for information respecting the costume of the period. Over the door, as the chief ornament of the façade, exactly in the spot which, in the barbarous St. Mark's, is occupied by the figure of Christ, is the statue of Vincenzo Capello in Roman armor. He died in 1542, and we have, therefore, the latter part of the 16th century fixed as the period when, in Venice, churches were first built to the glory of man, instead of the glory of God. Throughout the whole of scripture history, nothing is more remarkable than the close connection of punishment with the sin of vainglory. Every other sin is occasionally permitted to remain for lengthened periods without definite chastisement, but the forgetfulness of God and the claim of honor by man, as belonging to himself, are visited at once, whether in Hezekiah, Nebuchadnezzar, or Herod, with the most tremendous punishment. We have already seen that the first reason for the fall of Venice was a manifestation of such a spirit, and it is most singular to observe the definiteness at which it is here marked, as if so appointed that it might be impossible for future ages to miss the lesson. For, in the long inscriptions which record the acts of Vincenzo Capello, it might, at least, have been anticipated that some expressions would occur indicative of the remaining pretense to religious feeling, or formal acknowledgment of divine power. But there are none whatever. The name of God does not once occur. That of St. Mark is found only in the statement that Capello was a purocator for that church. There is no word touching either on the faith or hope of the deceased, and that the only sentence which alludes to supernatural powers at all alludes to them under the heathen name of fates, in its explanation of what the Admiral Capello would have accomplished, nisi fata Christianus adversa vitrosmen. Having taken sufficient note of all the baseness of mind which these facts indicate in the people, we shall not be surprised to find immediate signs of dotage in the conception of their architecture. The churches raised throughout this period were so grossly debased that even the Italian critics of the present day, who are partially awakened to the true state of art in Italy, though blind as yet to its true cause, exhaust their terms of reproach upon these last efforts of the Renaissance builders. The two churches of San Moisa and Santa Maria Zobengio, which are among the most remarkable in Venice for their manifestation of insolent atheism, are characterized by Lazari, the one as Cumine, Dogni, Folia, Ascetatonica, the other as Orido Amaso di Pietro Relistia, with added expressions of contempt, as just as it is unmitigated. Now both these churches, which I should like the reader to visit in succession, if possible, after that of Santa Maria Formosa, agree with that church, and with each other, in being totally destitute of religious symbols, and entirely dedicated to the honor of two Venetian families. In San Moisa, a bust of Vincenzo Finze is set on a tall, narrow pyramid above the central door, and with this marvelous inscription, Omnie fastigium virtue implet Vincentius Fini. It is very difficult to translate this. For fastigium, besides its general sense, has a particular one in architecture, and refers to the part of the building occupied by the bust. But the main meaning of it is that Vincenzi Fine fills all height with his virtue. The inscription goes on into further praise, but this example is enough. Over the two lateral doors are two other laudatory inscriptions of younger members of the Fine family, the dates of death of the three heroes being 1660, 1685, and 1726, marking thus the period of consummate degradation. In like manner, the church of Santa Maria Zobegno is entirely dedicated to the Barbaro family, the only religious symbols with which it is invested being statues of angels blowing brazen trumpets, intended to express the spreading of the fame of the Barbaro family in heaven. At the top of the church is Venice crowned, between justice and temperance, 
just as holding a pair of grocer's scales of iron swinging in the wind. There is a two-necked stone eagle, the Barbaro crest, with a copper crown, in the center of the pediment. A huge statue of a Barbaro in armor, with a fantastic headdress over the central door, and four Barbaros in niches, two on each side of it, strutting statues in the common stage postures of the day. Joseph Maria Barbaro, Sapiens Ordinum, Marinus Barbaro, Senator, reading a speech in a Ciceronian attitude, Francisco Barbaro, Legatus in Class A, in armor, with high-heeled boots, and looking resolutely fierce, and Carolus Barbaro, Sapiens Ordinum. The decorations of the façade being completed by two trophies, consisting of drums, trumpets, flags, and cannon, and six plans, sculptured in relief, of the towns of Zara, Candia, Padua, Rome, Corfu, and Spalatro. End of Chapter 3, Part 1 Recording by Todd Chapter 3, Part 2 of The Stones of Venice, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Stones of Venice, Volume 3, by John Ruskin. Chapter 3, Grotesque Renaissance, Part 2. When the traveller has sufficiently considered the meaning of this façade, he ought to visit the church of St. Eustachio, remarkable for the dramatic effect of the group of sculpture on its façade, and then the church of Ospitalato, noticing, on his way, the heads on the foundations of the Palazzo Corner della Regina, and the Palazzo Pesaro, and any other heads carved on the modern bridges, closing with those on the bridge of size. He will then have obtained a perfect idea of the style and feeling of the grotesque renaissance. I cannot pollute this volume by any illustration of its worst forms, but the head turned to the front on the right hand of the opposite plate will give the general reader an idea of its most graceful and refined developments. The figure set beside it on the left is a piece of noble grotesque from 14th century Gothic, and it must be our present task to ascertain the nature of the difference which exists between the two by an accurate inquiry into the true essence of the grotesque spirit itself. First, then, it appears to me that the grotesque is, in almost all cases, composed of two elements, one ludicrous, the other fearful, that, as one or the other of these elements prevails, the grotesque falls into two branches, sportive grotesque and terrible grotesque, but that we cannot legitimately consider it under these two aspects because there are hardly any examples which do not in some degree combine both elements. There are few grotesques so utterly playful as to be overcast with no shade of fearfulness, and few so fearful as absolutely to exclude all ideas of jest. But although we cannot separate the grotesque itself into two branches, we may easily examine separately the two conditions of mind which it seems to combine, and consider successively what are the kinds of jest and what the kinds of fearfulness, which may be legitimately expressed in the various walks of art, and how their expressions actually occur in the Gothic and Renaissance schools. First, then, what are the conditions of playfulness which we may fitly express in noble art, or which, for this is the same thing, are consistent with nobleness in humanity? In other words, what is the proper function of play, with respect not to youth merely, but to all mankind? It is a much more serious question than may be at first supposed. For a healthy manner of play is necessary in order to a healthy manner of work, and because the choice of our recreation is, in most cases, left to ourselves, while the nature of our work is generally fixed by necessity or authority, it may be well doubted whether more distressful consequences may not have resulted from mistaken choice in play than from mistaken direction in labor. Observe, however, that we are only concerned here with that kind of play which causes laughter or implies recreation not with that which consists in the excitement of the energies, whether of body or mind. Muscular exertion is, indeed, in youth, one of the conditions of recreation, but neither the violent bodily labor which children of all ages agree to call play, nor the grave excitement of the mental faculties in games of skill or chance, are in any wise connected with the state of feeling we have here to investigate, namely, that sportiveness which man possesses in common with many inferior creatures, but to which his higher faculties give nobler expression in the various manifestations of wit, humor, and fancy. With respect to the manner in which this instinct of playfulness is indulged or repressed, mankind are broadly distinguishable into four classes. 
the men who play wisely, who play necessarily, who play inordinately, and who play not at all. First, those who play wisely. It is evident that the idea of any kind of play can only be associated with the idea of an imperfect, childish, and fatigable nature. As far as men can raise that nature, so that it shall no longer be interested in trifles or exhausted by toils, they raise it above play. He whose heart is at once fixed upon heaven and open to the earth, so as to apprehend the importance of heavenly doctrines and the compass of human sorrow, will have little disposition for jest and exactly in proportion to the breadth and depth of his character and intellect will be, in general, the incompatibility of surprise, or exuberant and sudden emotion, which must render play impossible. It is, however, evidently not intended that many men should even reach, far less pass their lives in, that solemn state of thoughtfulness which brings them into the nearest brotherhood with their divine master. And the highest and healthiest state which is competent to ordinary humanity appears to be that which, accepting the necessity of recreation and yielding to the impulses of natural delight springing out of health and innocence does indeed condescend often to playfulness but never without such a deep love of god of truth and of humanity as shall make even its slightest words reverent its idlest fancies profitable and its keenest satire indulgent wordsworth and plato furnish us with perhaps the finest and highest examples of this playfulness in the one case, unmixed with satire, the perfectly simple effusion of that spirit in which gives to all the self-same bent whose life is wise and innocent. Plato, and by the by, in a very wise book of our own times, not unworthy of being named in such companionship, friends in counsel, mingled with an exquisitely tender and loving satire. Second, the men who play necessarily. That highest species of playfulness, which we have just been considering, is evidently the condition of a mind not only highly cultivated, but so habitually trained to intellectual labor that it can bring a considerable force of accurate thought into its moments even of recreation. This is not possible unless so much repose of mind and heart are enjoyed, even at the periods of greatest exertion, that the rest required by the system is diffused over the whole life. To the majority of mankind, such a state is evidently unattainable. They must, perforce, pass a large part of their lives in employments both irksome and toilsome, demanding an expenditure of energy which exhausts the system, and yet consuming that energy upon subjects incapable of interesting the nobler faculties. When such employments are intermitted, those noble instincts, fancy, imagination, and curiosity, are all hungry for the food which the labor of the day has denied to them, while yet the weariness of the body, in a great degree, forbids their application to any serious subject. They therefore exert themselves without any determined purpose, and under no vigorous restraint, but gather, as best they may, such various nourishment, and put themselves to such fantastic exercise as may soonest indemnify them for their past imprisonment, and prepare them to endure their recurrence. This sketching of the mental limbs as their fetters fall away, this leaping and dancing of the heart and intellect when they are restored to the fresh air of heaven, yet half paralyzed by their captivity, and unable to turn themselves to any earnest purpose, I call it necessary play. It is impossible to exaggerate its importance, whether in policy or in art. Thirdly, the men who play inordinately, the most perfect state of society which, consistently with due understanding of man's nature, it may be permitted us to conceive, would be one in which the whole human race were divided, more or less distinctly, into workers and thinkers that is to say, into the two classes who only play wisely, or play necessarily. But the number and the toil of the working class are enormously increased, probably more than doubled, by the vices of the men who neither play wisely nor necessarily, but are enabled by circumstances, and permitted by their want of principle, to make amusement the object of their existence. There is not any moment of the lives of such men which is not injurious to others, both because they leave the work undone which was appointed for them, and because they necessarily think wrongly, whenever it comes compulsory upon them to think at all. The greater portion of the misery of this world arises from the false opinions of men whose idleness has physically incapacitated them from forming true ones. Every duty which we admit obscures some truth which we should have known, and the guilt of a life spent in the pursuit of pleasure is twofold, partly consisting in the perversion of the action, and partly in the dissemination of falsehood. There is, however, a less criminal, 
though hardly less dangerous, condition of mind, which, though not failing in its more urgent duties, fails in its finer conscientiousness, which regulates the degree, and directs the choice of amusement, at those times when amusement is allowable. The most frequent error in this respect is the want of reverence in approaching subjects of importance or sacredness, and of caution in the expression of thoughts which may encourage like irreverence in others. And these faults are apt to gain upon the mind until it becomes habitually more sensible to what is ludicrous and accidental than to what is grave and essential in any subject that is brought before it, or even at last desires to perceive or to know nothing but what may end in jest. Very generally, minds of this character are active and able, and many of them are so far conscientious that they believe their jesting forwards their work. But it is difficult to calculate the harm they do by destroying the reverence which is our best guide unto all truth. For weakness and evil are easily visible, but greatness and goodness are often latent, and we do infinite mischief by exposing weakness to eyes which cannot comprehend greatness. This error, however, is more connected with abuses of the satirical than of the playful instinct, and I shall have more to say of it presently. Lastly, the men who do not play at all, those who are so dull or so morose as to be incapable of inventing or enjoying jest, and in whom care, guilt, or pride represses all healthy exhilaration of the fancy, or else men utterly oppressed with labor, and driven too hard by the necessities of the world to be capable of any species of happy relaxation. We have now to consider the way in which the presence or absence of joyfulness, in these several classes, is expressed in art. 1. Wise Play The first and noblest class hardly ever speak through art, except seriously. They feel its nobleness too profoundly, and value the time necessary for its production too highly, to employ it in the rendering of trivial thoughts. The playful fancy of a moment may innocently be expressed by the passing word, but he can hardly have learned the preciousness of life who passes days in the elaboration of a jest. And, as to what regards the delineation of human character, the nature of all noble art is to epitomize and embrace so much at once that its subject can never be altogether ludicrous. It must possess all the solemnities of the whole, not the brightness of the partial, truth. For all truth that makes us smile is partial. The novelist amuses us by his relation of a particular incident, but the painter cannot set any one of his characters before us without giving some glimpse of its whole career. That of which the historian informs us in successive pages, it is the task of the painter to inform us of all at once, writing upon the continents not merely the expression of the moment, but the history of the life and the history of a life can never be a jest. Whatever part, therefore, of the sportive energy of these men of the highest class would be expressed in verbal wit or humor, find small utterance through their art, and will assuredly be confined, if it occur there at all, to scattered and trivial incidents. But so far as their minds can recreate themselves by the imagination of strange, yet not laughable forms, which, either in costume, in landscape, or in any other accessories, may be combined with those necessary for their more earnest purposes, we find them delighting in such inventions, and a species of grotesqueness thence arising in all their work, which is indeed one of its most valuable characteristics, but which is so intimately connected with the sublime or terrible form of the grotesque, that it will be better to notice it under that head. 2. Necessary Play I have dwelt much in a former portion of this work on the justice and desirableness of employing the minds of inferior workmen, and of the lower orders in general, in the production of objects of art of one kind or another. So far as men of this class are compelled to hard manual labor for their daily bread, so far forth their artistic efforts must be rough and ignorant, and their artistical perceptions comparatively dull. Now it is not possible, with blunt perceptions and rude hands, to produce works which shall be pleasing by their beauty, but it is perfectly possible to produce such as shall be interesting by their character, or amusing by their satire. For one hard-working man who possesses the finer instincts which decide on perfection of lines and harmonies of color, twenty possess dry humor or quaint fancy, not because these faculties were originally given to the human race, or to any section of it, in greater degree than the sense of beauty, but because these are exercised in our daily intercourse with each other, and developed by the interest which we take in the affairs of life, while the others are not. And because, therefore, a certain degree of success will probably attend the effort to express this humor or fancy, 
while comparative failure will assuredly result from an ignorant struggle to reach the forms of solemn beauty, the working man who turns his attention partially to art will probably, and wisely, choose to do that which he can do best, and indulge the pride of an effective satire rather than subject himself to assured mortification in the pursuit of beauty. And this the more, because we have seen that his application to art is to be playful and recreative, and it is not in recreation that the conditions of perfection can be fulfilled. Now all the forms of art which result from the comparatively recreative exertion of minds more or less blunted or encumbered by other cares and toils, the art which we may call generally art of the wayside, as opposed to that which is the business of men's lives, is, in the best sense of the word, grotesque. And it is noble or inferior, first, according to the tone of the minds which have produced it, and in proportion to their knowledge, wit, love of truth, and kindness. Secondly, according to the degree of strength which they have been able to give forth. But yet, however much we may find in it needing to be forgiven, always delightful so long as it is the mark of good and ordinarily intelligent men, and its delightfulness ought mainly to consist in those very imperfections which mark it for work done in the times of rest. It is not its own merit so much as the enjoyment of him who produced it, which is to be the source of the spectator's pleasure. It is to the strength of his sympathy, not to the accuracy of his criticism, that it makes appeal, and no man can indeed be a lover of what is best in the higher walks of art who has not feeling and charity enough to rejoice with the rude sportiveness of hearts that have escaped out of prison and to be thankful for the flowers which men have laid their burdens down to sow by the wayside. And consider what a vast amount of human work this right understanding of its meaning will make fruitful and admirable to us, which otherwise we could only have passed by with contempt. There is very little architecture in the world which is, in the full sense of the words, good and noble. A few pieces of Italian Gothic and Romanesque, a few scattered fragments of Gothic cathedrals, and perhaps two or three of Greek temples, are all that we possess approaching to an ideal of perfection. All the rest, Egyptian, Norman, Arabian, and most Gothic, and, which is very noticeable for the most part, all the strongest and mightiest, depend for their power on some development of the grotesque spirit, but much more the inferior domestic architecture of the Middle Ages, and what similar conditions remain to this day in countries from which the life of art has not yet been banished by its laws. The fantastic gables, built up in scrollwork and steps of the Flemish street, the pinnacled roofs set with their small humorous double windows, as if with so many ears and eyes, of northern France. The blackened timbers, crossed and carved into every conceivable waywardness of imagination, of Normandy and old England. The rude hewing of the pine timbers of the Swiss cottage. The projecting turrets and bracketed oriels of the German street. These, and a thousand other forms, not in themselves reaching any high degree of excellence, are yet admirable, and mostly precious, as the fruits of a rejoicing energy in uncultivated minds. It is easier to take away the energy than to add the cultivation, and the only effect of the better knowledge which civilized nations now possess has been, as we have seen in a former chapter, to forbid their being happy without enabling them to be great. It is very necessary, however, with respect to this provincial or rustic architecture, that we should carefully distinguish its true grotesqueness from its picturesque elements. In The Seven Lamps, I define the picturesque to be parasitical sublimity, or sublimity belonging to the external or accidental characters of a thing, and not to the thing itself. For instance, when a highland cottage roof is covered with the fragments of shale instead of of slates, it becomes picturesque, because the irregularity and rude fractures of the rocks and their grey and gloomy colour, give to it something of the savageness, and much of the general aspect, of the slope of a mountainside. But as a mere cottage roof, it cannot be sublime, and whatever sublimity it derives from its wildness or sternness which the mountains have given it in its covering, is, so far forth, parasitical. The mountain itself would have been grand, which is much more than picturesque. But the cottage cannot be grand as such and the parasitical grandeur which it may possess by accidental qualities, is the character for which men have long agreed to use the inaccurate word, picturesque. On the other hand, beauty cannot be parasitical. There is nothing so small or so contemptible, but it may be beautiful in its own right. The cottage may be beautiful, and the smallest moss that grows on its roof, and the minutest fibre of the moss which the microscope can raise into visible form, and all of them their own right, not less than the mountains and the sky, 
so that we use no peculiar term to express their beauty, however diminutive, but only when the sublime element enters, without sufficient worthiness in the nature of the thing to which it is attached. Now the picturesque element, which is always given, if by nothing else, merely by ruggedness, adds usually very largely to the pleasurableness of grotesque work, especially to that of its inferior kinds. But it is not for this reason to be confounded with the grotesqueness itself. The knots and rents of the timbers, the irregular laying of the shingles on the roofs, the vigorous light and shadow, the fractures and weather stains of the old stones which were so deeply loved and so admirably rendered by our lost prout, are the picturesque elements of the architecture. The grotesque ones are those which are not produced by the working of nature and of time, but exclusively by the fancy of man, and as also for the most part by his indolent and uncultivated fancy, they are always, in some degree, wanting in grandeur, unless the picturesque element be united with them. 3. Inordinate Play The reader will have some difficulty, I fear, in keeping clearly in his mind the various divisions of our subject, but when he has once read the chapter through, he will see their places and coherence. We have next to consider the expression throughout of the minds of men who indulge themselves in unnecessary play. It is evident that a large number of these men will be more refined and more highly educated than those who only play necessarily. The power of pleasure-seeking implies, in general, fortunate circumstances of life. It is evident also that their play will not be so hearty, so simple, or so joyful, and this deficiency of brightness will affect it in proportion to its unnecessary and unlawful continuance, until at last it becomes a restless and dissatisfied indulgence in excitement, or a painful delving after exhausted springs of pleasure. The art through which this temper is expressed will, in all probability, be refined and sensual, therefore also assuredly feeble, and because, in the failure of the joyful energy of the mind, there will fail, also, its perceptions and its sympathies. It will be entirely deficient in expression of character and acuteness of thought, but will be peculiarly restless, manifesting its desire for excitement in idle changes of subject and purpose. Incapable of true imagination, it will seek to supply its place by exaggerations, incoherencies, and monstrosities, and the form of the grotesque to which it gives rise will be an incongruous chain of hackneyed graces, idly thrown together, prettiness or sublimities not of its own invention, associated in forms which will be absurd without being fantastic, and monstrous without being terrible, and because in the continual pursuit of pleasure men lose both cheerfulness and charity, there will be small hilarity, but much malice in this grotesque. Yet a weak malice, incapable of expressing its own bitterness, not having grasp enough of truth to become forcible, and exhausting itself in impotent or disgusting caricature. Of course, there are infinite ranks and kinds of this grotesque, according to the natural power of the minds which originate it, and to the degree in which they have lost themselves. Its highest condition is that which first developed itself among the enervated Romans, and which was brought to the highest perfection of which it was capable by Raphael in the arabesques of the Vatican. It may be generally described as an elaborate and luscious form of nonsense. Its lower conditions are found in the common upholstery and decorations which, over the whole of civilized Europe, have sprung from this poisonous root, an artistic potage composed of nymphs, cupids, and satyrs, with shreddings of heads and paws of meek wild beasts and nondescript vegetables. And the lowest of all are those which have not even graceful models to recommend them, but arise out of the corruption of the higher schools, mingling with clownish or bestial satire, as is the case in the latter renaissance of Venice, which we are above examining. It is almost impossible to believe the depth to which the human mind can be debased in following this species of grotesque. In a recent Italian garden, the favorite ornaments frequently consist of stucco images, representing in dwarfish character the most disgusting types of manhood and womanhood which can be found amidst the dissipation of the modern drawing-room, yet without either veracity or humor, and dependent, for whatever interest they possess, upon simple grossness of expression and absurdity of costume. Grossness, of one kind or another, is, indeed, an unfailing characteristic of the style, either latent, as in the refined sensuality of the more graceful arabesques, or, in the worst examples, manifested in every species of obscene conception and abominable detail. In the head, described in the opening of this chapter, in Santa Maria Formosa, the teeth are represented as decayed, 
4. The minds of the fourth class of men, who do not play at all, are little likely to find expression in any trivial form of art, except in bitterness of mockery, and this character at once stamps the work in which it appears as belonging to the class of the terrible, rather than a playful grotesque. We have, therefore, now to examine the state of mind which gives rise to this second and more interesting branch of imaginative work. Two great and principal passions are evidently appointed by the deity to rule the life of man, namely, the love of God, and the fear of sin, and of his companion death. How many motives we have for love! How much there is in the universe to kindle our admiration and to claim our gratitude! There are, happily, multitudes among us who both feel and teach. But it has not, I think, been sufficiently considered how evident, throughout the system of creation, is the purpose of God that we should often be affected by fear. Not the sudden, selfish, and contemptible fear of immediate danger, but the fear which arises out of the contemplation of great powers in destructive operation, and generally from the perception of the presence of death. Nothing appears to me more remarkable than the array of scenic magnificence by which the imagination is appalled, in myriads of instances, when the actual danger is comparatively small, so that the utmost possible impression of awe shall be produced upon the minds of all, though direct suffering is inflicted upon few. Consider, for instance, the moral effect of a single thunderstorm. Perhaps two or three persons may be struck dead within the space of a hundred square miles, and their deaths, unaccompanied by the scenery of the storm, would produce little more than a momentary sadness in the busy hearts of living men. But the preparation for the judgment by all that mighty gathering of clouds, by the questioning of the forest leaves, in their terrible stillness, which way the wind shall go forth, by the murmuring to each other, deep in the distance, of the destroying angels before they draw forth their swords of fire, by the march of the funeral darkness in the midst of the noonday, and the rattling of the dome of heaven beneath the chariot wheels of death. On how many minds do not these produce an impression almost as great as the actual witnessing of the fatal issue? And how strangely are the expressions of the threatening elements fitted to the apprehension of the human soul? The lurid color, the long irregular convulsive sound, the ghastly shapes of flaming and heaving cloud, are all as true and faithful in their appeal to our instinct of danger as the moaning or wailing of the human voice itself is to our instinct of pity. It is not a reasonable calculating terror which they awake in us. It is no matter that we count distance by seconds and measure probability by averages. That shadow of the thundercloud will still do its work upon our hearts, and we shall watch its passing away as if we stood upon the threshing floor of Arana. And this is equally the case with respect to all the other destructive phenomena of the universe. From the mightiest of them to the gentlest, from the earthquake to the summer shower, it will be found that they are attended by certain aspects of threatening, which strike terror into the hearts of multitudes more numerous a thousandfold than those who actually suffer from the ministries of judgment. And that, besides the fearfulness of these immediately dangerous phenomena, there is an occult and subtle horror belonging to many aspects of the creation around us calculated often to fill us with serious thought, even in our times of quietness and peace. I understand not the most dangerous, because most attractive, form of modern infidelity, which, pretending to exalt the beneficence of the deity, degrades it into a reckless infinitude of mercy, and blind obliteration of the work of sin, and which does this chiefly by dwelling on the manifold appearances of God's kindness on the face of creation. Such kindness is indeed everywhere, and always visible, but not alone. Wrath and threatening are invariably mingled with the love, and in the utmost solitudes of nature the existence of hell seems to me as legibly declared by a thousand spiritual utterances as that of heaven. It is well for us to dwell with thankfulness on the unfolding of the flower, and the falling of the dew, and the sleep of the green fields in the sunshine. But the blasted trunk, the barren rock, the moaning of the bleak winds, the roar of the black, perilous, merciless whirlpools of the mountain streams, the solemn solitudes of moors and seas, the continual fading of all beauty into darkness, and of all strength into dust. Have these no language for us? We may seek to escape their teaching by reasonings touching the good which is brought out of all evil, but it is vain sophistry. The good succeeds to the evil as day succeeds the night, but so also the evil to the good. Jerizim and Ebal, birth and death, light and darkness, heaven and hell divide the existence of man and his futurity. And because the thoughts of the choice we have to make between these two ought to rule us continually, 
not so much in our own actions, for these should, for the most part, be governed by settled habit and principle, as in our manner of regarding the lives of other men, and our own responsibilities with respect to them. Therefore, it seems to me that the healthiest state into which the human mind can be brought is that which is capable of the greatest love and the greatest awe. And this we are taught even in our times of rest. For when our minds are rightly in tone, the merely pleasurable excitement which they seek with most avidity is that which rises out of the contemplation of beauty or of terribleness. We thirst for both, and according to the height and tone of our feeling, desire to see them in noble or inferior forms. Thus there is a divine beauty, and a terribleness or sublimity co-equal with it in rank, which are the subjects of the highest art. And there is an inferior or ornamental beauty, and an inferior terribleness co-equal with it in rank, which are the subjects of grotesque art. And the state of mind in which the terrible form of the grotesque is developed is that which in some irregular manner dwells upon certain conditions of terribleness, into the complete depth of which it does not enter for the time. End of chapter 3 Part 2. Recording by Todd. Chapter 3. Part 3. Of the Stones of Venice. Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. THE STONES OF VENICE, VOLUME THREE, BY JOHN RUSKIN CHAPTER THREE, GROTESQUE RENAISSANCE, PART THREE Now the things which are the proper subjects of human fear are twofold, those which have the power of death, and those which have the nature of sin, of which there are many ranks, greater or less in power and vice, from the evil angels themselves down to the serpent which is their type, and which, though of a low and contemptible class, appears to unite the deathful and sinful natures in the most clearly visible and intelligible form. For there is nothing else which we know of so small strength and occupying so unimportant a place in the economy of creation, which yet is so mortal and so malignant. It is, then, on these two classes of objects that the mind fixes for its excitement, in that mood which gives rise to the terrible grotesque, and its subject will be found always to unite some expression of vice and danger, but regarded in a peculiar temper, sometimes, a, of predetermined or involuntary apathy, sometimes, b, of mockery, sometimes, c, of diseased and ungoverned imaginativeness. For observe, the difficulty which, as I above stated, exists in distinguishing the playful from the terrible grotesque, arises out of this cause, that the mind, under certain phases of excitement, plays with terror, and summons images which, if it were in another temper, would be awful, but of which, either in weariness or in irony, it refrains for the time to acknowledge the true terribleness. And the mode in which this refusal takes place distinguishes the noble from the ignoble grotesque. For the master of the noble grotesque knows the depth of all at which he seems to mock, and would feel it at another time, or feels it in a certain undercurrent of thought even while he jests with it. But the workman of the ignoble grotesque can feel and understand nothing, and mocks at all things with the laughter of the idiot and the cretin. To work out this distinction completely is the chief difficulty in our present inquiry, and, in order to do so, let us consider the above-named three conditions of the mind in succession with relation to objects of terror. a. Involuntary or predetermined apathy. We saw above that the grotesque was produced, chiefly in subordinate or ornamental art, by rude and in some degree uneducated men, and in their times of rest. At such times, and in such subordinate work, it is impossible that they should represent any solemn or terrible subject with a full and serious entrance into its feeling. It is not in the languor of a leisure hour that a man will set his whole soul to conceive the means of representing some important truth, nor to the projecting angle of a timber bracket that he would trust its representation if conceived. And yet, in this languor, and in this trivial work, he must find some expression of the serious part of his soul, of what there is within him capable of awe, as well as of love. The more noble the man is, the more impossible it will be for him to confine his thoughts to mere loveliness, and that of a low order. Were his powers and his time unlimited, so that, like Fra Angelico, he could paint the seraphim, in that order of beauty he would find contentment, bringing down heaven to earth. But by the conditions of his being, by his hard-worked life, 
by his feeble powers of execution, by the meanness of his employment and the languor of his heart, he is bound down to earth. It is the world's work that he is doing, and world's work is not to be done without fear. And whatever there is of deep and eternal consciousness within him, thrilling his mind with the sense of the presence of sin and death around him, must be expressed in that slight work, and feeble way, come of it what will. He cannot forget it, among all that he sees of beautiful in nature. He may not bury himself among the leaves of the violet on the rocks, and of the lily in the glen, and twine out of them garlands of perpetual gladness. He sees more in the earth than these, misery and wrath, and discordance, and danger, and all the work of the dragon and his angels. This he sees with too deep feeling ever to forget. And though when he returns to his idle work, it may be to gild the letters upon the page, or to carve the timbers of the chamber, or the stones of the pinnacle, he cannot give his strength of thought any more to the woe or to the danger. There is a shadow of them still present in him. And as the bright colors mingle beneath his touch, and the fair leaves and flowers grow at his bidding, strange horrors and phantasms rise by their side. Grizzly beasts and venomous serpents, and spectral fiends and nameless inconsistency of ghastly life, rising out of things most beautiful, and fading back into them again, as the harm and the horror of life do out of its happiness. He has seen these things. He wars with them daily. He cannot but give them their part in his work, though in a state of comparative apathy to them at the time. He is but carving and gilding, and must not turn aside to weep, but he knows that hell is burning on for all that, and the smoke of it withers his oak leaves. Now the feelings which give rise to the false or ignoble grotesque are exactly the reverse of these. In the true grotesque, a man of naturally strong feeling is accidentally or resolutely apathetic. In the false grotesque, a man naturally apathetic is forcing himself into temporary excitement. The horror which is expressed by the one comes upon him whether he will or not, that which is expressed by the other is sought out by him, and elaborated by his art. And therefore, also, because the fear of the one is true, and of true things, however fantastic its expression may be, there will be reality in it, and force. It is not a manufactured terribleness, whose author, when he had finished it, knew not if it would terrify any one else or not. But it is a terribleness taken from the life, a spectre which the workman indeed saw, and which, as it appalled him, will appall us also. But the other workman never felt any divine fear. He never shuddered when he heard the cry from the burning towers of the earth, Vega Medusa, Silo Farum de Smalto. He is stone already, and needs no gentle hand laid upon his eyes to save him. I do not mean what I say in this place to apply to the creations of the imagination. It is not as the creating, but as the seeing man, that we are here contemplating the master of the true grotesque. It is because the dreadfulness of the universe around him weighs upon his heart that his work is wild, and therefore, through the whole of it we shall find the evidence of deep insight into nature. His beasts and birds, however monstrous, will have profound relations with the true. He may be an ignorant man, and little acquainted with the laws of nature. He is certainly a busy man, and has not much time to watch nature. But he never saw a servant cross his path, nor a bird flit across the sky, nor a lizard bask upon a rock, without learning so much of the sublimity and inner nature of each, as will not suffer him thenceforth to conceive them coldly. He may not be able to carve plumes or scales well, but his creatures will bite and fly for all that. The ignoble workman is the very reverse of this. He never felt, never looked at nature, and if he endeavor to imitate the work of the other, all his touches will be made at random, and all his extravagances will be ineffective. He may knit brows and twist lips and lengthen beaks and sharpen teeth, but it will be all in vain. He may make his creatures disgusting, but never fearful. There is, however, often another cause of difference than this. The true grotesque being the expression of the repose or play of a serious mind, there is a false grotesque opposed to it, which is the result of the full exertion of a frivolous one. There is much grotesque which is wrought out with exquisite care and pains, and as much labor given to it as if it were the noblest subject so that the workman is evidently no longer apathetic, and has no excuse for unconnectedness of thought, or sudden unreasonable fear. If he awakens horror now, it ought to be in some truly sublime form. His strength is in his work, and he must not give way to sudden humor and fits of erratic fancy. If he does so, it must be because his mind is naturally frivolous, or is, for the time, degraded into the deliberate pursuit of frivolity. And herein lies the real distinction between the base grotesque of Raphael and the Renaissance, above alluded to, and the true Gothic grotesque. 
those grotesques or arabesques of the Vatican, and other such work, which have become the patterns of ornamentation in modern times, are the fruit of great minds degraded to base objects. The care, skill, and science applied to the distribution of the leaves and the drawing of the figures are intense, admirable, and accurate. Therefore they ought to have produced a grand and serious work, not a tissue of nonsense. If we can draw the human head perfectly, and are masters of its expression and its beauty, we have no business to cut it off and hang it up by the hair at the end of a garland. If we can draw the human body in the perfection of its grace and movement, we have no business to take away its limbs and terminate it with a bunch of leaves. Or, rather, our doing so will imply that there is something wrong with us, that, if we can consent to use our best powers for such base and vain trifling, there must be something wanting in the powers themselves, and that, however skillful we may be, or however learned, we are wanting both in the earnestness which can apprehend a noble truth, and in the thoughtfulness which can feel a noble fear. No divine terror will ever be found in the work of the man who wastes a colossal strength in elaborating toys, for the first lesson which that terror is sent to teach us is the value of the human soul and the shortness of mortal time. And are we never, then, it will be asked, to possess a refined or perfect ornamentation? Must all decoration be the work of the ignorant and the rude? Not so, but exactly in proportion as the ignorance and rudeness diminish, must the ornamentation become rational, and the grotesqueness disappear. The noblest lessons may be taught in ornamentation, the most solemn truths compressed into it. The book of Genesis, in all the fullness of its incidents, in all the depth of its meaning, is bound within the leaf borders of the gates of Gerberti. But Raphael's arabesque is mere elaborate idleness. It has neither meaning nor heart in it. It is an unnatural and monstrous abortion. Now this passing of the grotesque into higher art, as the mind of the workman becomes informed with better knowledge, and capable of more earnest exertion, takes place in two ways. Either, as his power increases, he devotes himself more and more to the beauty which he now feels himself able to express, and so the grotesqueness expands and softens into the beautiful, as in the above-named instance of the gates of Gerberti, or else, if the mind of the workman be naturally inclined to gloomy contemplation, the imperfection or apathy of his work rises into nobler terribleness, until we reach the point of the grotesque of Albert Dürer, where, every now and then, the playfulness or apathy of the painter rises into perfect sublime. Take the Adam and Eve, for instance. When he gave Adam a bow to hold with a parrot on it, and a tablet hung to it with Albertus Durer Noricus Faciebet, 1504. Thereupon his mind was not in paradise. He was half in play, half apathetic with respect to his subject, thinking how to do his work well as a wise master graver, and how to receive his just reward of fame. But he rose into the true sublime in the head of Adam, and in the profound truthfulness of every creature that fills the forest. So again in that magnificent coat of arms, with the lady and the satyr, as he cast the fluttering drapery hither and thither round the helmet, and wove the delicate crown upon the woman's forehead, he was in a kind of play. But there is none in the dreadful skull upon the shield. And in the night and death, and in the dragons of the illustrations to the apocalypse, there is neither play nor apathy. But their grotesque is of the ghastly kind which best illustrates the nature of death and sin. And all leads us to the consideration of the second state of mind out of which the noble grotesque is developed, that is to say, the temper of mockery. B. Mockery or Satire In the former part of this chapter, when I spoke of the kinds of art which were produced in the recreation of the lower orders, I only spoke of forms of ornament, not of the expression of satire or humor. But it seems probable that nothing is so refreshing to the vulgar mind as some exercise of this faculty, more especially on the failings of their superiors, and that wherever the lower orders are allowed to express themselves freely, we may find humor more or less caustic, becoming a principal feature in their work. The classical and renaissance manufacturers of modern times having silenced the independent language of the operative, his humor and satire pass away in the word wit which has of late become the especial study of the group of authors headed by Charles Dickens. All this power was formerly thrown into noble art, and became permanently expressed in the sculptures of the cathedral. It was never thought that there was anything discordant or improper in such a position, for the builders evidently felt very deeply a truth of which, in modern times, we are less cognizant, that folly and sin are, to a certain extent, synonymous, and that it would be well for mankind in general, if all could be made to feel that wickedness is as contemptible as it is hateful. 
so that the vices were permitted to be represented under the most ridiculous forms, and all the coarsest wit of the workmen to be exhausted in completing the degradation of the creatures supposed to be subjected to them. Nor were even the supernatural powers of evil exempt from this species of satire, for with whatever hatred or horror the evil angels were regarded, it was one of the conditions of Christianity that they should also be looked upon as vanquished, and this not merely in their great combat with the king of saints, but in daily and hourly combats with the weakest of his servants. In proportion to the narrowness of the powers of abstract conception of the workmen, the nobleness of the idea of spiritual nature diminished, and the traditions of the encounters of men with fiends in daily temptations were imagined with less terrible circumstances, until the agencies in which such warfare were almost always represented as vanquished with disgrace became, at last, as much the subjects of contempt as of terror. The superstitions which represented the devil as assuming various contemptible forms and disguises in order to accomplish his purposes aided this gradual degradation of conception, and directed the study of the workmen to the most strange and ugly conditions of animal form, until at last, even in the most serious subject, the fiends are oftener ludicrous than terrible. Nor, indeed, is this altogether avoidable, for it is not possible to express intense wickedness without some condition of degradation. Malice, subtlety, and pride, in their extreme, cannot be written upon noble forms, and I am aware of no effort to represent the satanic mind with the angelic form which has succeeded in painting. Milton succeeds only because he separately describes the movements of the mind, and therefore leaves himself at liberty to make the form heroic, but that form is never distinct enough to be painted. Dante, who will not leave even external forms obscure, degrades them before he can feel them to be demonical. So also John Bunyan, both of them, I think, having firmer faith than Milton's in their own creations, and deeper insight in the nature of sin. Milton makes his fiends too noble, and misses the foulness, inconsistency, and fury of wickedness. His Satan possesses some virtues, not the less virtues for being applied to evil purpose. Courage, resolution, patience, deliberation, and counsel this latter being eminently a wise and holy character, as opposed to the insania of excessive sin, and all of this, if not a shallow and false, is a smooth and artistical conception. On the other hand, I have always felt that there was a peculiar grandeur in the indescribable, ungovernable fury of Dante's fiends, ever shortening its own powers, and disappointing its own purposes. The deaf, blind, speechless, unspeakable rage, fierce as the lightning, but erring from its mark or turning senselessly against itself, and still further debased by foulness of form and action. Something is indeed to be allowed for the rude feelings of the time, but I believe all such men as Dante are sent into the world at the time when they can do their work best, and that it being appointed for him to give to mankind the most vigorous realization possible, both of hell and heaven, he was born both in the country and at the time which furnished the most stern opposition of horror and beauty, and permitted it to be written in the clearest terms. And therefore, Though there are passages in the Inferno which it would be impossible for any poet now to write, I look upon it as all the more perfect for them. For there can be no question but that one characteristic of excessive vice is indecency, a general baseness in its thoughts and acts concerning the body, and that the full portraiture of it cannot be given without marking, and that in the strongest lines, this tendency to corporeal degradation, which, in the time of Dante, could be done frankly, but cannot now. And therefore, I think the twenty-first and twenty-second books of the Inferno the most perfect portraitures of fiendish nature which we possess, and at the same time, in their mingling of the extreme of horror, for it seems to me that the silent swiftness of the first demon, con lali aperte y sovra y pie legerio, cannot be surpassed in dreadfulness, with ludicrous actions and images. They present the most perfect instances of which I am acquainted of the terrible grotesque. But the whole of the Inferno is full of this grotesque, as well as the Fairy Queen, and these two poems, together with the works of Albert Durer, will enable the reader to study it in its noblest forms without reference to Gothic cathedrals. Now just as there are base and noble conditions of the apathetic grotesque, so also are there of this satirical grotesque. The condition which might be mistaken for it is that above described as resulting from the malice of men given to pleasure, and in which the grossness and foulness are in the workman as much as in his subject so that he chooses to represent vice and disease rather than virtue and beauty, having his chief delight in contemplating them, though he still mocks at them with such dull wit as may be in him, because, as Young has said most truly, tis not in folly not to scorn a fool. Now it is easy to distinguish this grotesque from its noble counterpart by merely observing whether any forms of beauty or dignity are mingled with it, 
or not for of course the noble grotesque is only employed by its master for good purposes and to contrast with beauty but the base workman cannot conceive anything but what is base and there will be no loveliness in any part of his work or at the best a loveliness measured by line and rule and dependent on legal shapes of feature but without resorting to this test and merely by examining the ugly grotesque itself it will be found that if it belongs to the base school there will be first no horror in it secondly no nature in it and thirdly no mercy in it i say first no horror for the base soul has no fear of sin and no hatred of it and however it may strive to make its work terrible there will be no genuineness in the fear the utmost it can do will be to make its work disgusting second there will be no nature in it it appears to be one of the ends proposed by providence in the appointment of the forms of the brute creation that the various vices to which mankind are liable should be severally expressed in them so distinctly and clearly as that men could not but understand the lesson while yet these conditions of vice might in the inferior animal be observed without the disgust and hatred which the same vices would excite if seen in men and might be associated with features of interest which would otherwise attract and reward contemplation thus ferocity cunning sloth discontent gluttony uncleanness and cruelty are seen each in its extreme in various animals and are so vigorously expressed that when men desire to indicate the same vices in connection with human forms they can do it no better than by borrowing here and there the features of animals and when the workman is thus led to the contemplation of the animal kingdom finding therein the expressions of vice which he needs associated with power and nobleness and freedom from disease if his mind be of right tone he becomes interested in this new study and all noble grotesque is therefore full of the most admirable rendering of animal character but the ignoble workman is capable of no interest of this kind and being too dull to appreciate and too idle to execute the subtle and wonderful lines on which the expression of the lower animals depends he contents himself with vulgar exaggeration and leaves his work as false as it is monstrous a mass of blunt malice and obscene ignorance lastly there will be no mercy in it wherever the satire of the noble grotesque fixes upon human nature it does so with much sorrow mingled amidst its indignation in its highest forms there is an infinite tenderness like that of the fool in lear and even in its most heedless and bitter sarcasm it never loses sight altogether of the better nature of what it attacks nor refuses to acknowledge its redeeming or pardonable features but the ignoble grotesque has no pity it rejoices in iniquity and exists only to slander i have not space to follow out the various forms of transition which exist between the two extremes of great and base in the satirical grotesque the reader must always remember that although there is an infinite distance between the best and worst in this kind the interval is filled by endless conditions more or less inclining to the evil or the good impurity and malice stealing gradually into the nobler forms and invention and wit elevating the lower according to the countless minglings of the elements of the human soul c ungovernableness of the imagination the reader is always to keep in mind that if the objects of horror in which the terrible grotesque finds its materials were contemplated in their true light and with the entire energy of the soul they would cease to be grotesque and become altogether sublime and that therefore it is some shortening of the power or the will of contemplation and some consequent distortion of the terrible image in which the grotesqueness consists now this distortion takes place it was above asserted in three ways either through apathy satire or ungovernableness of imagination it is this last cause of the grotesque which we have finally to consider namely the error and wildness of the mental impressions caused by fear operating upon strong powers of imagination or by the failure of the human faculties in the endeavor to grasp the highest truths the grotesque which comes to all men in a disturbed dream is the most intelligible example of this kind but also the most ignoble the imagination in this instance being entirely deprived of all aid from reason and incapable of self-government i believe however that the noblest forms of imaginative power are also in some sort ungovernable and have in them something of the character of dreams so that the vision of whatever kind comes uncalled and will not submit itself to the seer but conquers him and forces him to speak as a prophet having no power over his words or thought only if the whole man be trained perfectly and his mind calm consistent and powerful the vision which comes to him is seen as in a perfect mirror serenely and in consistent with the rational powers but if the mind be imperfect and ill-trained 
the vision is seen as in a broken mirror with strange distortions and discrepancies all the passions of the heart breathing upon it in cross ripples till hardly a trace of it remains unbroken so that strictly speaking the imagination is never governed it is always the ruling and divine power and the rest of the man is to it only an instrument which it sounds or a tablet on which it writes clearly and sublimely if the wax be smooth and the strings true grotesquely and wildly if they are stained and broken and thus the iliad the inferno the pilgrim's progress the fairy queen are all of them true dreams only the sleep of the men to whom they came was the deep living sleep which god sends with a sacredness in it as of death the revealer of secrets now observe in this manner carefully the difference between a dim mirror and a distorted one and do not blame me for pressing this analogy too far for it will enable me to explain my meaning every way more clearly most men's minds are dim mirrors in which all truth is seen as st paul tells us darkly this is the fault most common and most fatal dullness of the heart and mistiness of sight increasing to utter hardness and blindness satan breathing upon the glass so that if we do not sweep the mist laboriously away it will take no image but even so far as we are able to do this we have still the distortions to fear yet not to the same extent for we can in some sort allow for the distortion of an image if only we can see it clearly and the fallen human soul at its best must be as a diminishing glass and that a broken one to the mighty truths of the universe round it and the wider the scope of its glance and the vaster the truths into which it obtains an insight the more fantastic their distortion is likely to be as the winds and vapors trouble the field of the telescope most when it reaches furthest end of chapter three part three recording by todd chapter three part four of the stones of venice volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The Stones of Venice, Volume 3, by John Ruskin. Grotesque Renaissance, Part 4. Now, so far as the truth is seen by the imagination, in its wholesomeness and quietness, the vision is sublime. But so far as it is narrowed and broken by the inconsistencies of the human capacity, it becomes grotesque and it would seem to be rare that any very exalted truth should be impressed on the imagination without some grotesqueness in its aspect, proportioned to the degree of diminution of breadth in the grasp which is given of it. Nearly all the dreams recorded in the Bible, Jacob's, Joseph's, Pharaoh's, Nebuchadnezzar's, are grotesques, and nearly the whole of the accessory seen in the books of Ezekiel and the Apocalypse. Thus Jacob's dream revealed to him the ministry of angels, but because its ministry could not be seen or understood by him in its fullness, it was narrowed to him into a ladder between heaven and earth, which was a grotesque. Joseph's two dreams were evidently intended to be signs of the steadfastness of the divine purpose towards him, by possessing the clearness of the special prophecy, yet were crouched in such imagery as not to inform him prematurely of his destiny, and only to be understood after their fulfillment. The sun and moon and stars were at the period, and are indeed throughout the Bible, the symbols of high authority. It was not revealed to Joseph that he should be lord over all Egypt, but the representation of his family by symbols of the most magnificent dominion, and yet as subject to him, must have been afterwards felt by him as a distinctly prophetic indication of his own supreme power. It was not revealed to him that the occasion of his brethren's special humiliation before him should be their coming to buy corn, but when the event took place, must he not have felt that there was prophetic purpose in the form of the sheaves of wheat which first imaged forth their subjection to him? And these two images of the sun doing obeisance, and the sheaves bowing down, narrowed and imperfect intimations of great truth which yet could not be otherwise conveyed, are both grotesque. The kind of Pharaoh eating each other, the gold and clay of Nebuchadnezzar's image, the four beasts full of eyes, and other imagery of Ezekiel and the Apocalypse are grotesques of the same kind, on which I need not further insist. Such forms, however, ought perhaps to have been arranged under a separate head, as symbolic grotesque. But the element of awe enters into them so strongly as to justify, for all our present purposes, their being classed with the other varieties of terrible grotesque. For even if the symbolic vision itself be not terrible, 
the sense of what may be veiled behind it becomes all the more awful in proportion to the insignificance or strangeness of the sign itself. And, I believe, this thrill of mingled doubt, fear, and curiosity lies at the very root of the delight which mankind take in symbolism. It was not an accidental necessity for the conveyance of truth by pictures instead of words, which led to its universal adoption wherever art was on the advance, but the divine fear which necessarily follows on the understanding that a thing is other and greater than it seems, and which, it appears probable, has been rendered peculiarly attractive to the human heart, because God would have us understand that this is true not of invented symbols merely, but of all things amidst which we live that there is a deeper meaning within them than eye hath seen, or ear hath heard, and that the whole visible creation is a mere perishable symbol of things eternal and true. It cannot but have been sometimes a subject of wonder with thoughtful men how fondly, age after age, the Church has cherished the belief that the four living creatures which surrounded the apocalyptic throne were symbols of the four evangelists, and rejoiced to use those forms in its picture-teaching that a calf, a lion, an eagle, and a beast with a man's face should, in all ages, have been preferred by the Christian world, as expressive of evangelical power and inspiration, to the majesty of human forms, and that quaint grotesques, awkward and often ludicrous caricatures even of the animals represented, should have been regarded by all men, not only with content, but with awe, and have superseded all endeavors to represent the characters and persons of the evangelical writers themselves, except in a few instances, confined principally to works undertaken without a definite religious purpose. This, I say, might appear more than strange to us, were it not that we ourselves share the awe, and are still satisfied with the symbol, and that justly. For whether we are conscious of it or not, there is in our hearts, as we gaze upon the brutal forms that have so holy a signification, an acknowledgment that it was not Matthew, nor Mark, nor Luke, nor John, in whom the gospel of Christ was unsealed, but that the invisible things of him from the beginning of creation are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, that the whole world and all that is therein, be it low or high, great or small, is a continual gospel, and that as the heathen, in their alienation from God, changed his glory into an image made like unto corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts, the Christian, in his approach to God, is to undo this work, and to change the corruptible things into the image of his glory, believing that there is nothing so base in creation, but that our faith may give it wings which shall rise us into companionship with heaven, and that, on the other hand, there is nothing so great or so godly in creation, but that it is a mean symbol of the gospel of Christ, and of the things he has prepared for them that love him. And it is easy to understand, if we follow out this thought, how, when once the symbolic language was familiarized to the mind, and its solemnity felt in all its fullness, there was no likelihood of offence being taken at any repulsive or feeble characters in execution or conception. There was no form so mean, no incident so commonplace, but, if regarded in this light, it might become sublime. The more vigorous the fancy and the more faithful the enthusiasm, the greater would be the likelihood of their delighting in the contemplation of symbols whose mystery was enhanced by apparent insignificance, or in which the sanctity and majesty of meaning were contrasted with the utmost uncouthness of external form. Not the uncouthness merely, but even with every appearance of malignity or baseness, the beholder not being revolted even by this, but comprehending that, as the seeming evil in the framework of creation did not invalidate its divine authorship, so neither did the evil or imperfection in the symbol invalidate its divine message. And thus, sometimes, the designer at last became wanton in his appeal to the piety of his interpreter, and recklessly poured out the impurity and the savageness of his own heart, for the mere pleasure of seeing them overlaid with the fine gold of the sanctuary by the religion of their beholder. It is not, however, in every symbolic subject that the fearful grotesque becomes embodied to the full. The element of distortion which affects the intellect when dealing with subjects above its proper capacity is as nothing compared with that which it sustains from the direct impressions of terror. It is the trembling of a human soul in the presence of death which most of all disturbs the images on the intellectual mirror and invest them with the fitfulness and ghastliness of dreams. And from the contemplation of death, and of the pangs which follow his footsteps, arise in men's hearts the troop of the strange and irresistible superstitions which, more or less melancholy or majestic according to the dignity of the mind they impress, are yet never without a certain grotesqueness, following on the paralysis of the reason and over-excitement of the fancy. I do not mean to deny the actual existence of spiritual manifestations. I have never weighed the evidence upon the subject. 
But with these, if such exist, we are not here concerned. The grotesque which we are examining arises out of that condition of mind which appears to follow naturally upon the contemplation of death, and in which the fancy is brought into morbid action by terror, accompanied by the belief in spiritual presence, and in the possibility of spiritual apparition. Hence are developed its most sublime, because its least voluntary, creations, aided by the fearfulness of the phenomena of nature which are in any wise the ministers of death, and primarily directed by the peculiar ghastliness of expression in the skeleton, itself a species of terrible grotesque in its relation to the perfect human frame. Thus, first born from the dusty and dreadful whiteness of the charnel house, but softened in their forms by the holiness of human affections, went forth a troop of wild and wonderful images, seen through tears that had the mastery over our northern hearts for so many ages. The powers of sudden destruction lurking in the woods and waters, in the rocks and clouds, Kelpie and Gnome, Lorelei and Heart Spirits, the Wraith and Foreboding Phantom, the Spectre of Second Sight, the various conceptions of avenging or tormented ghost, haunting the perpetrator of crime, or expatiating its commission, and the half-fictitious and contemplative, half-visionary and believed images of the presence of death itself, doing its daily work in the chambers of sickness and sin, and waiting for its hour in the fortresses of strength and the high places of pleasure. These partly degrading us by the instinctive and paralyzing terror with which they are attended, and partly ennobling us by leading our thoughts to dwell in the eternal world, fill the last and most important circle in that great kingdom of dark and distorted power, of which we all must be in some sort the subject, until mortality shall be swallowed up of life, until the waters of the last fordless river cease to roll their intransparent volume between us and the light of heaven, and neither death stand between us and our brethren, nor symbols between us and our God. We have now, I believe, obtained a view approaching to completeness of the various branches of human feeling which are concerned in the development of this peculiar form of art. It remains for us only to note, as briefly as possible, what facts in the actual history of the grotesque bear upon our immediate subject. From what we have seen to be its nature, we must, I think, be led to one most important conclusion, that wherever the human mind is healthy and vigorous in all its proportions, great in imagination and emotion no less than in intellect, and not overborne by an undue or hardened preeminence of the mere reasoning faculties, there the grotesque will exist in full energy. And accordingly, I believe that there is no test of greatness in periods, nations, or men, more sure than the development, among them or in them, of a noble grotesque, and no test of comparative smallness or limitation of one kind or another, more sure than the absence of grotesque invention or incapability of understanding it. I think that the central man of all the world, as representing in perfect balance the imagination, moral, and intellectual faculties, all in it their highest, is Dante, and in him the grotesque reaches at once the most distinct and the most noble development to which it has ever brought in the human mind. The two other greatest men whom Italy has produced, Michelangelo and Tintoret, show the same element in no less original strength, but oppressed in the one by his science, and in both by the spirit of the age in which they lived. Neither, however, absent even in Michelangelo, but stealing forth continually in a strange and spectral way, lurking in folds of raiment and knots of wild hair, and mountainous confusions of craggy limb and cloudy drapery, and in Tenerate, ruling the entire conceptions of his greatest works to such degree that they are an enigma, or an offense even to this day, to all the petty disciplines of a formal criticism. Of the grotesque in our own Shakespeare I need hardly speak, nor of its intolerableness to its French critics nor that of Eschus and Homer, as opposed to the lower Greek writers, and so I believe it will be found, in all periods, in all minds of the first order. As an index of the greatness of nations, it is a less certain test, or, rather, we are not so well agreed on the meaning of the term greatness respecting them. A nation may produce a great effect, and take up a high place in the world's history by the temporary enthusiasm or fury of its multitudes, without being truly great, or, on the other hand, the discipline of morality and common sense may extend its physical power or exalt its well-being, while yet its creative and imaginative powers are continually diminishing. And yet again, a people may take so definite a lead over all the rest of the world in one direction, as to obtain a respect which is not justly due to them if judged on universal grounds. Thus, the Greeks perfected the sculpture of the human body, threw their literature into a disciplined form, which has given it a peculiar power over certain conditions of modern mind and were the most carefully educated race that the world has seen. But a few years hence, I believe, we shall no longer think them a great people, 
than either the Egyptians or Assyrians. If, then, ridding ourselves as far as possible of prejudices owing merely to the school teaching, which remains from the system of the Renaissance, we set ourselves to discover in what races the human soul, taken all in all, reached its highest magnificence, we shall find, I believe, two great families of men, one of the East and South, the other of the West and North the one including the Egyptians, Jews, Arabians, Assyrians, and Persians, the other, I know not once derived, but seeming to flow forth from Scandinavia, and filling the whole of Europe with its Norman and Gothic energy. And in both these families, wherever they are seen in their utmost nobleness, there the grotesque is developed in its utmost energy, and I hardly know whether most to admire the winged bulls of Nineveh, or the winged dragons of Verona. The reader who has not before turned his attention to this subject may, however, at first have some difficulty in distinguishing between the noble grotesque of these great nations and the barbarous grotesque of mere savages, as seen in the work of the Hindu and other Indian nations, or, more grossly still, in that of the complete savage of the Pacific Islands, or, if, as is to be hoped, he instinctively feels the difference, he may yet find difficulty in determining wherein the difference consists. But he will discover, on consideration, that the noble grotesque involves the true appreciation of beauty, though the mind may swiftly turn to other images, or the hand resolutely stop short of the perfection which must fail, if it endeavored, to reach, while the grotesque of the sandwich islander involves no perception or imagination of anything above itself. He will find that in the exact proportion in which the grotesque results from an incapability of perceiving beauty, it becomes savage or barbarous, and that there are many stages of progress to be found in it even in its best times, much truly savage grotesque occurring in the fine Gothic periods, mingling with the other forms of the ignoble grotesque, resulting from vicious inclinations or base sportiveness. Nothing is more mysterious in the history of the human mind than the manner in which gross and ludicrous images are mingled with the most solemn subjects in the work of the Middle Ages, whether of sculpture or illumination, and although, in great part, such incongruities are to be accounted for on the various principles which I have above endeavored to define, in many instances, they are clearly the result of vice and sensuality. The general greatness of seriousness of an age does not affect the restoration of human nature, and it would be strange if, in the midst of the art even of the best periods, when that art was entrusted to myriads of workmen, we found no manifestations of impiety, folly, or impurity. It needs only to be added that in the noble grotesque, as it is partly the result of a morbid state of the imaginative power, that power itself will be always seen in a high degree, and that therefore our power of judging of the rank of a grotesque work will depend on the degree in which we are in general sensible of the presence of invention. The reader may partly test this power in himself by referring to the plate given at the opening of this chapter, in which, on the left, is a piece of noble and inventive grotesque, a head of the lion symbol of St. Mark, from the Veronese Gothic. The other is a head introduced as a boss on the foundation of the Pazzo Corno del Regina at Venice, utterly devoid of invention, made merely monstrous by exaggerations of the eyeballs and cheeks, and generally characteristic of that late Renaissance grotesque of Venice, with which we are at present more immediately concerned. The development of that grotesque took place under different laws from those which regulated in any other European city. For great as we have seen the Byzantine mind show itself to be in other directions, it was marked as that of a declining nation by the absence of the grotesque element, and owing to its influence, the early Venetian Gothic remained inferior to all other schools in this particular character. Nothing can well be more wonderful than its instant failure in any attempt at the representation of ludicrous or fearful images, more especially when it is compared with the magnificent grotesque of the neighboring city of Verona, in which the Lombard influence had full sway. Nor was it until the last links of connection with Constantinople had been dissolved that the strength of the Venetian mind could manifest itself in this direction. But it had then a new enemy to encounter. The Renaissance laws altogether checked its imagination and architecture, and it could only obtain permission to express itself by starting forth in the work of the Venetian painters, filling them with monkeys and dwarves, even amidst the most serious subjects, and leading Veronese and Titoret to the most unexpected and wild fantasies of form and color. We may be deeply thankful for this peculiar reserve of the Gothic grotesque characters to the last days of Venice. All over the rest of Europe it had been the strongest in the days of imperfect art, magnificently powerful throughout the whole of the thirteenth century, tamed gradually in the fourteenth and fifteenth, and expiring in the sixteenth amid anatomy and laws of art. But at Venice it had not been received when it was elsewhere in triumph, 
and it fled to the lagoons for shelter when elsewhere it was oppressed. And it was arrayed by the Venetian painters in robes of state, and advanced by them to such honor as it had never received in its days of wildest dominion, while in return it bestowed upon their pictures that fullness, piquancy, decision of parts, and mosaic-like intermingling of fancies, alternately brilliant and sublime, which was exactly what was most needed for the development of their unapproachable color power. Yet observe, it by no means follows that because the grotesque does not appear in the art of a nation, the sense of it does not exist in the national mind. Except in the form of caricature, it is hardly traceable in the English work of the present day, but the minds of our workmen are full of it, if we would only allow them to give it shape. They express it daily in gesture and jibe, but are not allowed to do so where it would be most useful. In like manner, though the Byzantine influence repressed it in early Venetian architecture, it was always present in the Venetian mind, and showed itself in various forms of national custom and festival. Acted grotesques, full of wit, feeling, and good humor. The ceremony of the hat and the orange, described in the beginning of this chapter, is one instance out of multitudes. Another, more rude, and exceedingly characteristic, was that instituted in the twelfth century memorial of the submission of Voldark, the patriarch of Aquilia, who, having taken up arms against the patriarch of Grado, and being defeated and taken prisoner was the Venetians, was sentenced, not to death, but to send every year on Fat Thursday sixty-two large loaves, twelve fat pigs, and a bull, to the doge, the bull being understood to represent the patriarch, and the twelve pigs as clergy, and the ceremonies of the day consisting in the decapitation of these representatives, and a distribution of their joints among the senators, together with a symbolic record of the attack upon Aquilia, by the erection of a wooden castle in the rooms of the ducal palace, which the doge and the senate attacked and demolished with clubs. As long as the doge and the senate were truly kingly and noble, they were content to let this ceremony be continued. But when they became proud and selfish, and were destroying both themselves and the state by their luxury, they found it inconsistent with their dignity, and it was abolished, as far as the senate was concerned, in 1549. By these, and other similar manifestations, the grotesque spirit is traceable through all the strength of the Venetian people. But again, it is necessary that we should carefully distinguish between it and the spirit of mere levity. I said, in the fifth chapter, that the Venetians were distinctly a serious people, serious, that is to say, in the sense in which the English are a more serious people than the French, though the habitual intercourse of our lower classes in London has a tone of humor in it which I believe is untraceable in that of the Parisian populace. It is one thing to indulge in playful rest, and another to be devoted to the pursuit of pleasure and gaiety of heart during the reaction after hard labor and quickened by satisfaction in the accomplished duty or perfected result is altogether compatible with nay even in some sort arises naturally out of a deep internal seriousness of disposition this latter being exactly the condition of mind which as we have seen leads to the richest developments of the playful grotesque while on the contrary the continual pursuit of pleasure deprives the soul of all alacrity and elasticity and leaves it incapable of happy jesting capable only of that which is bitter, base, and foolish. Thus, throughout the whole of the early career of the Venetians, though there is much jesting, there is no levity. On the contrary, there is an intense earnestness both in their pursuit of commercial and political successes, and in their devotion to religion, which led gradually to the formation of that highly wrought mingling of immovable resolution with secret thoughtfulness, which so strangely, sometimes so darkly, distinguishes the Venetian character at the time of their highest power, when the seriousness was left, but the conscientiousness destroyed. And if there be any one sign by which the Venetian countenance, as it is recorded for us, to the very life, by a school of portraiture which never has been equaled, chiefly because no portraiture ever had subjects so noble, I say, if there be one thing more notable than another in the Venetian features, it is this deep pensiveness and solemnity. In other districts of Italy, the dignity of the heads which occur in the most celebrated compositions is clearly owing to the feeling of the painter. He has visibly raised or idealized his models, and appears always to be veiling the faults or failings of the human nature around him, so that the best of his work is that which has most perfectly taken the color of his own mind, and the least impressive, if not the least valuable, that which appears to have been unaffected and unmodified portraiture. But at Venice all is exactly the reverse of this. The tone of mind in the painter appears often in some degree frivolous or sensual, delighting in costume, in domestic and grotesque incident, and in studies of the naked form. But the moment he gives himself definitely to portraiture, all is noble and grave. The more literally true his work, the more majestic. And the same artist who will produce little beyond what is commonplace in painting a Madonna or an Apostle, 
will rise into unapproachable solemnity when his subject is a member of the forty or a master of the mint such then were the general tone and progress of the venetian mind up to the close of the seventeenth century first serious religious and sincere then though serious still comparatively deprived of conscientiousness and apt to decline into stern and subtle policy in the first case the spirit of the noble grotesque not showing itself in art at all but only in speech and action in the second case developing itself in painting through accessories and vivacities of composition while perfect dignity was always preserved in portraiture a third phase rapidly developed itself once more and for the last time let me refer the reader to the important epoch of the death of the doge tomaso massignon in fourteen twenty three long ago indicated as the commencement of the decline of the venetian power that commencement is marked not merely by the words of the dying prince but by a great and clearly legible sign it is recorded that on the accession of his successor foscari to the throne si festeggio dalla città uno anno intero the city kept festival for a whole year venice had in her childhood sown in tears the harvest she was to reap in rejoicing she now sowed in laughter the seeds of death thenceforward year after year the nation drank with deeper thirst from the mountains of forbidden pleasure and dug for springs hitherto unknown in the dark places of the earth in the ingenuity of indulgence in the varieties of vanity venice surpassed the cities of christendom as of old she surpassed them in fortitude and devotion and as once the powers of europe stood before her judgment seat to receive the decisions of her justice so now the youth of europe assembled in the halls of her luxury to learn from her the arts of delight it is as needless as it is painful to trace the steps of her final ruin that ancient curse was upon her the curse of the cities of the plain pride fullness of bread and abundance of idleness by the inner burning of her own passions as fatal as the fiery sign of the gomorrah she was consumed from her place among the nations and her ashes are choking the channels of the dead salt sea end of chapter three Part 4. Recording by Todd. Conclusion, Part 1 of The Stones of Venice, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Stones of Venice, Volume 3 by John Ruskin. Conclusion, Part 1 I fear this chapter will be a rambling one, for it must be a kind of supplement to the preceding pages, and a general recapitulation of the things I have too imperfectly and feebly said. The grotesques of the 17th and 18th centuries, the nature of which we examined in the last chapter, closed the career of the architecture of Europe. They were the last evidences of any feeling consistent with itself, and capable of directing the efforts of the builder to the formation of anything worthy the name of a style or school. From that time to this, no resuscitation of energy has taken place, nor does any for the present appear possible. How long this impossibility may last, and in what direction with regard to art in general, as well as to our lifeless architecture, our immediate efforts may most preferably be directed, are the questions I would endeavour briefly to consider in the present chapter. That modern science, with all its additions to the comforts of life and to the fields of rational contemplation, has placed the existing races of mankind on a higher platform than any that preceded them, none can doubt for an instant. And I believe the position in which we find ourselves is somewhat analogous to that of a thoughtful and laborious youth succeeding a restless and heedless infancy. Not long ago it was said to me by one of the masters of modern science, when men invented the locomotive, the child was learning to go. When they invented the telegraph, it was learning to speak. He looked forward to the manhood of mankind as assuredly the nobler in proportion to the slowness of its development. What might not be expected from the prime and middle strength of the order of existence whose infancy had lasted six thousand years? And indeed, I think this the truth, as well as the most cheering view that we can take of the world's history. Little progress has been made as yet. Base war, 
lying policy, thoughtless cruelty, senseless improvidence, all things which, in nations, are analogous to the petulance, cunning, independence, and carelessness of infancy, have been, up to this hour, as characteristic of mankind as they were in the earliest periods, so that we must either be driven to doubt of human progress at all, or look upon it as in its very earliest stage. Whether the opportunity is to be permitted us to redeem the hours that we have lost, whether he, in whose sight a thousand years are as one day, has appointed us to be tried by the continued possession of the strange powers with which he has lately endowed us, or whether the periods of childhood and of probation are to cease together, and the youth of mankind is to be one which shall prevail over death, and bloom for ever in the midst of a new heaven and a new earth, are questions with which we have no concern. It is indeed right that we should look for, and hasten, so far as in us lies, the coming of the day of God, but not that we should check any human efforts by anticipations of its approach. We shall hasten it best by endeavouring to work out the tasks that are appointed for us here, and therefore, reasoning as if the world were to continue under its existing dispensation, and the powers which have just been granted to us were to be continued through myriads of future ages. It seems to me, then, that the whole human race, so far as their own reason can be trusted, may at present be regarded as just emergent from childhood, and beginning for the first time to feel their strength, to stretch their limbs, and explore the creation around them. If we consider that, till within the last fifty years, the nature of the ground we tread on, of the air we breathe, and of the light by which we see, were not so much as conjecturally conceived by us, that the duration of the globe and the races of animal life by which it was inhabited are just beginning to be apprehended, and that the scope of the magnificent science which has revealed them is as yet so little received by the public mind that presumption and ignorance are still permitted to raise their voices against it unrebuked. That perfect veracity in the representation of general nature by art has never been attempted until the present day, and has in the present day been resisted with all the energy of the popular voice. That the simplest problems of social science are yet so little understood as that doctrines of liberty and equality can be openly preached, and so successfully as to affect the whole body of the civilized world with apparently incurable disease. That the first principles of commerce were acknowledged by the English Parliament only a few months ago in its free trade measures, and are so little understood by the million that no nation dares to abolish its custom houses, that the simplest principles of policy are still not so much stated, far less received, and that civilized nations persist in the belief that the subtlety and dishonesty which they know to be ruinous in dealings between man and man are serviceable in dealings between multitude and multitude. Finally, that the scope of the Christian religion which we have been taught for two thousand years, is still so little conceived by us that we suppose the laws of charity and of self-sacrifice bear upon individuals in all their social relations, and yet do not bear upon nations in any of their political relations. When, I say, we thus review the depth of simplicity in which the human race are still plunged with respect to all that it most profoundly concerns them to know, and which might, by them, with most ease have been ascertained, we can hardly determine how far back on the narrow path of human progress we ought to place the generation to which we belong, how far the swaddling clothes are unwound from us, and childish things beginning to be put away. On the other hand, a power of obtaining veracity in the representation of material and tangible things, which, within certain limits and conditions, is unimpeachable, has now been placed in the hands of all men, almost without labour. The foundation of every natural science is now at last firmly laid, not a day passing without some addition of buttress and pinnacle to their already magnificent fabric. Social theorems, if fiercely agitated, are therefore the more likely to be at last determined, so that they never can be matters of question more. 
human life has been in some sense prolonged by the increased powers of locomotion and an almost limitless power of converse finally there is hardly any serious mind in europe but is occupied more or less in the investigation of the questions which have so long paralyzed the strength of religious feeling and shortened the domination of religious faith and we may therefore at least look upon ourselves as so far in a definite state of progress as to justify our caution in guarding against the dangers incident to every period of change and especially to that from childhood into youth these dangers appear in the main to be twofold consisting partly in the pride of vain knowledge partly in the pursuit of vain pleasure a few points are still to be noticed with respect to each of these heads enough it might be thought had been said already touching the pride of knowledge but i have not yet applied the principles at which we arrived in the third chapter to the practical questions of modern art and i think these principles together with what were deduced from the consideration of the nature of gothic in the second volume so necessary and vital not only with respect to the progress of art but even to the happiness of society that i will rather run the risk of tediousness than of deficiency in their illustration and enforcement in examining the nature of gothic we concluded that one of the chief elements of power in that and in all good architecture was the acceptance of uncultivated and rude energy in the workman in examining the nature of renaissance we concluded that its chief element of weakness was that pride of knowledge which not only prevented all rudeness in expression but gradually quenched all energy which could only be rudely expressed not only so but for the motive and matter of the work itself preferred science to emotion and experience to perception the modern mind differs from the renaissance mind in that its learning is more substantial and extended and its temper more humble but its errors with respect to the cultivation of art are precisely the same nay as far as regards execution even more aggravated we require at present from our general workmen more perfect finish than was demanded in the most skilful renaissance periods except in their very finest productions and our leading principles in teaching and in the patronage which necessarily gives tone to teaching are that the goodness of work consists primarily in firmness of handling and accuracy of science that is to say in handwork and headwork whereas heart work which is the one work we want is not only independent of both but often in great degree inconsistent with either here therefore let me finally and firmly enunciate the great principle to which all that has hitherto been stated is subservient that art is valuable or otherwise only as it expresses the personality activity and living perception of a good and great human soul that it may express and contain this with little help from execution and less from science and that if it have not this if it show not the vigour perception and invention of a mighty human spirit it is worthless worthless i mean as art it may be precious in some other way but as art it is nugatory once let this be well understood among us and magnificent consequences will soon follow let me repeat it in other terms so that i may not be misunderstood all art is great and good and true only so far as it is distinctively the work of manhood in its entire and highest sense that is to say not the work of limbs and fingers but of the soul aided according to her necessities by the inferior powers and therefore distinguished in essence from all products of those inferior powers unhelped by the soul for as a photograph is not a work of art though it requires certain delicate manipulations of paper and acid and subtle calculations of time in order to bring out a good result so neither would a drawing like a photograph made directly from nature be a work of art although it would imply many delicate manipulations of the pencil and subtle calculations of effects of colour and shade 
it is no more art to manipulate a camel's hair pencil than to manipulate a china tray and a glass vial. It is no more art to lay on colour delicately than to lay on acid delicately. It is no more art to use the cornea and retina for the reception of an image than to use a lens and a piece of silvered paper. But the moment that inner part of the man, or rather that entire and only being of the man, of which cornea and retina, fingers and hands, pencils and colours, are all the mere servants and instruments, that manhood which has light in itself, though the eyeball be sightless, and can gain in strength when the hand and the foot are hewn off and cast into the fire, the moment this part of the man stands forth with its solemn, behold, it is I, then the work becomes art indeed, perfect in honour, priceless in value, boundless in power. Yet observe, I do not mean to speak of the body and soul as separable. The man is made up of both. They are to be raised and glorified together, and all art is an expression of the one by and through the other. All that I would insist upon is, the necessity of the whole man being in his work, the body must be in it, hands and habits must be in it, whether we will or not. But the nobler part of the man may often not be in it. And that nobler part acts principally in love, reverence and admiration, together with those conditions of thought which arise out of them. For we usually fall into much error by considering the intellectual powers as having dignity in themselves, and separable from the heart. Whereas the truth is that the intellect becomes noble and ignoble according to the food we give it, and the kind of subjects with which it is conversant. It is not the reasoning power which of itself is noble, but the reasoning power occupied with its proper objects. Half of the mistakes of metaphysicians have arisen from their not observing this, namely, that the intellect, going through the same processes, is yet mean or noble according to the matter it deals with, and wastes itself away in mere rotatory motion if it be set to grind straws and dust. If we reason only respecting words, or lines, or any trifling and finite things, the reason becomes a contemptible faculty. But reason employed on holy and infinite things becomes herself holy and infinite. So that, by work of the soul, I mean the reader always to understand the work of the entire immortal creature, proceeding from a quick, perceptive and eager heart, perfected by the intellect and finally dealt with by the hands, under the direct guidance of these higher powers. And now observe... The first important consequence of our fully understanding this preeminence of the soul will be the due understanding of that subordination of knowledge respecting which so much has already been said. For it must be felt at once that the increase of knowledge, merely as such, does not make the soul larger or smaller, that, in the sight of God, all the knowledge man can gain is as nothing, but that the soul, for which the great scheme of redemption was laid, be it ignorant or be it wise, is all in all, and in the activity, strength, health and well-being of this soul lies the main difference, in his sight, between one man and another. And that which is all in all in God's estimate is also, be assured, all in all in man's labour. And to have the heart open, and the eyes clear, and the emotions and thoughts warm and quick, and not the knowing of this or the other fact, is the state needed for all mighty doing in this world. And therefore, finally, for this, the weightiest of all reasons, let us take no pride in our knowledge. We may, in a certain sense, be proud of being immortal. We may be proud of being God's children. We may be proud of loving, thinking, seeing, and of all that we are by no human teaching, but not of what we have been taught by rote, not of the ballast and freight of the ship of the spirit, but only of its pilotage, without which all the freight will only sink it faster, and strew the sea more richly with its ruin. 
there is not at this moment a youth of twenty having received what we moderns ridiculously call education but he knows more of everything except the soul than plato or st paul did but he is not for that reason a greater man or fitter for his work or more fit to be heard by others than plato or st paul there is not at this moment a junior student in our schools of painting who does not know fifty times as much about the art as giotto did but he is not for that reason greater than giotto no nor his work better nor fitter for our beholding let him go on to know all that the human intellect can discover and contain in the term of a long life, and he will be not one inch, one line, nearer to Giotto's feet. But let him leave his academy benches, and, innocently as one knowing nothing, go out into the highways and hedges, and there rejoice with them that rejoice, and weep with them that weep. And in the next world, among the companies of great and good, Giotto will give his hand to him, and lead him into their white circle, and say, This is our brother. And the second important consequence of our feeling the soul's preeminence will be our understanding the soul's language, however broken, or low, or feeble, or obscure in its words, and chiefly that great symbolic language of past ages, which has now so long been unspoken. It is strange that the same cold and formal spirit which the Renaissance teaching has raised amongst us should be equally dead to the languages of imitation and of symbolism, and should at once disdain the faithful rendering of real nature by the modern school of the Pre-Raphaelites, and the symbolic rendering of imagined nature in the work of the thirteenth century. But so it is and we find the same body of modern artists rejecting pre-Raphaelitism because it is not ideal, and 13th century work because it is not real, their own practice being at once false and unideal, and therefore equally opposed to both. It is therefore, at this juncture, of much importance to mark for the reader the exact relation of healthy symbolism and of healthy imitation, and, in order to do so, let us return to one of our Venetian examples of symbolic art, to the central cupola of St. Mark's. On that cupola, as has been already stated, there is a mosaic representing the apostles on the Mount of Olives, with an olive tree separating each from the other, and we shall easily arrive at our purpose by comparing the means which should have been adopted by a modern artist bred in the Renaissance schools that is to say, under the influence of Claude and Poussin, and of the common teaching of the present day, with those adopted by the Byzantine mosaicist to express the nature of these trees. The reader is doubtless aware that the olive is one of the most characteristic and beautiful features of all southern scenery. On the slopes of the northern Apennines, olives are the usual forest timber. The whole of the Val d'Arno is wooded with them, Every one of its gardens is filled with them, and they grow in orchard-like ranks out of its fields of maize or corn or vine, so that it is physically impossible, in most parts of the neighbourhood of Florence, Pistoia, Lucca or Pisa, to choose any site of landscape which shall not owe its leading character to the foliage of these trees. What the elm and oak are to England, the olive is to Italy. Nay, more than this, its presence is so constant that, in the case of at least four-fifths of the drawings made by any artist in North Italy, he must have been somewhat impeded by branches of olive coming between him and the landscape. Its classical associations double its importance in Greece, and in the Holy Land the remembrances connected with it are of course more touching than can ever belong to any other tree of the field. Now, for many years back, at least one-third out of all the landscapes painted by English artists have been chosen from Italian scenery. Sketches in Greece and in the Holy Land have become as common as sketches on Hampstead Heath. Our galleries also are full of sacred subjects, in which, if any background be introduced at all, the foliage of the olive ought to have been a prominent feature. And here I challenge the untravelled English reader to tell me what an olive tree is like. I know he cannot answer my challenge. 
he has no more idea of an olive tree than if olives grew only in the fixed stars let him meditate a little on this one fact and consider its strangeness and what a wilful and constant closing of the eyes to the most important truths it indicates on the part of the modern artist observe a want of perception not of science i do not want painters to tell me any scientific facts about olive trees but it had been well for them to have felt and seen the olive tree to have loved it for christ's sake partly also for the helmed wisdom's sake which was to the heathen in some sort as that noble wisdom which stood at god's right hand when he founded the earth and established the heavens to have loved it even to the hoary dimness of its delicate foliage subdued and faint of hue as if the ashes of the gethsemane agony had been cast upon it for ever and to have traced line by line the gnarled writhing of its intricate branches and the pointed fretwork of its light and narrow leaves inlaid on the blue field of the sky and the small rosy white stars of its spring blossoming and the beads of sable fruit scattered by autumn along its topmost boughs the right in israel of the stranger the fatherless and the widow and more than all the softness of the mantle silver grey and tender like the down on a bird's breast with which far away it veils the undulation of the mountains these it had been well for them to have seen and drawn whatever they had left unstudied in the gallery and if the reader would know the reason why this has not been done it is one instance only out of myriads which might have been given of sightlessness in modern art and will ask the artists themselves he will be informed of another of the marvellous contradictions and inconsistencies in the base renaissance art for it will be answered him that it is not right nor according to law to draw trees so that one should be known from another but that trees ought to be generalized into a universal idea of a tree that is to say that the very school which carries its science in the representation of man down to the dissection of the most minute muscle refuses so much science to the drawing of a tree as shall distinguish one species from another and also while it attends to logic and rhetoric and perspective and atmosphere and every other circumstance which is trivial verbal external or accidental in what it either says or sees it will not attend to what is essential and substantial being intensely solicitous for instance if it draws two trees one behind the other that the farthest off shall be as much smaller as mathematics show that it should be but totally unsolicitous to show what to the spectator is a far more important matter whether it is an apple or an orange tree this however is not to our immediate purpose let it be granted that an idea of an olive tree is indeed to be given us in a special manner how and by what language this idea is to be conveyed are questions on which we shall find the world of artists again divided and it was this division which i wished especially to illustrate by reference to the mosaics of st mark's now the main characteristics of an olive tree are these it has sharp and slender leaves of a greyish green nearly grey on the under surface and resembling but somewhat smaller than those of our common willow its fruit when ripe is black and lustrous but of course so small that unless in great quantity it is not conspicuous upon the tree its trunk and branches are peculiarly fantastic in their twisting showing their fibres at every turn and the trunk is often hollow and even rent into many divisions like separate stems but the extremities are exquisitely graceful especially in the setting on of the leaves and the notable and characteristic effect of the tree in the distance is of a rounded and soft mass or ball of downy foliage end of conclusion part one